This is Audible. Macmillan Audio presents In the Shadow of Lightning by Brian McClellan Read by Damian Lynch To the CA, you know who you are. A brief glossary of common god glass. Active god glass. Aura glass augments charisma. Cure glass augments healing. Days glass augments euphoria. Fear glass augments fear. Forge glass augments physical strength and speed. Milk glass augments pain tolerance. Muse glass augments artistic creativity. Shackle glass augments obedience. Sight glass augments sensory perception. Sky glass augments tranquility. Wit glass augments mental acuity. Passive god glass. Omni glass increases the resonance of nearby god glass. Inert god glass. Hammer glass, extremely durable, most often used for armor. Razor glass, can be given an edge that can cut through almost anything. Prologue Demir Grappo picked his way through the aftermath of a battle as the sun began to set over the mountains. The sky was a brilliant hue of red, wispy clouds, looking like the flames of an eternal forge, a scene worthy of a painting, if not for the carnage spread out across the plain in every direction. Demir let his eyes linger on that sunset, trying to block out the screams and moans of the dying. He wondered if his army had an official artist. Most armies did, didn't they? If not, he should get one. He held up his fingers to make a rectangle like that of a landscape painting. It was an incredible view. Slowly he lowered his fingers so that they took in the rapidly darkening battlefield. This, less so. Demir had grown up on stories of wartime glory, of heroism and last stands and outnumbered cavalry charges, of unstoppable breaches in their brightly coloured sorcerous armour cutting a swathe through infantry, while glass dancers rained shards of glittering silica across the battlefield. Those painted words had always been so much cleaner than reality. They hadn't talked about the clouds of powder smoke or the putrid slurry of mud and blood underfoot. None of his tutors had ever mentioned the screams of grown men and women, weeping for fear, for wounds, or for their dead friends. They certainly hadn't mentioned the smell. And the blood. Oh, so much blood. There always was when glass dances were involved. Demir had managed three victories in seven days, and he could not deny that watching a battle unfold to his specifications had made his heart pound in a way he'd never before experienced. Seeing the enemy routed, listening to his soldiers cheer, those things certainly felt glorious. But this. There was no glory for the medics, surgeons and priests wandering the aftermath. Demir contemplated the swampy morass of blood left in the wake of a company of soldiers who'd fallen beneath a glass dancer's attack. The bodies were eviscerated, sliced apart by millions of shards of glass. Those that survived looked like horror house dummies, screaming in agony, until a medic could reach them with various types of god glass to distract the mind, lessen the pain, and speed recovery. Was that his handiwork, he wondered. 
They were rebel soldiers after all, and it was easy to lose track of these sorts of things during the chaos of a battle. His eyes fell on one of the wounded, a young woman sitting up with precious pain-deadening milk glass clenched between her teeth. She was staring at Demir with a mixture of horror and fear so intense that Demir found himself covering the overlapping triangle tattoo on his left hand that marked his sorcery. His glass dance tutor had once told him that it was good and right for their kind to stand above others. It was a gift, she had claimed, and beyond the sorcerer's power to manipulate common glass, it would also give him a psychological edge over others. They would always fear him, because they knew he could kill with a thought. The evidence was before him. Hundreds of men and women cut to ribbons, they were right to fear him. He had never witnessed his own destructive power with such acuity as he had on the battlefield these last seven days, and deep down, it terrified him. Would he get used to this over time? He was only twenty years old, after all, and this was his first campaign. Would he harden? Or would it always leave him sickened? Demir looked around for something anything with which to ground himself. His staff of officers hadn't yet noticed his disappearance, and he was alone but for the dead, the wounded, and the healers and priests who tended to both. The living gave him a wide berth the moment they connected his decorated black uniform with a silic sigil marking him as a glass dancer. They might not actually recognize him, but they could do the math. General Grappo, the glass dancer commander, he hated that so much. Why couldn't they see the victories he'd given them instead of the deadly sorcery he never wanted? His eyes finally fell on a familiar figure and he turned his aimless wandering in that direction. He passed a medic handing a piece of white god glass the size and shape of a horseshoe nail to a wounded soldier. Clutch it between your teeth until the pain passes, the medic instructed, glancing at Demir as if it were his doing. Half the soldier's guts were hanging out. She would be dead in a few hours, but the sorcery of the milk glass would ease her passing. On a whim, Demir tried to feel the little piece of milk glass with his sorcery, but the spot it occupied was cold and dead to his senses. God glass was the only glass a glass dancer could not manipulate. Putting the medic and his dying patient from his mind, Demir approached the man he'd seen kneeling in a small clearing in the field of dead. Demir knew him just well enough to guess that he was not praying. Clearing his head, he called it, before and after every battle. Demir wished more soldiers attended to their own minds as carefully. Adrian Sapolki was big, over six feet tall, with skin as dark as coal, broad shoulders, and legs strong as tree trunks. He wore the armour of a breacher, half plate of interlocking steel worked with a myriad of high resonance god glass, accents of milk glass to suppress pain, bands of yellow forge glass to increase his strength and speed, pinpricks of purple whip glass to invigorate the mind. Most predominant of all was the dark blue hammer glass that was harder than steel, making the armour itself almost indestructible. Idrian's kite shield and immense bastard sword, both also inlaid with god glass, lay on the ground beside him, crusted in blood from the battle. His helmet had two hammer glass ram's horns curled tightly against the steel. Among the soldiers, Idrian was known simply as the ram. The sorcery of so much god glass in one place would sicken a normal person in a few minutes and kill them in mere hours. But Adrian was a glazalier, one of those rare individuals resistant to glass rot. All breaches were, by necessity. Demir glanced down at the back of his own hand where a purple, scaly shimmer had appeared on his skin. It was the first sign of glass rot, caused by using wick glass to plan and command the battle. Without care, the patch would harden into something akin to fish scales and become permanently fixed to his skin. 
he would need to be judicious with his exposure to sorcery for a few days. Breach a sepulchre, Deme greeted Idrian. The soldier cracked open one eye, saw that it was Demir, and made to get to his feet. Demir stopped him with a wave. Don't let me interrupt. There is nothing to interrupt, sir, Idrian replied, his voice a deep, vibrant bass. I am simply emptying my mind of violence. He opened both his eyes, revealing that the right had been replaced long ago with a false eye made of purple wick glass. Demir had asked around a couple of weeks ago, but no one seemed to know when he'd gotten that glass eye, or why it hadn't killed him yet. Taking god glass into one's own body wasn't unheard of, but it was very dangerous, even to a glazelier. Sounds healthy, Demir responded. I was enjoying the sunset myself. Idrian fixed Demir with that unsettling one purple-eyed gaze. There was no fear in that gaze, and for that, Demi was grateful. At least someone in this army viewed him as more than a monster. But then again, breaches were little more than state-sponsored killing machines. Power understood power. It is quite striking, sir. Congratulations on the victory. Demi gave Idrian a cool nod and wondered if it irked the breacher to call someone less than half his age, sir. It does seem to be a victory, doesn't it? The enemy has been crushed. Whatever strength they have left has fled to the mountains. Holikan lies defenseless before us. Idrian nodded to himself. At least, that is the intelligence I have received. You may have more current information. No, that's about the sum of it. Idrian snorted. Thank you, sir. Do you happen to know where my battalion is? Demi considered this for a moment, going through a catalogue of the thousands of commands he'd sent out over the last 24 hours. He wouldn't usually keep tabs on a single battalion, but Idrian belonged to the Iron Horn Rams. They were commanded by Demir's uncle, Tadius, and they were the best combat engineers in the Osan Empire. Idrian would normally be with them, but Demir's plan for this battle had required an extra breacher. Haven't caught up to us yet, he answered. I imagine they're still blowing up bridges along the Tien. He frowned. But that reminds me. Let's send a fast horse to let them know the war has been won. No need to destroy infrastructure that doesn't need to be destroyed. Of course, sir. Should I carry the message myself? Eager to join back up with them? They're my friends, sir. I don't like them being without their breacher. Ah. No, stay with me a while yet. At least until I'm completely certain of the enemy's surrender. We'll send a horse, and I'll make sure you rejoin them soon. Thank you, sir. Idrian paused. If I may. Yes? The soldiers are calling you the Lightning Prince. I thought you might want to know. I hadn't heard that. Demir took the name on his tongue and rolled it around. Is it meant to be a diminutive for my age or a celebration for the speed of my campaign? Idrian hesitated just a moment too long. Come now. Be honest. Both, I think. Demir chuckled. I like it. The Lightning Prince. Most great men were middle-aged before they'd earned an honorific like that. He hummed to himself, enjoying the way the nickname sounded in his head. It almost made him forget the blood soaking his boots. Maybe he would get used to this. Maybe he would harden to killing and to ordering others to kill. He shuddered. No. More importantly than being a glass dancer or a general, he was a politician. He was in charge of this campaign by circumstance only, and within a few days he planned on heading right back to his province, where he could put the bloodshed behind him and focus on helping his people. Adrian climbed to his feet, towering over Demir by eight inches. Sir, 
I believe that your staff is looking for you. Demir glanced the way Idrian nodded to see a small group approaching on horseback. They were an odd mix of Osan political liaisons, here to oversee negotiations with the enemy, and grizzled officers sent along to make sure this young upstart governor didn't make a complete disaster of his first campaign. The lot of them grinned at him like asylum fools. He could see in their eyes that they expected to gain prestige, land, and merits on the coattails of his victory. Demir didn't mind. Sharing credit meant they would be beholden to him in the future, a card to keep in reserve for if he ever needed it. He let his eyes wander across the group for several moments, making mental notes of who he could use in the future, who might be trouble, and who he could forget. Tavrish Magna was a great pot-bellied jokester with few ambitions. Helena Dolani whispered behind Demir's back constantly, undermining him with the subtlety of a company of cuirassiers. Her cousin Jevry gladly took Demir's bribes to report on her. Three members of the small Forleo guild family had managed to finagle their way onto his staff, and they stood to gain the most from this campaign, while Jacob Staffery had made deals in the assembly that bet strongly against Demir's success. He would lose hundreds of thousands, and based on the look on his face, he knew it. It was a complex group, both personally and politically, untrustworthy adders slithering about his feet, any one of which might bite at any time. Even in victory he needed to be cautious, lest one of them turn on him for their own gain. The man out front was named Capric Forzian, and it was a personal friend that Demir had brought on campaign to cover his back against all the rest. Capric was a tall, thin man in his early twenties, with the black hair and olive skin of an Osan native. Tattooed on his right hand was an inverted triangle crossed with the wavy lines of a sun setting over the desert, the silic symbol of the Vorsian guild family. He saluted Demir grandly and swung down from his horse. Hail, victorious grapple, Capric called. The others echoed the words with various levels of enthusiasm. Demir gazed back at the group, still evaluating each person, noting the secrets hidden in the eyes of each. Behind their pleasure at a battle won, there was fear there, just like the soldiers. How many glass dancers were there in the officer corps, after all? Not many. Capric was the only one who didn't seem to walk on eggshells. That was an incredible battle, he complimented Demir. Satisfactory, Demir demurred. That countercharge from their dragoons surprised me. But you shattered it anyway. Glass, damn you, man, take some credit. Capric clasped his hand, pulling him into a congratulatory hug during which he whispered, Look over my left shoulder. If you want to go ahead with your next plan, now is the time. Demir's eyes found an unfamiliar trio among his staff. A middle-aged woman with the blonde hair of an eastern provincial accompanied by two bodyguards, all three of them looking haggard and defeated. He pulled back from Capric and gestured at the group. What is this? he asked loudly, though he knew exactly who they were. The mayor of Holikan has come to surrender. At Capric's gesture, the woman approached Emir, hands held out in supplication. She fell on her knees pressing her face to the ground. I surrender the city of Holikan, she intoned. I do not ask for terms, but I offer my life in exchange for the lives of my subjects. They do not deserve the wrath of the Empire. Demir blinked down at her. He had discussed this moment with Capric at length. It was the crux of the next step in his political career, and yet it still managed to surprise him. Beside the prostrating mare, Helena Dolani produced a short silver lance and now held it, pommel first, toward Demir. Tradition dictated that he accept the surrender and then pierce the mare's neck with a ceremonial weapon, 
executing her on the spot. She was a rebel, after all, an insurrectionist and traitor to the Osun Empire. Demir glanced toward Idrian, his confidence wavering at the idea of such immediate, formalised bloodshed. But the breacher had taken two long steps back, as if to say that a soldier had no business in this kind of thing. Demir took the lance from the liaison and turned toward Capric. Capric himself just shrugged. He knew Demir's mind. He knew Demir had no intention of following outdated traditions just to please the assembly. Demir gave the lance a little twirl, then slapped the haft thoughtfully against his left palm. Stand up, he said. The mayor glanced up at Demir, then at the gathered officers. She seemed confused by the fact that she wasn't being speared at this moment. Demir thrust the lance into the ground, point first, then leaned on it while he took the mare under one arm and pulled her to his feet. He offered her his hand. Good evening. I'm Demir Grappo. The mare stared at his other hand for several moments, or rather at the glass dancer sigil on it. Finally, she answered the handshake. I am Miria Fall, mayor of Holocan. She hesitated for another few moments, then added, I've heard of you, Demir Grappo. Good things, I hope. She nodded. What are you doing here? You're a governor two provinces over, a politician, not a warrior. Warrior? Demir laughed and jerked his thumb at Idrian. He's a warrior. I'm just a bit clever. Tell me, Miria, what do you want? I... Excuse me? Seven months ago you declared your independence from the Osun Empire. You've defeated two armies, gathered support from your province, and, from what I can tell, were doing a damn good job of this whole rebellion before I showed up. And yet, you're still calling yourself a mayor. Because that's what I am, she said incredulously. So, this wasn't a personal power grab. You haven't made yourself monarch of Holicon. No, she said emphatically. I declared independence because Osa has only ever treated us as provincials. We are not and will never be equals. We want fair taxes and local magistrates and... Dimir cut her off gently. I know. I read your declarations, all 87 of them. I just wanted to ask you in person. Her throat cleared, and Demir turned to find that Helen Adolani had retrieved the silver lance, wiped the blade, and now held it toward him once again. General Grappo, it is tradition that you spill the blood of the rebel leader, then decimate the city. She seemed confused, her eyes darting toward the sigil on Demir's left hand, as if wondering why a glass dancer wasn't ready to kill at a moment's notice. Demir ignored her and took a long look toward the city, where lanterns were being lit in the windows as night fell. He could imagine the fear of all those people, having just witnessed their army scattered, knowing the traditions of the Osun Empire. Decimate, Demir muttered, to force the entire city to draw lots and then make them murder one out of every ten of their own number. No quarter for children or the infirm. That sounds unpleasant. It's meant to be, Helena insisted. It's a punishment. For what? The crime of wanting to be treated as citizens in their own country, Demir snorted. I don't believe the punishment fits the crime, and I will not allow it. But, Helena stuttered, you must. She turned to Capric. Tell him that he must follow tradition. Demir didn't let his friend answer for him. What law requires it? He asked lightly. None. I may be young, but I was the governor of my own province when I was fourteen. There is a difference between law and tradition, and I know the laws like my own silic symbol. He held up his right hand to show the tattoo of an upside-down triangle with cracked lightning spreading from the centre. It was the sigil of the Grappo Guild family, a compliment to the glass dancer sigil on his left, the two tattoos of true power within the Empire. He took a deep breath. Madam Mayor, 
Do you surrender Holiken into the care of Demir Grappo of the Osen Empire? Miria Fall stared at him warily. I do? Wonderful. As the words were said, Capric was already removing something from his saddlebags. He produced and unfurled a black and crimson cloak with solemnity. Demir felt the twinge of a smile on his lips, his heart skipping a beat. The victor's cloak was another tradition, one of pomp and foolery, meant for nothing but flattery. But he damn well earned it, and he savoured the moments that it took Capric to lay the heavy fabric across his shoulders and then clasp the golden chain. Capric finished the ceremony by placing a single kiss on Demir's left cheek and giving him a small bow. Well done, lightning prince. The hairs on the back of Demir's neck stood on end at the formal statement of his new honorific. He kept his face expressionless, nodding to Capric and then declaring, The city of Holiken is now under my protection. They are not rebels, they are our cousins, and we will treat them accordingly. The officers stared back at him in vague surprise. None of them would argue, of course, not with their general and certainly not with the glass dancer but he knew they were all furiously penning letters to the capital in the backs of their heads. What the piss are you doing? Miria whispered. He replied in a low voice. I may be an Osen citizen, but I'm also the governor of a province. My people have the same complaints as yours, and I will take them to the assembly. They won't be happy. The assembly is made up of a bunch of rich, self-relating fools. I know, because I am one. We're never happy. You're mad to defy them. Madness and greatness are separated only by the degree of success. Besides, Demir glanced at the battlefield around them. His stomach turned at the sight, and he found himself struck with a longing to return to his province. This last week had proved he was good at war, but he much preferred peaceful administration where he could spend all day greasing the cogs of government and then climb into bed with his mistress. He thought briefly about how most citizens his age were busy going to university, getting laid and looking for the next drink. He wondered what it would be like to be idle for once. The option had never been given to him. I find that I prefer the living to the dead and having friends to making enemies. Demir glanced over his shoulder to find Idrian still there, the big breacher wearing a thoughtful expression, gazing past Demir's head and into the distance. He rubbed at his god-glass eye. Demir wondered if he disapproved. Perhaps he would ask him on another day. Breacher Sepulchi, Demir said. I'm placing the mare under your protection. Keep her safe until we can sort out the rest of this mess, hmm? Idrian nodded silently. Good! Demir slipped one hand into a special cork-lined pocket in his uniform. He produced an inch-long, spoon-shaped piece of wick glass. The handle end of the spoon was worked into a flared hook that he pushed through one of the piercings on his right earlobe. Wick glass was fairly common. It augmented natural mental faculties, making it a favourite among shopkeepers, officers, politicians, and more. But high-resonance wit glass, the very best quality, had a habit of driving its wearers mad. Demir was the only person he knew of with a strong enough mind to make use of it. The sorcery took effect immediately, the barely perceptible hum and vibration creeping into his brain to speed his mind, allowing him to visualise the branching possibilities of the near future. He made calculations at an inhuman speed, processing decisions weeks ahead of time, preparing himself for his next hundred moves as if he were playing a complicated game. But this wasn't a game. It was his career and the lives of all these people and perhaps even the future of the Empire. He would use his victory to bolster his guild family name, the same as any good Osun. But he would also use it to better the lives of millions. Ambitions, he had decided when he was barely twelve, did not have to be just for oneself. He had ambitions for everyone. 
One day the world would see that he was more than his innate sorcery. The masses would smile at him without fear. Satisfied with his plans, and remembering his own encroaching glass rot, he slid the wick glass off his ear and back into his pocket, where the velvet and cork lining protected him from the god glass sorcery when he didn't need it. He let his fingers remain there for a moment, running them over the various god glass baubles. Each was shaped differently so as to be picked out by feel, a comforting assortment of sorcerer's crutches for his weak mortal body. He was deep in thought from his brief meditation when one of the staff, still on horseback, called out, Sir, there's something going on back in camp. Deme felt the tug of his own thoughts, and it took a force of will to pull himself out of them. He let go of Miria's arm, giving it one last reassuring pat as if they were old friends, before lifting his eyes in the direction of the camp. The plane here had only a slight incline, and it wasn't until he had found his horse and gotten into the saddle that he was able to tell what the staff had been talking about. There was, indeed, something going on in camp. Hundreds, no, thousands of torches had been lit, and a large procession was breaking away from the encampment and heading across the plain directly toward Holikon. The torches glittered as the last vestiges of sunlight disappeared over the horizon. Despite all of his mental faculties, Deme found himself completely flummoxed. After the battle, select regiments had been sent out to treat the wounded, hunt the fleeing enemy, and secure outposts. But the bulk of the soldiers had been ordered to return to their tents, where casualties could be counted and control could be asserted over an army with their blood up. So what the piss were they doing marching toward the city? Caprick, he called. Find out what's going on over there. Caprick scowled in the direction of the city for a few moments before throwing himself into the saddle. Deme watched him ride away, transfixed, something in his brain refusing to click over, knowing that something was wrong but unable to find an explanation. This was not in his calculations. Unwilling to show himself in a panic but unable to remain completely idle, Demi began to ride slowly toward the south, a fear of the unknown growing in his belly. He took the fabric of his victor's cloak between two fingers of his left hand, rubbing it anxiously. It wasn't until Caprick returned, breathless, that the fear really took hold. Demir, Caprick barked. There's been some kind of communication error. The Eighth seems to think they have orders to sack the city. Sack the... Demi whispered. What glass damn century is this? We don't sack cities. Get back there and tell them to return to camp. Spread the order to all the colonels. Go! Caprick galloped off, and Demi glanced over his shoulder at his staff. He eyeballed Helena Dorlani first, then Jacob Stavry, and the oldest of the Folio brothers. Everyone wore the same expression of vague confusion and surprise that he imagined on his own face. Who gave orders to sack a city? he demanded. They all looked at each other and shook their heads. No one would give an order like that, Jacob said. Decimation, yes, but nobody has sacked a city in a hundred years. Demir swore and turned back, watching until the realisation finally settled in that the soldiers would reach the outskirts of the city before Capric even made it back. Once they'd actually started their pillaging, it would be impossible to get them to stop. He dug in his own heels, forcing his horse into a gallop, barely hearing the startled swearing of his staff. The darkness quickly forced him to rein in, lest his mount break a leg crossing the uneven plain, and it was almost ten minutes before he reached the column. He was greeted by a harried Capric. The colonels say they all have orders to sack the city, Capric reported. Who gave the order? Capric winced. You did. What? They all have orders with your personal seal telling them to conduct the sacking. No, 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 Demir breathed, watching the stream of soldiers flow past him, torches and bayoneted muskets in hand. Some were sombre, 
Some cheered the dark promise of a night spent slaking a bloody thirst. All of them were heading out to follow orders. His orders, apparently. He fumbled for his wit glass, fixing it to his ear long enough to churn through his memories, looking for some kind of mistake. Had he sent out a poorly worded missive? Had he said something offhand to one of his secretaries? Nothing immediately came to mind, and that terrified him. Mistakes could be made along the best lines of communication, but this was beyond anything he'd encountered in his studies. He needed to find out what had happened, but first he had to curtail this impending ruin. He pointed at an officer among the group. You there, Captain! Hold your men! The captain either didn't hear him or ignored him. The soldiers themselves were so engrossed in the prospects of their new mission that they didn't even notice his presence. Demir urged his horse closer, wishing he had a pistol to fire in the air. Stop! he shouted. Hold! Get yourselves in order, damn it! Anger warred with the growing panic in himself. He reached out, grasping for scattered bits of glass left over from the battle and plucking them up with his mind. Hundreds of shards rose into the air, hovering in place like frozen raindrops as they awaited his mental command. His eye twitched, his thoughts stayed by indecision. Could he kill his own men to avert this disaster? How many would he need to massacre to get their attention? After several moments, he let go. The pieces fell, sprinkling to the ground, unnoticed by the marching soldiers. He heard a gunshot, then another. Screams came from the direction of the city, followed by the sounds of whooping. Demir could feel control slipping from his fingers, eliciting a panic deep in his chest like one he'd never felt in his life. He turned and galloped toward the outskirts of the city, where the gunshots, screams and shouting grew louder and more chaotic. He soon passed a woman's body lying by the wayside, bayoneted several times. The sight of it made him want to vomit. He saw another corpse, then another. Obvious civilians, all of them. A stronger man, a more experienced glass dancer, would have ended this with a quick, brutal show of discipline. Demir knew he could still do it, but he couldn't bring himself to take the action. His mind was spinning now, frayed at the edges and threatening to snap. What madness was this? How could any of his officers have thought he would give such an order? He had marched them across the mountains with uncanny speed and won them three great victories, but he'd never been cruel in triumph. He reached the outskirts of the city and found that thousands of his soldiers had already plunged into the interior. They rushed from building to building, snatching anything of value, throwing children into the streets, killing men and women where they stood, all in the flickering of torchlight while the smoke of burning buildings began to thicken. Demi continued to ride, searching for officers, trying to find someone to help him get this under control. He was half blinded by smoke, confused and disoriented, when his horse stumbled over a tipped cart. He barely threw himself free of the animal, landing on his left hand, pain lancing up his arm. His horse rolled over, making a murderous racket, then got upright and galloped off into the night. Clutching his wrist, unable to think through the pain and the cacophony, Demir rushed from building to building, ordering his soldiers to stop. He berated them, lambasted them, and finally begged them. A few of them frowned at his mud-covered uniform. No one recognised him. Why would they? Few had ever seen his face up close, and he couldn't get the glove off his broken left hand to show them his glass dancer sigil. Who is this? One would ask. Some madman, another would say. He has an officer's uniform and an expensive cloak. The officers are all getting drunk in Grappo's tent. We have orders to follow. If we don't do it quick, someone else will get a good loot. Three cheers for the lightning prince. They would laugh and ignore him. Someone finally grabbed him by his victory cloak and threw him into a ditch, where he barely caught himself before going face down in the filth. He lay partially submerged in the muddy, shit-filled water, staring into the street. His whole body shook with fury and terror. Not a half hour ago, he had pledged that Holikin was under his protection, and now 
there were orders under his seal to sack the city. With trembling fingers he reached into his pocket, searching for sky glass to help him calm his nerves. He pulled out a handful of baubles that immediately slipped from his fingers, falling into the mud. He plunged in after them desperately, but came up with nothing. Across the street, the cry of a child caught his attention. He looked up to see a little girl, probably no more than four or five, screaming into the air. Demir pushed himself to his feet and struggled out of the ditch. If he could not save the many, he would save the one. The sound of galloping hooves filled his ears, and his path was suddenly blocked by several dozen of his dragoons. He'd never been so close to them before, and the thunder of their passing would have made him piss his pants if he hadn't already done it in the ditch. He searched his pocket for godglass, remembered that he dropped it all, and then gathered his courage. The dragoons were soon gone, and he took several more steps before his eyes fell on the spot where the child had been. The child had been trampled. Her little body was silent and still, broken and bloody. He staggered toward her, tearing off his victor's cloak and using it to scoop her up before sprinting to the other side of the road just ahead of another group of dragoons. He clutched the body to his chest, every fibre of him shaking, and dropped onto the front step of an abandoned shop. The nightmare had only just begun. By the time his staff found him, Demir had not moved. He had not slept, or eaten, or had a coherent thought in more than twelve hours. He sat on the step, cradling the corpse of the child in his victor's cloak, having spent a night watching every atrocity that a victorious army could inflict upon a city. His head lay against the cool stone of the shop's threshold, his eyes burning from the acrid smoke of a hundred fires, his tongue parched and his wrist swollen. It was Idrian who discovered him and called for the others. The breacher had discarded his armour, wearing an officer's uniform stitched with the ram's horns that gave him his moniker. He came and knelt before Demir, examining his face. Demir flinched away from that purple god-glass eye. Sir, are you all right? Demir could not find the words to reply. He felt hollow, stripped. He knew that his legs still worked, but the very idea of standing felt impossible. He licked his cracked lips, tried to summon words, and failed. He felt tears in his eyes and tried to look away, to hide them from the breacher. It wasn't supposed to happen this way, he finally managed. I didn't give those orders. I know, sir, Idrian replied gently. Communication went awry. We'll find out what happened, I promise. Slowly, the rest of Demir's staff gathered behind Idrian, staring down at Demir. In the place of those victorious grins of yesterday were looks of horror and disgust. Capric came close enough to pry into what Demir had wrapped in his cloak, only to stumble away and wretch in the ditch. Idrian's one eye darted toward the dead child, but he did not flinch from it. Demir could feel the stares of his staff. He could see the calculation in their eyes, each one wondering how this development would affect their career or their guild family. He could see that each of them was trying to figure out how to detach their name from this disaster. It was one thing to punish a rebelling city with defeat and decimation. It was another entirely to put it to the torch. Demir tried to think. He attempted to gather all his faculties, to calculate the possibilities of the future. He had given his word before more than a dozen people that Holikon was under his protection, and then his army had sacked it. They'd murdered and burned and plundered on his apparent orders. He needed to start an investigation to pin this disaster on someone else, either real or invented. Wit glass he croaked. Capric returned to his side, pressing a piece into his hand. Demir fixed it to a piercing, trying to think. His mind was blank, and the witglass caused a sharp pain behind his eyes until he removed it and gave it back. He could no longer calculate. 
The future was dark and silent. His mind had broken. Miriel Fall? he asked, raising his head to look for the mare. She is safe, Hydrian assured him. Your uncle arrived in the middle of the night, and I left her with our battalion. No one will harm her. Demir's gaze went to the black column of smoke that rose above them. I wish she were not safe. I wish she could not see what I have done. You didn't do this, Adrian said firmly. It was an accident. A crossing of orders. Demir looked across the faces of his staff. They all avoided his gaze. Not from fear this time, but from shame. He had not done this, certainly, but it was his responsibility. Slowly, every muscle hurting, Demir managed to climb to his feet without dropping the body of the child. He found the door to the shop open and the inside ransacked, though he had no memory of soldiers forcing themselves past him. He deposited the body, still wrapped in his victory cloak, on the shop counter. He touched the child's hair briefly, searching for a prayer from his childhood, wishing he believed in a god to pray to. He tried to gather his thoughts. How could he face another person after this? How could he return to his guild family, or his lovers, or the people of his province? How could he ever look another soul in the eye? He returned to the front step. For the first time in years, he felt his youth, helpless, inexperienced, and wondering when a real adult would come along and fix all of this. Idrian produced a milk glass bauble and pressed it into Demir's hand. The god glass was not as high quality as his own, but the sorcerer's effect was immediate. The ache began to bleed from his bones. We should see to that wrist, Idrian said. It looks like it might be broken. Even with Idrian's milk glass, Demir's wrist hurt so bad that he no longer felt it. Like his soul, it was numb. Who is my second in command? No one answered. He peered at the faces of his staff. I don't even know. A mad-sounding laugh slipped through his lips. In my arrogance, I never thought I'd need them. Well, whoever they are, congratulate them on their promotion. Sir? Adrian asked. I resign. You can't resign, someone said. This is your moment of triumph. Demir looked for Capric, hoping for an ounce of reassurance. His friend was staring slack-jawed at the dozens of dead in the streets, all civilians. A triumph. He still might be able to salvage this. His mother, political genius that she was, would certainly try. But if he marched back into Osa, at the front of a triumphal parade after this, he would never be able to live with himself. He avoided Idrian's gaze. Apologise to Mira Fall for me. Tell my uncle that I'm sorry for not finishing the campaign. Capric, write up my resignation. Forge my signature. His mother would be disappointed. So promising, she would say. Such a fool. We could have fixed this. Demir stumbled off the step, regained his balance, and began to walk. Tell them not to come looking for me, he said over his shoulder. The Lightning Prince is dead. Chapter One Nine Years After the Sack of Holikon Demir Grappo stood on the back row of an amphitheatre, a small, cudgelling arena in the provincial city of Ereptia. Even by provincial standards, Ereptia was a backwater, a little city in the heart of winemaking country with less than 10,000 people, most of them employed as labourers on the vast vineyards owned by distant wealthy Osen guild families. The only arena in Ereptia sat a few hundred people, and just a third of the seats were full for an afternoon exhibition match. Cudgelling was the national sport of the empire, 
bigger and more popular than horse racing, cockfighting, hunting and boxing combined. The two contestants in the arena wore powerful forge glass earrings to make them stronger and faster, and then beat the shit out of each other with weighted sticks until one of them forfeited or died. It was a visceral sport, and Demir felt that it defined the entire Osen experience wonderfully. The way contestants broke their bodies for the chance at glory while everyone else cheered them on. Some day he would write a philosophical treatise on the subject. He clutched a bookie's receipt in one hand, watching the two fighters go back and forth across the arena as the sparse crowd shouted curses and encouragement. The woman was named Slatina. She had the milk-white complexion of a Pernian with short blonde hair and was six feet of solid muscle. The man's name was Overin, and he was shorter but faster, with a bald head, bushy black beard, and the light olive skin of an eastern provincial. They were well matched, brawn versus speed, and the crowd was absolutely loving it as strikes fell, skin cracked, and blood spattered the sandy floor of the arena. Demir himself was paying close attention to how they fought, rather than who was actually winning. It needed to be a good match, with little doubt that the two fighters wanted nothing more than to kill each other. By the time Overin fell to the ground beneath Slatina's cudgel, weakly raising her hands to forfeit before she could administer a final blow, Demir knew that everyone had bought it. Neither the judges, the audience, nor the bookies had any idea that the pair were well paid for the inevitable conclusion. Demir loitered until the last of the audience trickled out of the arena and the cudgelists themselves had long since been given cure glass and escorted away. He watched and listened, making sure that no one so much as suspected that the fight was fixed. When he was certain that their performance had been accepted, he sauntered down the steps, out the front of the arena, and across the street, where a slummy little cantina held one of Ereptia's many bookies. Demir slid onto a stool at the bar, set down his betting receipt, and gave it a tap with one finger. I need a new piece of sky glass, Demir said, adjusting the gloves that hid his dual silic sigils. The bartender and bookie was a middle-aged man named Morlius. He had a harried look in his eyes, but moved slowly as he rinsed out mugs in a barrel of water underneath the bar. Demir wouldn't normally order god glass at a bar, but this far out in the provinces, it was the only place a stranger could get their hands on a luxury commodity. Morlius barely glanced at him. Can't get sky glass at all right now, he said. Not even the cheap stuff. Not even the cheap stuff. No idea why. Supply just isn't come in from Osa, and what little I could get last month was bought up by the vineyard managers. Shit. The calming sorcery of Skyglass wasn't going to save Demir's life, but it certainly would make it easier. His last piece had run out of resonance three nights ago, and he'd had a hard time sleeping without it since Holikan. He rubbed at his temples. Day's glass? Morlia shook his head. Fine. Give me a half pint of Reptia's best and put it on this tab. He tapped the bookie's receipt once more. You won, huh? Morlius asked, gazing at him sullenly. Sure did. Demir gave him his most charming smile. Lucky afternoon. He pushed the receipts across the bar. Drink? Morlius did not reach for a wine glass. You won yesterday, too, and the day before that. And I lost the three days prior, Demir replied, keeping that smile fixed on his face. Good luck follows bad, I suppose. I don't think there's any luck in it. Demir let his smile fade into faux confusion, cursing himself silently. He was very careful about losing almost as much as he won. Had he made a mistake? Or was Morley as tipped off? Now, I'm not sure what you're implying, Demir said, huffing loudly. Morley did not have a pleasant reputation. 
Rumour had it he was in the business of drugging cudgelists before fights to get the result he wanted. He didn't do it often, not enough to attract official attention, but the reputation was well earned enough that cudgelists in the know avoided his cantina. Demir didn't begrudge the foul play. That would be hypocritical, after all. He did begrudge the treatment of the cudgelists. His fighters always got a cut. That was the rule. One of Morlius's goons appeared from the cellar carrying a new wine cask. Morlius not so subtly jerked his head at Demir. The goon set down the cask and closed the cantina door, then moved to stand behind Demir. Morlius reached under the bar and produced a cudgel of his own. Heard a story about a man of your description over in Wallach. Got caught fixing fights and then skipped town before they could string him up. Ripped off my cousin for thousands. Demir sighed and glanced over his shoulder. The goon behind him was well over six feet tall, thick and powerful, and with the oft-broken fingers and battered face of a retired cudgelist. The goon drew a long knife from his belt. You're pulling a knife on a patron because of a vague description of a grifter from three towns over, Demir scoffed. He wasn't quite ready to move on from Ereptia yet. Slatina, other than being a talented cudgelist and quite a good actress, had invited him to meet her parents next weekend. Demir loved meeting people's parents. It was like looking into the future to see what they'd be like in thirty years. Don't be dumb, Morlius. It's not even a big bet. If you can't pay out today, I'll take it against my future tab. If Morlius was smart, he would pleasantly drug Demir, rob him blind, and leave him in an alley on the other side of town. But Morlius was not smart. He didn't know when to rein in his greed. Demir turned on his stool so that one shoulder was pointed at Morlius and the bar, and the other at the goon. He glanced over the goon's shoulder, out a window, into the street, where he saw something that hadn't been there before. A very nice carriage with sky-blue curtains, six bodyguards on the running boards, and the silic symbol of the Vorsian guild family etched on the door. Demir's thoughts were instantly knocked awry. What was a Vorsian doing way out here in the provinces? Morlius suddenly lurched forward, grabbing Demir's wrist and raising his cudgel. I think you matched the description too well. Demir's heart fell. No getting that pay out then. Or meeting Slatina for dinner tonight. He would have to move on to the next town, interrupting his life and abandoning his friends and lovers like he'd done dozens of times over the last nine years. The very thought of it made him tired, but it also made him mad. He cast his mental net outward, using his glass dancer's sorcery to make note of every window pane and wine bottle in the cantina. Let go of my hand, Demir said flatly. Or, Morlius grinned at him. Demir applied a small amount of sorcerer's pressure. A wine bottle behind Morlius shattered, causing him to jump. A second shattered, then a third. Morlius whirled toward the rack of wine bottles, yelling wordlessly, reaching toward the bottles without touching them. Demir shattered two more before slowly and deliberately removing his left glove and laying his hand flat on the bar. When Morlius turned back toward him, the glass dancer's sigil was on full display. Morlius's eyes widened filling with that familiar look of terror that had gazed back at Demir from so many sets of eyes since he got his tattoo at the age of eighteen. It made his stomach twist into knots, but he kept that from his own expression. Morlius was not a friend. Morlius had just unwittingly destroyed Demir's life in Ereptia, and he could damn well rot in his fear. I'm... 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 Morlius stuttered. Demir leaned on the bar, channeling his disgust. Take your time, he said. The goon behind him fled back into the cellar, slamming the thick wooden door behind him. Smart man. I have all day.
Demi burst another wine bottle, enjoying the way Morlius flinched. Demi knew that Morlius would do nothing. Who would, with a glass dancer right in front of them? If he so desired, Demi could get away with anything at this moment. Demi drew in a deep, ragged breath. He was being petulant now. He'd made his points, but it still took a force of will to keep himself from destroying every piece of glass in the bar and then throwing it all into Morlius's face. That wasn't who he was. Demir touched the bookie's receipt with one finger and pushed it toward Morlius again. The bookie stared at it for several moments before realisation dawned in his eyes. He pulled the purse from his belt and set it on the bar. Take it, please! He was begging now. What a damned reversal. I'm not robbing you, Demir said softly. I'm just a customer getting a payout. Somehow this seemed even more painful for the bookie. His hands trembled fiercely as he opened the purse and began to count out heavy imperial coins. He scattered the stack twice with those trembling hands, checking the receipt three times before nodding at Demir. Most of the glass dancers Demir had ever met lived up to their reputations in some way or another. They enjoyed using the threat of their power to lord over others. They stole and they threatened and they seduced without thought of consequence. Such displays had never brought Demir pleasure. Occasional satisfaction, like putting Morlius in his place, sure, but never pleasure. He swept the coins into his hand and deposited them in his pocket. I'll have you know that I left Wallach on very good terms. All the judges and fighters got rich with my fixed fights. The only person who didn't like me was the bookie stupid enough to make bets with his client's money. I'm guessing he's your cousin. Be smarter than your cousin, Morlius. I left him alive, but I also left him very poor. Right. If you say one word about this, or if I find out you've drugged any of my fighters, Demir nodded at the shelf of destroyed wine bottles. I'll actually do something with all that glass. He slapped the bar. Have a good day, Morlius. Demir turned away before his frustration could truly start to show. Another lost life. Another town he had to leave before anyone figured out who he really was. Another crack in his identity's facade, held back by nothing more than a threat. Should he say goodbye to Slatina? She would, rightfully, want an explanation. She didn't even know his real name. Best to just disappear. He was suddenly exhausted by it all, wishing he had some semblance of normalcy in his life. He'd forgotten all about the Vorsian carriage out front, so it came as quite a shock when he opened the door to the bar and found a familiar face staring back at him. It had been nine years since Demir had last seen Capric Vorsian. Capric was thinner, more statesmanlike, with features that had grown almost hawkish as he crept into his thirties. He was wearing a very expensive jacket and tunic, clutching a black cane with one hand. A pair of bodyguards stood in the street behind him. Demir? he asked in surprise. Demir peered hard at Capric for several moments, shook his head in confusion, then peered again. Sure enough, this was Capric Vorsian in the flesh. Glass damn. Capric, what the piss are you doing here? Looking for you? Are you okay? You look miserable. Did you already hear the news? Demir felt his blood run cold. He'd gone to great lengths to make himself hard to find. If Capric was here with bad news, it must be very bad. He offered his hand, which Capric shook. I haven't. What brings you out to my corner of the provinces? You have a corner? Talking with Brennan, you haven't lived in the same spot for more than six months since you fled Holikan. Demir felt his eye twitch at the mention of Holikan and Capric immediately hurried on. Forgive me, I just... It sounds like you've been moving around a lot. 
I have, Demir confirmed. Stay too long in one place and people start to wonder why you wear gloves all the time. What's Breenan doing blabbing about my movements? Did Mother send you out here to try and fetch me back? Capric looked around and said, Can we speak in private? My carriage is just outside. Under normal circumstances, Demi would refuse. Speaking in a private carriage stamped with a guild family's silic symbol would bring up a lot of questions for Demir's friends in this little provincial town. But that run-in with Morlius just now had already ended Demir's stint. Besides, it was best to find out bad news quickly. Lead on. He followed Caprick out to the carriage. Local kids were running around it, alternately shouting barbs at and begging from the bodyguards. The bodyguards shooed them off as Demir and Caprick approached and they were soon inside, where Caprick immediately pulled out a bottle of sherry and poured them each a glass on a fold-down side table. Demi was studying his old friend closely now, trying to get a read on this entire visit. He took a sip, set the glass back on the side table and said, What's going on, Caprick? How did you find me? And what are you here for? Caprick gulped his glass, poured himself a second, and sipped half of it before answering. I'm sorry, Demir. For? Your mother is dead. Demir felt the blood drain from his face. Is this a joke? I wish it was. Brennan told me where to find you, and I rushed out here at speed to reach you before you had to read it in the newspapers. Demir examines Capric's tired, earnest expression for several moments to see the truth of things, then opened the door and vomited out his breakfast on the cobbles. He felt a gentle hand on his back while he spat out bile, then wiped his mouth on an offered handkerchief. A million thoughts flashed through his mind. Regrets, plans, recriminations. He might have seen his mother only a few times in the last decade, but she'd always been a reassuring candle burning in a distant window. Now that she'd been snuffed out, he cursed himself for not visiting more, and for failing to live up to her expectations for a child prodigy. He searched his pockets for sky glass, before remembering that he didn't have any left. When he next looked up, Caprick was holding out a light blue piece for him. Demir took it gratefully, and threaded the hooked end through one of his piercings. His racing heart and mind immediately began to slow, giving him time to take a deep breath and compose himself. What happened? he asked. It's unpleasant, Caprick warned. Death always is, Demir replied, steeling himself. She was beaten to death on the steps of the assembly. Demir let out an involuntary sound that was halfway between a laugh and a sob, Adriana Grappo was a reformer, one of the few assembly members who dedicated their lives to helping the masses rather than enriching themselves. Reformers in Osa had a long and glorious tradition of dying publicly, killed by their peers for pushing societal reforms too strongly. Who did it? Caprick shook his head. We don't know yet. There were six masked figures that descended on her quickly, finished the job and fled in all directions before guards could be called. And before you reply, I know what you're thinking. She wasn't killed because of her reforms. Sure, her proposed taxes annoyed the elite, but everyone loved your mother. The assembly is furious, and I will be shocked if they haven't caught the culprits by the time I return. Deme pulled himself out of a spiral of suspicions, and tried to focus on the calming hum of the sky glass in his ear. Capric was right. Adriana had always walked a cool line between radical reformer and harmless politician. She always knew when to push and when to back off. So, it wasn't her fellow assemblyman? I can't imagine, Capric said. Demir leaned his head against the wall of the carriage. Who did it then? What enemies had she made in the years that Demi had been gone? An investigation has been launched. 
a very serious one. Has Uncle Taddy has been told? I'm not sure. The assembly is covering up the murder until they have more information. Adriana was very popular with the common people. Announcing her death before they have a solid lead could result in riots. Covering up a public murder might sound ridiculous to some people, but the assembly was very good at that sort of thing. They had a lot of practice. Smart, Demir agreed. Baby Montego should also be informed. Caprick paled. Most people did when Montego was mentioned. As the cudgelling champion of the world, he was one of the few normal people who could command the same sort of fear as a glass dancer. He was also Demir's best friend and adopted brother. I have sent word already, Capric promised. But last I heard, he was on his yacht in the Glass Isles. It might be months before he returns. Demir sucked on his teeth loudly, using the calming sorcery of the sky glass to shove aside his personal feelings and tick through the list of things he needed to do now that he was the head of the small Grappo Guild family. As if anticipating his thoughts, Capric said softly, I have brought with me an offer from my father. Demir lifted an eyebrow. Yes? He would take the Grappo on as a client guild family. You'd have the protection of our patronage. We'd pay off any debts Adriana might have had, take care of the hotel, look after your own clients. You won't even have to return home if you don't want... He trailed off, looking as if he might have shown his hand too early. Demir ignored the impropriety. This was Osa, after all. Everything was business, even the death of a family member. It was a generous offer. The Vorsian were one of the most powerful guild families in Osa. Slipping underneath their protection could benefit Demir greatly. But it would also end the Grappo guild family and severely curtailed Demir's freedom. Patronage came with stipulations and responsibilities. He shook his head. Thank you. No. I need to return home and put Mother's affairs in order before I even consider anything like that. The offer is there. Tell Father Vorsian that I'm most grateful. Of course. Are you returning to Osa immediately? Demir examined Capric carefully, trying to weigh any hidden meaning in the question. The Grappo might be a tiny guild family, but Adriana Grappo had been a colossus of Osan politics. The return of her failed prodigy son might cause havoc in various corners of the capital. Did Capric, or the Vorsian family at large, have a stake in Demir's possible return? He swallowed a bit of bile and removed the sky glass from his ear, bathing in the return of his anger and uncertainty. It helped him feel human. What talk is there of Demir Grappo? he asked. Capric looked somehow more uncomfortable than before. Am I hated? Demir pressed. Forgotten, Capric said slowly. Adriana did a wonderful job of cleaning up after Holigan. It was all but covered up. Demi Grappo and the Lightning Prince are distant memories, and no one talks about Holikan at all. Demi chewed on this information. He removed his right glove and rubbed at the silic sigil of the Grappo Guild family. With his mother dead and his uncle abdicating responsibility in favour of a life in the military, Demir was the last full-blood Grappo left. Could a failed politician without progeny of his own possibly hope to keep the line afloat? That's about the best I could have hoped for. Really? For a few years there, you were the greatest politician in the Empire. You were everything. A guild family heir, a general, a politician, a glass dancer. All that prestige, all that work. Lost. I'm not re-entering politics, Demir told him. Then why return at all? Why not become a client to the Vossian? 
Demir considered this for a few moments before deciding not to answer. He patted Capric's arm. Thank you for coming all the way out here to tell me. That is a kindness that I will repay. It'll take me a couple of days to put my affairs in order. I'll see you at Mother's... at my... hotel in a week? Of course. Demir stepped out of the carriage and off to one side, ignoring the curious stares from the townsfolk and the open hands of the street children crowding around him. Capric gave him a wave from the carriage window, and then it pulled away and trundled down the street. He reached into his pocket, searching out a piece of wick glass. It was a small hoop, no bigger than the end of his finger, with a hook on one end. The sorcery still had a small effect when clutched in the fingers, not nearly as much as when worn on the ear or held between the teeth, but enough to speed his thoughts. It had, he realised, been a gift from his mother. They'd last spoken three months ago, when she tracked him down in one of the southern provinces and begged him to return to Osa and restart his career. If he had done as she asked, would she still be alive? It was a question that he knew would haunt him for the rest of his life. So why return at all? Why not take Capric's offer and become a client to the Vorsian? A hundred different answers swirled around in his head. His mother's death changed things, and the responsibilities he'd avoided for nine years were suddenly multiplied tenfold by virtue of inheritance. Because, Demir said softly to himself, she deserved better than to die like that. I wasn't there to protect her, so I can at least protect her legacy and destroy the people who did this. Chapter 2 There was a time when Demir would have entered Osa only with great pomp and circumstance. Dancers, jugglers, wild animals, provincial exotics, bred for the masses. It was the prerogative of a popular politician when visiting the capital, and Demir had used it to build up massive amounts of goodwill with the Osan people. That was before Holikin, before he ran away from his own damned failure. Entering the city on a private coach service was something else. For nine years he'd lived among poor provincials, experiencing the dirty, depraved depths of the human condition. In all that time, nothing had compared to Osa. The noise of millions of people packed together, the smell of Glastown glassworks burning through whole forests every day to produce valuable god glass, the taste of soot and human suffering on the tip of his tongue. Returning to that was not a welcome experience, but it did feel a bit like home. He went directly to the Hyacinth Hotel, where he stood in the street, looking up at the building where he'd spent much of his childhood. The hyacinth was a magnificent structure. Four vaulted stories of granite with golden gargoyles, immense windows, and a location in the assembly district that would make an emperor jealous. Purple drapes hung from each window, stamped with the lightning-cracked silic sigil of the grappo. Incredible as it might be, it was a painful reminder that the Grappo had once been one of the most powerful guild families in Osa. Generations ago, to be sure. But the Hyacinth was all that remained of that wealth and prestige. And Demir was practically all that remained of the Grappo. All around him, the streets were full of people celebrating the coming winter solstice. Masked revellers, dressed scantily despite the cold, carried tin flagons of winter beer, throwing paper streamers back and forth across the street, following the bread wagons distributing free meals for the poor. On another day, Demir might have enjoyed the levity of it all. He would have admired the women, laughed at the clowns, and helped distribute winter beer from the front step of the hotel. Not today. Not with the hotel steps draped in a black mourning carpet. Demir jogged up the massive marble stairs and through the big double doors of the hyacinth, slipping a few banknotes into the hand of a surprised porter as he passed. During his journey, he had made a transformation. 
changing out his provincial workman's tunic for a scarlet jacket with purple and gold trim. He rolled his shoulders, feeling the fine clothes hanging uncomfortably, trying to take himself out of the role of Demir the provincial grifter, and back into Demir Grappo, dignified glass dancer and new patriarch of the Grappo guild family. Like the sights and sounds of the city, it was a change that felt regrettably natural. He did not recognise most of the porters, bellboys or waiters moving through the foyer, but he knew the rhythm with which they walked. He skirted the main floor, heading up the large double staircase to the second floor, where he was stopped by a grappo enforcer dressed as a porter. She was a young woman, pretty face marred by a soldier's scar across one cheek, a sword and pistol hanging from her belt, along with a cork pouch filled with god glass. The pinky nail of her left hand was marked with purple client paint to show her allegiance to the grappo. Are you visiting someone, sir? she said, as she manoeuvred herself between him and the hallway. To his surprise, she did not look at his hands before interfering, instead meeting his gaze without submissiveness. Demir lifted his right hand, palm flat against his chest, to display the silic sigil. Adriana is dead already, he said. I think Brennan might be overdoing it by posting a guard now. A look of confusion crossed the young woman's face, and then her eyes widened. Master Demir? In the flesh. She inhaled sharply. Master Vorsian said you weren't supposed to be here until tomorrow. She looked around, seemed at a loss, and snapped a salute. My name is Tirana Kirkovic. I'm the hotel master at arms. We have one of those now. Demir asked in surprise. His mother had always been light on security, insisting on treating the hotel as such, rather than as a guild family mansion. Yes, sir. I've been with the hotel for four years. Demir searched her eyes. Still no fear, nor submission. She did not care that he was a glass dancer, and was only mildly embarrassed to realise that he was her new boss. Good. You're a Kirkovic. Indeed. Hamish Kirkovic is my grandfather. I like Hamish. Still with the Foreign Legion. Retired last year, sir. He's said a lot of good things about you. That's because he has very poor judgment of character. Demir glanced Tirana up and down. She had a soldier's stance, confident and erect, one hand resting comfortably on the pommel of her sword. At first impression, his mother had chosen her master-at-arms well. Pleasure to meet you, Tirana. Could you let Brennan know that I'm examining my mother's suite? Of course, sir. Tirana turned and hurried down the stairs back to the foyer. Demir continued on his course, walking down the long crimson carpeted hallways of the hotel until he found a little side hall with a sign hung on a string to block the way. It declared this hallway hotel personnel only. He ducked under the string and walked down to the only door. It was locked, but pressing a catch beneath the gold leaf three inches to the right of the latch caused the door to click and spring open. He stepped inside. His mother's quarters occupied a pair of rooms that had once been a servant's galley and recovery room. It was much as it was the last time he'd seen it. White walls with purple accents, a massive fireplace between two blue hammer glass windows that looked out over the park, fragrant cedar desk and bookshelves with massive wingback chairs for entertaining guests. To the left was the closed door of the bedroom, next to a door that connected to the secret servants' hallways that wound through the hotel. The only thing missing was his mother's papers. They were gone, all of them, including all the notebooks that had once filled dozens of shelves. There was no clutter, no encyclopedias at hand. It was like she'd just moved out. The appearance of the room shocked Demir, almost as much as news of his mother's death had. He checked the drawers only to find them empty, then the cabinets on the right and left. 
personal effects remained. Crystal drink holder, silver candlesticks, a small ivory carving of a Pernian elephant. But all her letters, notes and personal correspondence were gone. Demir threw himself into one of the wingback chairs in frustration, resting his chin despondently on one hand. He was staring at the empty bookshelf when he could have sworn he saw something out of the corner of his eye. It was a face, looking at him through the hammerglass window of his mother's study. It was there for only a moment, elongated and dark-skinned, with delicate features and an unnaturally long neck. Black, beady eyes stared back at him over a deformed jaw with a severe underbite and jagged teeth. When he turned to look straight at the window, the face was gone. A cold sweat broke out across the back of his neck. The face was burned into his memory, like a face from a child's illustration of something that walks the night. Except it was broad daylight in the assembly district. He reacted by instinct, using his sorcery to seize a water glass from across the room. It shattered into a dozen shards, each poised at chest height, ready to be thrown at an assailant with the effort of a thought. Demir got up slowly, his throat tight as he crossed the room. He slid the hammer glass window pane open, sticking his head out to look up, down, and to the sides. Nothing there. Entirely his imagination. Could it be the stress of returning to the capital? Could it be a warping in the glass itself? He touched the hammer glass with his sorcerer's senses. Like all god glass, it did not respond to his sorcerer's touch. It was completely normal. Demir! Demir brought himself back in and shut and locked the window to find Brennan standing in the doorway. The Grappo Guild family major domo looked like he'd aged twenty years in the last ten. He was a small man with a mouse-like scholarly face and a pair of spectacles perched on the end of his nose and light skin that betrayed his Pernian ancestry. He was in his mid-fifties, with short hair that had long since gone prematurely grey. He'd served Adriana since Demir's childhood, and had been her circumspect lover for much of that time. Brennan had been a military surgeon with the Foreign Legion in his youth, a hard man to crack during the best of times. Hiding beneath the clear exhaustion, Demir thought he could see hints of worry, grief, and anger in his eyes. In the few moments that they looked at each other, Demir felt a thousand unsaid things lash at the air between them. Brennan likely wanted to ask him why he hadn't been here to protect his mother. Demir wanted to ask why she'd gone to the assembly without bodyguards. Reproach, recriminations, anger, and grief. It would all continue to go unsaid. The Osen way. Demir cleared his throat, using the sound to cover for himself as his sorcery placed the shards of drinking glass on the table on the other side of the room. Thank you for taking care of everything, he said quietly. Has she been buried? Next to your father in the mausoleum. It was a small ceremony, but a dozen guild family heads insisted on coming. Good. I'll visit her as soon as I can. I'll make sure you're given time to be alone. There was a long, awkward pause that Demir broke by sitting down. He still felt slightly unnerved by whatever he thought he had seen in the window. It must have been the stress on his mind. This master at arms, he asked pointedly. Captain Kirkovic is a trusted member of the Guild family, Brennan said. Adriana vetted her. Tirana has renounced her allegiance to the Kirkovic and is a Grappo client. I like her. Where are my mother's papers, her notes, her spy reports and documents? Brennan grimaced finally walking into the room and sinking into the wing-back chair opposite Demir. In that moment his age really showed, and he looked like a frail old man whom life had stabbed in the back by taking away his employer and lover, all in the same blow. 
The assembly confiscated everything, Brennan said. Sent around the cinders and hacked up anything that had her handwriting or an official seal. She was a powerful member of the assembly, privy to state secrets and government machinations. They didn't want anything left behind. Demis swore. The cinders were the elite Imperial Guard, beholden only to the small group of senior assembly members that controlled the government. I'd hoped to get my hands on those secrets and find out what got her killed. Do you have any idea? In response, Brennan reached into his tunic and withdrew a small, string-tied book. What is that? Demir asked. It's Adriana's death journal. She started it years ago, and it was the one thing she instructed me to hide from the cinders in the event of her untimely demise. I was told that giving this to you was the most important thing I could do to honour her memory. Demir took it, running his hands across the calfskin cover. His chest suddenly tightened painfully. Was this what grief felt like? Do you know what's in it? He asked. I have a general idea, but she asked me to keep it secret from everyone. I assumed that included myself, and I respected her wishes. Demir undid the string and opened the first page. There was a note scrawled in his mother's perfect handwriting. It said, Demir, if you are reading this, I am dead. I do not know how much of my life's work the assembly will confiscate upon my death, so this journal contains the most important things you need to know to take over as patriarch of the Grappo and owner of the Hyacinth Hotel. There are calling cards, ledgers, Fulgurist Society introductions, journal entries, spy reports. Study them carefully, and remember that you can depend upon Brennan for the rest. Your mother. Demir pursed his lips. Fulgurist Societies was simply the name given collectively to Osen's social clubs. There were at least a thousand in the capital alone and everyone belonged to at least one. He still paid dues to three, though he hadn't kept in touch with any of his old friends and contacts from any of them. His mother belonged to dozens. Her societies might prove useful, but only if they allowed him entrance. He put that thought aside for the time being. There, at the bottom of the page, was an addendum. It was written in smaller letters in the same handwriting, dated 18 months ago. Demir, I have begun a partnership with Master Castora of the Grent Royal Glassworks. If our work has succeeded, then you already know of it. If, however, I die before we finish, then you must contact Castora immediately. Do not mention this partnership to anyone. Secrecy may be the only thing that saves us. Demir read the addendum several times, a feeling of disquiet creeping into his belly. He opened his mouth to ask Brennan what he knew about Master Castora, but the wording of the addendum stopped him. Secrecy may be the only thing that saves us. What a strange thing to write. She was not normally one for hyperbole. How serious must it be to be included in the very front of her death journal? Demir glanced toward the window where he thought he had seen that otherworldly face. It wasn't there, of course. It never had been. Just a figment of his stressed imagination. He cleared his throat, read the letter again, and then closed the death journal before carefully retying the string. He knew the name. Master Castora was one of the most highly regarded sorceress engineers in the world, a genius of a Cilicia, admired even by his critics. What might Mother have been working on with him? She wasn't a Cilicia, she was a politician. His thoughts were interrupted by a knock at the door. A porter stuck her head inside. 
Master Capric Vorsian is here, she informed them. Demir exchanged a glance with Brennan. He'll have news. You can stay if you'd like. It's best if I get back to the hotel, Brennan said reluctantly. Shall I have a suite made up for you? Please, go ahead and send Capric in. Brennan made his way out of the office, only to be replaced by Capric a moment later. Demir's friend walked in with a cane under one arm, dueling sword at his belt, his stride purposeful. Ah, Demir, I didn't expect you back until tomorrow. I just came by to leave an update with Brennan. Are you feeling all right? Just suffering from a quick, sad journey, Demir said, waving off the question. He felt terrible, and that strange addendum had made him feel worse. He needed time to gather his wits. Chasing down a side project of his mother's shouldn't be his top priority, yet the tug of her post-mortem instructions were suddenly very powerful indeed. He forced himself to focus. What news about the killers? As a matter of fact, they've caught one. Capric held his gloves in one hand, shaking them emphatically at the air. Two days ago, they tracked him down trying to take a coach service into Grent. Demir scowled, trying not to jump to conclusions. Only one. It's the only one they could identify from all the witnesses. He's a former Grant soldier, and he confessed under shackle glass that he was sent, along with the rest, by the Duke of Grant. He doesn't know why he was sent, but the Duke wanted Adriana killed publicly. Grant was Osa's twin city. Located just a few miles down the river, their suburbs practically bleeding into each other. On a clear day, Demi could see Grant buildings from the roof of the hotel. While Osa was the head of an empire, Grant was a small but powerful city-state with a massive merchant fleet, independent of the larger nations around it. Grant and Osa had a history of contention, but mostly small trading disputes. Nothing to get a guild family matriarch killed. Except, Castora was a Grant Cilicia master. That couldn't be a coincidence. Glass damn, Demi muttered. And the Assembly? The Assembly has voted for war. Demi inhaled sharply. The Assembly rarely acted this quickly. So soon, on the murder of a single politician, Grant is our neighbour. Even with no small amount of bloodlust in his heart, Demi could not imagine his mother's death reason enough for an entire war. It's... Uh... More complicated than that, Capric admitted. I'm not a senior member of the Assembly, so I'm not privy to everything, but I can give you the gist. The Duke has been meddling in Osen affairs for decades and has grown increasingly bold over the last few years. He's stolen trade contracts, bribed Osen magistrates, and even had Osen officers assassinated out in the distant provinces. He's been warned repeatedly to back off. Your mother's murder is the last straw. The foreign legion has already been activated. We invade tonight. To what ends? Demir asked. Capric spread his hands. An international slap on the wrist. We kill some soldiers, occupy the ducal palace and the senate buildings, and then the duke surrenders with a formal apology and a massive restitution payment. You might even see some of that money. The idea of some government payout for his mother's death felt more insulting than vindicating. Demir scowled. War. The word made his insides twist. And not some distant foreign war fought through proxies on another continent. War right on their doorstep, mere miles away. Cannons and armies and fires. He tried to remember the last time the Osen capital had seen actual military combat. Not in his lifetime, nor in those of his immediate predecessors. It all felt so sudden. But if what Capric said about the Duke of Grent was true, it made sense. The assembly moved so quickly only when they felt personally threatened, 
and one of their number murdered by a foreign assassin was awfully damned personal. Demir said, I'd like to question the killer. Impossible, I'm afraid, Caprick said with a grimace. The high resonance shackled glass drove him mad. He's a raving lunatic now. Convenient. Convenient or not, it happens with such powerful shackled glass. Caprick's grimace turned into a scowl. I know what you're thinking. I don't sense any foul play, at least not in the assassin's madness. There were five other killers, Demi pointed out. And the cinders are searching for them. Caprick shook his head sadly. I suggest you let them do their jobs. We're invading, Demir. Justice will be done for your mother and a hundred other slights, insults and attacks. Demir bit hard on his tongue. It was not unheard of for Shackleglass to drive a man mad, but it did seem awfully convenient. He would have to resort to unconventional means for his answers, if he was to get any. He glanced down the death journal in his hands. He desperately wanted to show it to Capric and ask him what he thought it meant. Secrecy may be the only thing that saves us. Again, those words stopped him from acting. Mother was working with a Grent Cilicia master only to be killed by the Duke of Grent. Had she been betrayed? Was the work close to completion? What was the work? Something was wrong about all of this. Demir's hand itched to reach for his Whitglass to churn through the possibilities. But Whitglass had done nothing but give him a headache since his breakdown at Holicon. Thank you for letting me know, Demir said quietly. Of course, I know they... Caprick glanced around the office. Ransacked things to preserve state secrets. I'm sorry that you have to stay so much in the dark. I'll pass on whatever I can without getting into trouble. He slapped his cane against his palm. I should go, and I know you have a lot to catch up with. If you need anything, just call on me. Demir walked Caprick out to the top of the stairs in the hotel foyer. He said goodbye, and then went and found Breenan in the concierge's office. He stood in the doorway, watching Breenan write tiny, neat numbers into his ledgers for a few moments before asking, Is my uncle's battalion posted near Osa? It is. Where are they? Garrisoned just to the southwest of the city, I believe. Demir chewed on the inside of his cheek. On a normal day, he might have jumped in a carriage and headed into Grent directly to confront this Master Castora and find out what he knew. If he did that now, he wouldn't be able to return before the invasion began tonight and would be stuck behind enemy lines. A bad idea, even for a glass dancer. Find out exactly where they are. I might need their help with something. Right away, Breenan nodded. Wait! He paused, wrestling with the question on the tip of his tongue before forcing it out. This may seem like an odd question, but has the hotel become haunted in the last nine years? Breenan scowled. Are you being serious? Only slightly. Demir decided not to follow that line of questioning. The staff would already be on edge with Adriana's death and the return of the glass dancer Prodigal's son. It would complicate things if they thought his mental breakdown had caused him to go insane. Besides, Demir was a modern man. He didn't believe in hauntings. Demir watched Breenan hurry off across the foyer. His brow furrowed, trying to find his way through the confusion clouding his mind. He was tempted to disappear, to flee back into the provinces where he could live out the rest of his life as a friendly grifter. Why bother himself with his mother's puzzles and the Assembly's new war? He could go somewhere far away where he might, someday, have the chance to be happy. Happiness had no place in the Osen Guild families. Only wealth, prestige, power, and progeny. Demir had little of those things, but he did have people that depended on him now. 
Abandoning his duties meant abandoning the hotel and everyone who worked in it. Many of them were new, but some he'd known since he was a child. He could not discard them. Besides, there was enough of the old Demir to be intrigued by that addendum in the death journal. He could always disappear into the provinces later. For now, he needed to find out what got his mother killed. You left me a real shit show, didn't you, mother? He muttered to himself. I think I will need some help. Chapter 3 Tessa Folia awoke with a start, sitting bolt upright in her tiny room in the dormitory of the Grint Royal Glassworks. She had dreamed of men dying, women weeping, and a city burning. It was a common nightmare, one she'd had for nine years, though it had grown more frequent as the newspapers ran story after story of the wars in the East. Sweat caused the sheets to cling to her body. She looked out the open window, unable to decide whether she'd been awoken by the nightmare or some sort of noise outside. I don't want to get up, the figure sleeping next to her mumbled. Go back to sleep, Tessa said, gently touching the head of golden hair lying on the pillow. The girl's name was Palua. She was an apprentice at the glassworks, and at nineteen just a couple of years younger than Tessa herself. Tessa grimaced. She wasn't supposed to sleep with anyone of a lower rank. Castora was going to give her an earful when he found out. If he found out. This would, she promised herself, be a one-time thing. No more bottles of wine and shared cigarettes late at night. It wasn't even a serious thing with Palua. But this was what Tessa did around the holidays, every damn time. Find some way to avoid the loneliness of not having a family to visit. Last year it was that muscular guard, a real arsehole of a man who turned out to be married. The year before that, she'd eaten until she threw up. I've got to stop doing this to myself, she muttered, trying to work the ashy taste of cigarettes out of her mouth. Tessa craned her head toward the sound of thunder in the distance, then forced herself to lie back down. It was just the forge. A storm-prone series of cliffs a dozen miles to the north. The forge could often be heard late at night, thunder rumbling distantly even when the air was calm in Grent itself. Just below her window was a small racket, a series of feathery thumps and a high-pitched repeating screech. Tessa snorted irritably and finally swung her feet off the bed, padding across her cell to open the door with a creak, peering into the darkness of the dormitory. Most of the bunks were empty, Cilicia apprentices sent home to celebrate the winter solstice. Tessa herself was the only journeyman left in the building, having volunteered to oversee the furnaces and the small handful of remaining apprentices. It seemed silly to take a holiday when she had no family to visit and her few friends were gone to see their own. She pulled on a tunic, then hurried down the stairs, following the sound of angry screeching. Just outside the main floor was a large muse, a room-sized falcon cage with a thatch roof and iron bars. A large falcon, just a few inches shy of two feet tall, was hopping from perch to perch, fluttering his wings in agitation. Ecky, she hissed. Shut the piss up. People are trying to sleep. The falcon hopped to the closest perch, cocking his head forward through the bars and staring at her until she reached out to stroke the top of his head. He nipped gently at her fingers and ruffled his feathers. What's wrong, Ecky? she asked. I didn't forget to feed you yesterday, did I? No, I definitely fed you. Is the forge bothering you? It never has before. She sighed. He seemed calm enough with her right here. He must have just had a bad night. I know I haven't taken you hunting for a while, but I've been in charge of the glassworks. Once Castora returns, 
I'll take an afternoon off and we'll head into the countryside. Does that sound good? Eki nipped at her fingers again and she smiled. No matter how annoying the little asshole could be, she still loved him. Breakfast is in two hours. Here, hold on. She found a little crate nearby containing his anklets and Jess's, then reached through the bars to put them on his legs. That always calmed him down. An implicit promise he was going to get to fly soon. There. Now, settle down and don't wake everyone up. Tessa ran her fingers through her hair, pulling out the tangles. Might as well do a round of the building. One of the apprentices should be up by now, lighting the furnace for the day's work. Keep them on their toes, Master Castora always said, or they won't respect you. Tessa needed the respect. At just twenty-two in a profession that so often valued age over talent, she found herself too experienced to chum with the apprentices, but too young to be properly respected by her peers. She stilled her anxious thoughts and slipped on her thick-soled boots and heavy apron, then headed across the dark dormitory and down into the courtyard. Navigating glassworks grounds in the dark was second nature, and she soon entered the main workshop. The furnace still burned hot, a permanent flame that took days to get up to temperature for working god glass. The reheating chamber, however, had not yet been lit, and the workshop was empty. Tessa let out an irritated sigh. She found and read through the furnace schedule until she landed on today's date. Axio. That flirty little shit. She returned to the dormitory, where she found the third bed on the east wall and poked the snoring lump on the top bunk. Axio. Axio snorted and rolled over. Axio. She slapped him hard across the stomach. Ow! Son of a bitch! I... Tessa, what the piss was that for? Axio sat up in bed, peering at Tessa. He was only two years younger than her, with scraggly blonde hair and the kind of pretty face that would have looked more at home on either side of the transaction in a Grent whorehouse than in the glassworks. He was one of the many assistants who worked for the glassworks hauling firewood and keeping the workshops clean. Tessa held up the furnace schedule so he could see it in the moonlight. He ran a hand over his unshaven face and gave her a lopsided smile. Oh, come on, it's a holiday. And you're on the schedule, Tessa said, tossing him the clipboard. You were supposed to be up an hour ago tending the furnace and prepping the reheating chamber. She turned and headed toward the stairs, listening to him swear as he pulled on his boots and apron. His footsteps followed her, and soon they were in the main workroom. Tessa lit the lanterns while Axio fumbled loudly with an armload of kindling. Hey, he said, as he loaded wood into the reheating chamber. You never answered me about going into town for the solstice festival. He shot her a coy smile. We could even slip into Osa. Their winter beer is so much better than ours. Ah, damn, she'd completely forgotten about that. Tessa rolled her eyes as she lit the last lantern. Axio had been flirting with her ever since he arrived at the glassworks six months ago. Other than his looks, he had very little going on. He wasn't from a rich family, or terribly ambitious or bright, he wasn't even all that funny. Besides, she had already tangled herself up with Palua. She needed to make sure that wouldn't blow up in her face before she went looking for more fun. Caught for love, money, or political gain, Master Castora always said. Preferably two of the three. Anything else just sullies your reputation. Fun was never on that list and Castora had stopped turning a blind eye to her romp since her promotion to journeyman. I'll think about it, Tessa told Axio, before leaving him alone to finish lighting the reheating chamber. 
She was on her way back to the dormitory when she was surprised to see a light on in Master Castora's office. The master had been gone for weeks, off working on one of his secret projects out in the countryside. He wasn't supposed to be back until after the solstice. Tessa changed directions and paused just outside his office to listen to the far-off thunder. Something was odd about that thunder, but she couldn't quite place it. She put it out of her mind and knocked. Come, a soft male voice said. Master Castora's office was an impeccably clean room, containing a large drafting table, a single formal desk flanked by wing-back chairs for visiting politicians, and two large iron safes stuffed to the brim with his formulas and technical drawings. Castora himself was a widower in his sixties, remarried to his furnace, as he liked to say. He was a thin man of medium height, with a bald patch taking over the centre of his head of grey hair. His hands and arms were a patchwork of burn scars and permanent glass rot scales from a lifetime of god glass working. He had a distracted but gentle face, giving her a smile as he looked up from his desk. My dear Tessa, he said, what on earth are you doing up at this hour? Thunder woke me up, Tessa replied. The forge does seem to be unusually loud tonight. I heard Eki out of sorts. Did you check on him? Of course. He's just being a brat. Castora chuckled. How has the glassworks been in my absence? Everything has gone smoothly. The shipment for the Atria went out two days early. A military contract came back with signatures. It's on the corner of your desk there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Your work in the countryside? She asked. Castora could be capricious and secretive with what he shared. He was one of the best Cilicias in the world and often had secret projects for the Duke, foreign clients and even Osun Guild families. She did not expect him to give her a straight answer and was surprised when he leaned back in his chair, a smile flickering across his face. Oh, Tessa, you have no idea. That's why I asked, she reminded him gently. He chuckled again, gesturing for her to come close. She leaned in, bemused by his conspiratorial expression. I, Castora said victoriously, have created a phoenix channel. Tessa blinked back at him. A phoenix channel was a hypothetical mechanism used to turn energy into sorcery. In short, it could recharge spent pieces of god glass, allowing them to be reused indefinitely. A phoenix channel wasn't exactly mythical, but it was close to it. Every master in the world had tried to make one at some point in their career, and they'd all failed. No, you didn't, pops from her mouth before she could stop herself. It was wildly disrespectful, but Master Castora didn't seem to notice. No joking, he said with a grin. I made a working phoenix channel, just a prototype, mind you. The energy transfer was far from perfect. I had to burn six cartloads of hardwood just to charge a single piece of forge glass. He pulled something from his pocket and handed it solemnly to her. It was a yellow piece of forge glass. Her own work, actually. A tiny stud with a flared tail that amplified the natural strength of most people who wore it. The sorcery didn't affect her the way it affected others. She could hear the slight hum god glass gave off and feel the resonant vibration on the tips of her fingers. But Tessa was sorcery aphasic. She could not benefit from god glass, nor did she suffer from the effects of glass rot. It helped make her an especially good Cilicia, for she could work longer hours with no cost. The piece of forge glass hummed powerfully in her hand. It felt like god glass. It sounded like god glass. It was spent when I started, Castora promised. 
If he'd made a working Phoenix channel, and Castora had never been a liar or prankster, this could change the world. Recharging God Glass would become a whole new industry and help undercut the rising prices of cinder sand. She looked closer at Castora, seeing the exhaustion in his eyes and how his hands shook slightly. He was like a schoolboy having miraculously passed his tests after a week-long bender. That's incredible. What will you do next? Well, the reason I'm telling you is because I'm going to move the Phoenix Channel here to the glassworks. I'll put it in one of the furnaces and... Once the solstice is over, I'll get a few of the journeymen to help me refine it. Like I said, it's just a prototype. It needs a lot of work. Tessa looked at Castora hopefully. Like any Cilicia, she'd learned about the Phoenix Channel early in her apprenticeship and had daydreamed about making one. Have you already chosen your assistants? Of course, he exclaimed. You'll be my number two on this project. The concept is sound. We just need to make it better. Tessa inhaled sharply, any last vestiges of sleep fleeing her thoughts. She'd been Castora's protégé for years, and this would be by far the most important project he'd undertaken. His asking her to assist him directly, instead of calling in someone more experienced, was a massive honour. You're sure? You are, and I will deny this if you ever repeat it, the second best Silasir in Grant. Behind myself only, of course. He continued to grin at her. I wouldn't want anyone else helping me. Now, you need to get more sleep. I've already taken the Phoenix Channel back to my rooms. We'll unpack it after lunch and get working on ideas. If there's rain, it'll be a good day to brainstorm, I... He trailed off, his head cocked slightly to one side. Are you sure that's thunder from the forge? I think so, Tessa answered. She opened the door and listened to the distant sound. Several moments passed, and she heard Castora get up and come over to stand behind her. She said, Maybe you're right. It's too regular to be thunder, but what else could it be? Castora shoved past her, and she was about to say something but caught a glance at the side of his face. A scowl had taken over his normally cheerful demeanour. Come with me, he called, striding off across the compound. Tessa ran to catch up, her boots thumping across the hard-packed dirt. They walked past the dormitory, then down a slight incline toward the small gatehouse that oversaw the main entry into the glassworks. Tessa felt her heart racing and couldn't help but glance at Castora every few steps. Castora kept his eyes on the horizon even after they dipped beneath the curve of the hill and could no longer see the lights of Grent. She could see the outline of Master Castora putting bits of god glass into his piercings. She couldn't benefit from them herself, of course, but she knew the glass works enough to follow him without tripping in the near darkness. They reached the gatehouse, where Castora poked his head inside the tiny room. Get me Captain Gerald, he told the guard on duty. Yes, I know the hour. Get her immediately. Within the minute, a dark-skinned, middle-aged woman stumbled out of the door, pulling on her white and orange royal infantry jacket. Master Castora, Jero asked. I want you to wake everyone up. Excuse me? She yawned. Castora reached out and grabbed her by one of the braided epaulettes on her jacket. You hear that? That's cannon fire. It's coming from Eastern Grant. Wake everyone up, put them on alert, and send someone to the palace immediately. I can't, I... It was clear that Captain Jero was still shaking the sleep from her mind. It's probably just part of the solstice celebrations. At four in the morning? I don't give a damn what it might be. Send a messenger to find out. Until we're notified differently, I want you to assume that we're under attack. By who? 
Jero asked incredulously. Does it matter? Castora whirled on his heel and marched back up the hill. Tessa struggled to keep up. She had never seen Castora like this before, and it frightened her. You really think we're under attack? We're a neutral city-state. Who would attack us? Cannon fired in the east. It has to be the Orsons. Tessa laughed nervously. We're at peace with Osa. We're trading partners. Why would they attack us? Because all the rules are about to change. We're running out, Tessa. Of what? Tessa's fear grew deeper. Why did he not seem surprised at the prospect of an Osin attack? What did he know that she did not? Castora ignored her question. If it is an attack, it means things are worse than I suspected. Osa will want our Cindersand reserves, our research, even our Silasiers. She warned me about this. I thought she was wrong. I thought we had more time. I... Master! Tessa snapped her fingers. It was the only way to get Castora out of his own head sometimes. What is running out? Who warned you about an Olsen attack? I can't help if you don't tell me anything. He finally seemed to focus on her. Adriana Grappel warned me, he said. The woman who hired me to make the Phoenix Channel. She told me that Olsa's lust for Cindersand was going to push it toward war. All we can do is... He turned his head sharply and glared down the hillside back toward the gate, where Tessa was surprised to see that a trio of soldiers had appeared, standing just outside in the torchlight. They all wore the uniforms of Grent Royal Infantry, and it seemed that Captain Jero was about to let them in. Keep that gate barred, Castora bellowed. Jero turned in surprise. They say they're from the capital with a message from the Duke. She called up the hill at them. And what do they say is going on there? Castora shouted back. There was a brief discussion. Just the festivities. Should I let them in? Castora stared warily toward the gatehouse, like a dog sizing up a stranger at the dinner table. Quietly, he said, I want you to go to my office. Open both the safes. The key to the left one is hidden under the floorboard beneath the front left foot of my desk. The key to the second is in the first. Tessa's breath caught in her throat. What's going on? Keep that gate locked! Castora shouted to Jero. No one in or out except for the messenger you sent to Grant. Aside to her, he continued without answering her question. I want you to gather every paper in both safes. You take them to the furnace, and if I give you the signal, I want you to burn them. Tessa fought a wave of nausea. Those safes contain the cumulative research, discoveries, and technical drawings of the entire Grant glassworks, even some of her own. Burning all that would be burning generations of silic advances. And, she realised, all the Grent state secrets pertaining to Godglass. Shall I wake the apprentices? Only after the notes have been burned. Those are more important than any of our lives. She gave him a nod, hoping she didn't look too frightened, and began to jog toward his office. A gunshot suddenly rang out, and she whirled to look back down the hill just in time to see Captain Jero stumble back and fall. One of the Grent soldiers held a smoking pistol. Tear down the gates! Company 142, grapple those walls! The orders were barked in a soldier's authoritative voice with an Osan accent. Fear seized Tessa so powerfully that she almost tripped and fell in the dust. Only momentum kept her going. You two, stop! The soldier's voice shouted. Tessa looked over her shoulder as she rounded the dormitory. Castora was on her heels, waving her forward with one hand and pushing Godglass through his ear piercings with the other. Go! Go! he shouted. Get that gate down! Tessa heard a voice call in Osen. Secure the Silasiers! 
Tessa reached the office just a step ahead of Castora. He tore through the door behind her, barely winded, and, aided by his forge glass, threw aside his desk with the strength of three men. He snatched up a loose floorboard, then opened the left safe, then the right, and began piling stacks of papers into Tessa's arms. When it became clear she could carry no more, he slapped her on the shoulder. The furnace! Tessa sprinted back across the courtyard, tears streaming down her face. She burst into the workshop, barely avoiding a collision with Axio. What's going on? The apprentice asked in a panic. Did I hear pistol shots? Tessa ignored him until she could get the furnace door open, throwing her armload of notes straight into the glowing fire, her eyes drying instantly from the intense heat and stung by smoke. What? Axio tried to ask again as she ran back past him. She stopped only long enough to bark instructions. Wake up the apprentices and then the stable boys. No, stable boys first. We need horses saddled. Foreign soldiers are trying to capture the glassworks. We have to get everyone out. Go! She tried to inject Master Castora's sense of urgency and authority into her voice. It sounded frantic to her ears. And make sure Palua gets out. She's in my bed. She sprinted back to Castora's office and was surprised to find him standing outside, leaning on the long, engraved blow tube that he used when he worked on bigger projects. Smoke billowed from the open door and windows of his office. Tessa skidded to a halt. You... you set the building on fire! Fire was one of the great fears of a glassworks. A mismanaged furnace could destroy a workhouse. A deliberately set fire would put an end to the whole complex. Castora's face was ashen, expression grim but determined. This way is faster, he said, and more efficient. I'm not letting my work fall into Orson hands. I told Axio to wake the stable boys, Tessa said trying not to think of all that silic knowledge going up in a blaze. They'll saddle the horses. Good. We should flee as quickly as possible, Castora jerked, as if pulling himself out of a reverie. The prototype, he paused. No, it's too heavy for you, and there's no time. He turned one way, then another, seemingly frozen with indecision. Tessa grabbed him by the arm, pulling him along toward the stables. We can make another one, she told him. Leave it to the fires. Yes, of course, you're right. Soon they were running side by side, around the mess hall, skirting the compound walls. They rounded the dormitory and Tessa paused only long enough to stop at Eki's muse. The pistol shots had set him off and he was screeching terribly as he banged around inside the cage. Tessa didn't have time to think about her decision. She simply threw open the door to the muse, unable to stomach the idea of him being trapped in a raging fire. Go on, Eki, go! He stared at her for half a moment, hopped to a closer perch, and then leapt over her head. With a beating of his wings, he was off into the night. Tessa stared painfully after him until she felt Castora's tug on her arm. He'll be fine, Castora promised, and she allowed herself to be pulled after him. They hurried past the next dormitory and around the corner, just as the rear gate of the compound suddenly burst open. A squad of soldiers wearing Grint's uniforms, pouring inside with bayonets fixed on their muskets. Tessa barely stopped herself from calling for help before realising that these two might be imposters. Master Castora pulled her back around the corner, a scowl on his face. Back in the direction they'd come, Tessa could hear shouting and gunshots. The garrison, it seemed, had not been taken completely unawares. We're fighting back, she whispered to Castora. Indeed. Castora seemed to make a decision, and from a satchel at his waist, produced a sheaf of vellum that he thrust into her hands. We're going to split up. What? It doubles our chances of getting away. Flee the compound. I'll rally our garrison and try to save as many of them as I can. Where am I supposed to go? Tessa asked desperately. Take these schematics to Adriana Grappo at the Hyacinth Hotel in Osa. 
It's the Olsons who are attacking us, Tessa protested. Not all Olsons are alike, Castora replied sharply. Adriana helped me with the design. Tell her that the prototype was lost, but that these are schematics. He snatched her by the front of her shirt, pulling her close. If something happens to me, I want you to rebuild the prototype. But don't give these schematics to anyone else. No two-bit Olsen Silasir is going to finish my work. You will. Understand? Tessa was trembling all over now, but she tried to get a hold of herself, rallying her courage to meet the determination in Castora's eyes. I do. Don't worry. I don't think it'll come to that. I'll rally the garrison long enough for you to escape, and then we'll retreat into the city. If all goes well, I'll meet you at Adriana's hotel by the end of the week. Go! Before Tessa could protest further, Castora was off, running along the base of the compound wall, his figure periodically outlined by the occasional gas lamp. Tessa waited for a few moments, part of her hoping that Castora would return and come with her. When it became apparent he would not, she steeled herself with a series of deep breaths. She could do this. She'd been to Osa many times. It wasn't hard to blend in. All she had to do was escape Grent during a foreign invasion. Right. She rounded the back of the stables, pausing for another calming breath. She smoothed a stack of vellum on the ground and then rolled it into a tight scroll before stuffing it into her boot. Making sure it was hidden, she crept to the stable door. Axiel, she hissed into the darkness. Axiel, are the horses saddled? No answer. She swore to herself, not sure of her ability to saddle a horse in the dark. The moment of indecision cost her as a sharp voice suddenly barks from her left. Stop there, missy. Show your hands and no sudden moves. A shiver of fear went up Tessa's spine as she turned to see the middle-aged man in an ill-fitting Grint uniform. He held a musket across his chest, bayonet fixed, and looked like he'd use it without hesitation. His accent was most assuredly Osen. Tessa was still struggling for a reply when a shape suddenly swooped down from the morning darkness, hitting the soldier directly in the face. A flurry of screeches and swearing followed until the soldier managed to fend Eki off. Eki hopped twice across the ground and leapt into the air, disappearing from Tessa's vision. The soldier raised his musket, aimed and shot. The crack of the musket was followed immediately by a single agonising screech. Tessa's heart leapt into her throat, breath snatched away, terror for her own life giving way to immediate fury and grief. She would have thrown herself at the damned soldier if she hadn't been grabbed from behind. Go! Axio hissed in her ear. I'll buy you time, just run! Without waiting for an answer, Axio hefted a heavy, wood-splitting axe and squared off with the swearing soldier. Tessa found herself fleeing at a sprint, tears streaming down her face. Cutting through the stables and out the back, she unlocked a small service door in the compound wall and slipped through. Within moments, she was hurrying as fast as she dared along the paths that led into the woods outside of the glassworks, her way lit by the brightening glow of Castora's burning office. Tired, shocked, her adrenaline still pumping, Tessa stifled her guilt over leaving Axio alone with that soldier. She had one mission in mind. She had to get out of Grent and then into Osa, where she could wait for Master Castora in the house of an enemy. Chapter 4 Kizzy Vosian, enforcer for the Vosian Guild family, stood on a stoop on the edge of the castle district in Osa, and watched the passing revellers and street performers as they took part in the solstice celebration. It was just after nine in the morning, and distant cannon fire could be heard above the sounds of the street fair. She wondered how many people actually knew that a war had broken out on their doorstep. It was in all the newspapers this morning, of course. The Foreign Legion had invaded Grent less than six hours ago, to avenge the death of Adriana Grappa. 
but newspaper articles didn't necessarily mean the residents of Osa understood it. Bad things, after all, happened to other people. Holiday celebrations weren't going to stop until cannonballs started knocking over tenements, and even then, maybe not. One of the street performers had attracted Kizzy's eye. It was an old woman wearing a brightly coloured minstrel's tunic and carrying a ratty violin case slung over one shoulder. She seemed to be known in these parts, for a small crowd had gathered, and the old woman was making the rounds, talking and laughing with the onlookers, shaking a can for people to give her coins and banknotes. When no more donations were forthcoming, she walked to the centre of the street and set down her violin case. She opened it, removed the instrument, and struck a pose. A frown spread across the old woman's face as she began to tune the instrument. Her head was cocked to one side, her expression surpassing normal frustration until it became comical. She winked at one of the children. Kizzy snorted at the little display. Despite herself, she was intrigued, and she watched with growing bemusement as this went on for far too long. A tingling sensation began at the base of Kizzy's neck and travelled down her arms and into her fingertips. The sensation she felt when another glass dancer had begun to use their sorcery nearby. She looked at the old woman busker more closely, just as something leapt from the violin case at her feet. It was a bird, or rather, the semblance of one made of multicoloured glass. It hopped from the violin case to the cobbles, dancing about on two spindly feet, as the old woman finished tuning her violin. She drew the bow across the strings to produce a single long note, while the bird looked up at her. It flapped its wings experimentally, then shot into the sky as the busker began to play. Children laughed. Adults oohed and aahed, clapping to themselves. Onlookers shoved each other aside to throw money into the busker's violin case, and the bird moved perfectly with the ups and downs of the music. Oh, now that is good, Kizzy found herself saying out loud. She considered herself a cynic on the best of days, but even she was impressed by this display. There were two types of glass dancers, major talents and minor talents. The latter were relatively common and included among their number Kizzy herself. She could sense glass and other glass dancers, and with great concentration, she could manipulate small amounts of glass. Major talents were much more rare, and they almost always joined the military, where they could distinguish themselves quickly on the field of battle and then get themselves adopted into a guild family. Major talents were respected and feared, and they took themselves and their power very seriously. But this woman... Somehow she'd slipped through the norms and was entertaining people on the street, and she seemed to love it. If only we could all defy expectations, Kizzy muttered under her breath. She watched the performance for several minutes before her joy disappeared, and she forced herself to look away from the busker and focus on the job at hand. The job was a small warehouse located across the street and half a block down from the glass dancer busker. It was a nondescript little place right next door to a major stable. Most people wouldn't give it a second glance. Kizzy, on the other hand, had spent the last two weeks tracking a stolen shipment of cinder sand to this very place. There was a young woman lounging outside the warehouse, wearing a labourer's heavy winter tunic, a blunderbuss slung casually over one shoulder. The woman's head was craned to watch the glass dancer busker. She was yawning occasionally, her mind clearly elsewhere. The problem with gangs, Kizzy had long ago decided, was that they attracted the stupid, the talentless, and the lazy. If someone wasn't good enough to make it as a guild family enforcer or to join the National Guard, what business did they have as a lookout for ill-gotten goods? Kizzy pushed away from her stoop and wandered slowly down the street, passing the warehouse and its lookout before stepping inside the stable next door to find a pair of middle-aged men loitering near the door, both with their pinkies marked by light blue client paint 
that showed that they served and were protected by the Vosien. You the Teamsters, I asked for. Kizzy showed them her silic sigil. The Vosien inverted triangle with the setting sun over the desert. Her sigil was much smaller than a proper guild family member's. She was only a bastard, after all. But it tended to elicit the proper amount of respect. One of them nodded, glancing into the street nervously. I hope this job is going to be fast. I heard the Castle Hill garrotters are dangerous. His companion nodded eagerly. The Castle Hill garrotters are a wannabe guild family that can't figure out how to safely sail the cinder sand they stole from a Vossian riverboat, Kizzy replied. She tried to keep the irritation out of her voice. It didn't used to be like this. She used to have status and regard. She used to be in charge of an entire National Guard watchhouse, whining and dining powerful Vorsian clients. Now she was relegated to tracking down thieves. Shouldn't we come back when things aren't as crowded? The other asked. It's Castle Hill. It's always crowded. Besides, they'd expect us to hit them at night. Now bring your cart and horse around. Without waiting for an answer, Kizzy emerged from the stable. She hugged the wall, walking slowly and casually, approaching the lookout from the left. The poor woman didn't even know she was there until Kizzy had a stiletto pressed against her side. The lookout inhaled sharply. You have a choice, Kizzy said pleasantly. Scream, and I will perforate your lungs. Or you can answer my questions and continue to breathe. Nod if you choose the second one. The lookout swallowed hard and nodded. Who are you? Kizzy lifted her right hand to show the silic sigil, while keeping her left, along with the stiletto, firmly pressed against the lookout. Glass dam, the woman swore. Yasmos said the Vorsian couldn't track us. Yasmos was a petty crook, the self-styled head of the Castle Hill Garotas. Yasmos is an idiot, Kizzy said. How many are inside? Just the Yasmos and the girls. Define girls. But when the lookout didn't respond quickly enough, Kizzy gave her a little poke with a stiletto. Oh, his sisters, Dory and Figgis. And that's it? Yes. What kind of god glass do they have? All three have forge glass. Yasmos wears wick glass, but I think it's been spent for months. All right. Slide that blunderbuss off your shoulder. Good. Now tell me what you learned from this little lesson. The lookout gave an eep sound as Kizzy poked with the stiletto again. Not to steal from the Vorsian. Wow. I'm surprised you actually picked up on that. Now get the piss out of here. I'm going to pretend like I never saw your face. The lookout did as instructed, hurrying down the street without looking back. Kizzy waited long enough to be sure she hadn't doubled back before heading around to the narrow alley next to the warehouse. She tossed the blunderbuss in the mud and removed a pair of god glass earrings from her pocket. The earrings were expertly braided, three wire-thin god glasses, wit glass, forge glass and sight glass, wound together into one powerful piece. They were by far the most expensive items she owned, and she held them up to the light to see just how much sorcery they had left in them. The colour had leaked out of perhaps half of the intertwined glass, like a partially filled cup of wine. If she rationed herself, she would get another five months of use out of them. She slipped the hooked ends into a piercing on either ear, listening to the hum of the sorcery and feeling more alive from it. Kizzy was not by nature a violent person. Even discounting her minor talent as a glass dancer, she could be dangerous. But that was a prerequisite to being a guild family enforcer, after all. But violence always seemed like the first resort of morons. A bit of careful planning, some bribery and blackmail, 
maybe a bit of good old-fashioned investigation. Those were her usual tools. Unfortunately for her, cleaning out an upstart gang did not require a lot of subtlety. She walked down to the warehouse's side door at the end of the alley and pounded on it hard. Putting her back to the wall, she shifted her stiletto to her right hand and drew the blackjack from her pocket. The door opened and a woman's voice asked, Who's there? Kizzy brought her blackjack down hard across the woman's thigh, eliciting a pained yell and giving her enough time to check the woman's face. Yep, it was one of Yasmus's sisters, Figgis. Kizzy slit her throat and kicked her backward into the warehouse, following her falling body in at a run. The forge glass pushed her body beyond normal limits, giving her supernatural strength and speed, while the wit glass allowed her to process her surroundings as if the world were standing still. The light in the warehouse was dim, and it might have hampered Kizzy's abilities if not for the sight glass in her earrings. She spotted Yasmus to her left, a man in his mid-twenties, wearing a soiled but expensive jacket he probably took off someone he murdered. Dory, the other sister, was just behind him. Both stared at Figgis with mouths agape. Kizzy threw her blackjack overhand, striking Yasmus right between the eyes. He stumbled back, distracted long enough for Kizzy to close the distance. Her stiletto found the space between his ribs. Kizzy caught a glimpse of Dory raising a pistol. She jerked up on her stiletto, lifting Yasmus slightly, using him as a shield as the pistol went off. The sound, amplified by her sight glass, deafened Kizzy in the enclosed space. She ignored the ringing in her ears, tossed aside Yasmus, and buried her stiletto in Dory's eye. Kizzy checked the small warehouse for any other gang members before returning to make sure all three of her targets were dead. She wiped her stiletto on Yasmus's jacket. Her heart was pounding. There was blood on the sleeves of her tunic, and she couldn't hear damn much of anything. Otherwise, the operation had been a success. She paused that thought and did another sweep of the warehouse. It was a typical thieves' hideout, with stolen goods scattered on the floor and stacked haphazardly on shelves, mostly stuff that had fallen off a riverboat or been pickpocketed. Kizzy still didn't know who their connection down at the riverboat docks was, but that wasn't part of her job. What mattered was the crate of cinder sand, just a couple of feet square, tucked into a corner, stamped with the Vorsian silic symbol. It was still full of the fine, greyish-coloured sand, and for that, she breathed a sigh of relief. She didn't need any other perceived failures in her life right now. She switched out her braided earrings for a piece of cure glass, and the ringing in her ears went away within moments. She poked her head out to the side door of the warehouse. Revelers must have heard the gunshot, but no one seemed to care, so she walked back to the front door and slid it open. Her teamsters were just outside with their horse and cart. You bring the canvas, I asked for? Yes, ma'am. Good. Put the cinder sand in the cart, then wrap up those three bodies and toss them on top. The teamsters looked at the blood on Kizzy's jacket but didn't comment. They knew better than to question a Vorsi and enforcer. As they got to work, Kizzy helped herself to some of the stolen goods, three gold watches, six pocketbooks, a couple of pieces of low-quality god glass, and a bottle of twelve-year Ereptian wine. Deliver the cinder sand first, then take the bodies to Cannery Six on Butcher Street, she instructed. She waved at the hideout. Any god glass you find goes to the Guild family. The rest of this shit is yours. Really? One of them asked in surprise. Kizzy Vosien takes care of her people, she told them. Much obliged, Kizzy the Teamsters replied in unison. She returned to the street, where she tossed one of the gold watches in the glass dancer busker's violin case and made her way across town to the assembly district. By eleven she'd reached her favourite cafe, where she rolled up her sleeves to hide the blood on them. She sank into a wrought iron chair in the outdoor seating area, putting her head in her hands, still burning off the fumes of her adrenaline. 
She knew plenty of enforcers who liked killing people. They considered it a perk of the job. Not her. It wasn't going to ruin her life, but it would take her a few weeks until she slept properly again. Tracking down stolen shipments, wiping out petty thieves who'd made a misstep. That was all low-ranking enforcer work. She hadn't had to do this kind of shit for over a decade. Yet here she was, biting her tongue, doing the dirty jobs. The price of failure, she supposed. Cassandra Vorsian. Kizzy looked up sharply at the person who pulled out the chair across from her and dropped into it. There was a word of rebuke on her tongue, but she let it die as her sorcerer's senses picked up something that told her that this man was a major talent. In front of her was someone whom she vaguely recognised. He was an inch or two shorter than her, with swept-back black hair, a fine scarlet jacket over a grey tunic, and the dark olive skin of an Osan native. She could see a piece of high-quality sky glass threaded through a piercing on his right ear. Glass, damn it! She found herself saying aloud. Her frustration was instantly forgotten, her fatigue evaporating. Demir Grappo! Demir grinned at her. You recognize me? Barely. Kizzy was a seasoned enforcer, someone used to surprises, but seeing Demir Grappo was a damned shock. Gone was the rotund, soft-skinned political genius who'd managed to charm himself into the beds of half the Guild family daughters in Osa. He'd lost at least three stone, and his face and hands were covered in old scars. Demir looked hard, like he'd worked two lifetimes as an enforcer. She found her mouth hanging open. Glass, damn it, she said again. You haven't changed a bit, he said with a cheeky grin. I mean, you didn't have blood all over you last time we saw each other, but I have to say, you look good. Is that a come on or a genuine compliment? Kizzy asked dubiously. Demir placed his hand on his heart, feigning shock. I have never flirted with you, even once. Yeah, and we both know why. Kizzy's snort cracked into a laugh, and she found herself grinning. She'd been short on friends as of late. Seeing Demir was a genuine, if unexpected, pleasure. What happened to you? I mean, I know the rumours, but you... She found herself trailing off, her pleasure turning to awkwardness as she tried to figure out what to say to someone who'd sacked a city and then disappeared after a mental breakdown. She mentally checked herself, remembering that she was just an enforcer and he was high above her station in several ways. Would he forgive the impropriety of a childhood friend? To her relief, his grin remained. Move to Marne, Demir said. Married a princess, fought pirates on the high seas, and founded a new religion. Now I'm back in Osa looking for followers. Kizzy squinted at Demir, wondering how much of that was actually true. With him, it damn well might be. Glass damn, your mother. I'm so sorry. You know how much I looked up to her. Demir's smile wavered but did not disappear. Thank you. Tea? Coffee? Coffee. Demir gestured over a waiter and ordered. I'm going to apologise in advance and skip any more pleasantries. I've got a very busy day ahead of me. I want to offer you a job. I have a job, Kizzy said, blinking at Demir in confusion. She had a thousand questions she wanted to ask. Last time they spoke, Demi was still the very popular governor of an Osan province. So much had changed. You're out of favour, Kizzy. Kizzy felt herself suddenly on the back foot, surprised that he was talking about her instead of himself. You don't have to tell me that. And I have asked your brother to lend me your services. He agreed. Which brother? Capric. Kizzy rolled her eyes. Capric wasn't the worst of her half-siblings, but he wasn't the best either. Their relationship had always been pure business. 
lending out one of their enforcers to a family friend without actually asking the enforcer in question was typical of his behaviour. So this is one of those things where I don't have a choice? Demir shrugged. I'm not like that. I'll tell you the job. If you don't want it, I'll tell Caprick that I changed my mind. If you do want it, I pay well and I'm a good friend to have. Kizzy chewed on the inside of her cheek as the waiter set their coffees in front of them. Was he a good friend to have? Adriana dead, Demir gone for these past nine years. Being lent out to the grappo wasn't exactly high society stuff. On the other hand, he was a Guild family patriarch now, and even if he weren't, he still commanded the respect that any major talent glass dancer did. Of course she would hear him out. I didn't even know you were back in town. I've been home for less than twenty-four hours. He tapped his fingers on the table impatiently. Well? Lay it out, she said. What do you know about my mother's death? Kizzy shook her head. Only what I read in the papers. There have been rumours for the last two weeks, but the news only broke this morning. Assassinated on the steps of the assembly by Grent agents. Six people killed my mother. Only one was caught. I want you to find the other five. Oh. Kizzy leaned back in her seat, setting down the coffee she'd been about to sip. I thought all six were from Grent. Though, now that she thought about it, the newspapers hadn't actually made that claim. I don't know. The apprehended killer seemed to think so, but that's the thing about shackle glass. It only provides the truth as the wearer knows it. Public murders are messages, Kizzy. I want to know what message was being sent. Who killed my mother is not as important as why they killed her. You're not going to deal with this yourself? Glass dancers were not known to shy away from blood. Demir had never been a violent man, but Kizzy would have thought the murder of his mother would bring that violence out. Demir flinched and shook his head. I'm going to approach it from a different angle, he said thoughtfully. My mother... He trailed off, then repeated. A different angle. Am I just finding and questioning them, or am I supposed to mete out justice? Demir drummed his fingers on the table, looking off into the street. This was clearly not something he'd actually decided on himself. Finally, he said, As you see fit. Seriously? Seriously. As I said, the who is not important. I want to know the why. That makes it a lot harder. Demi removed his coffee cup from the saucer and dropped something on the dish, pushing it across the table to her. It was a piece of horseshoe-shaped light green god glass about the size of Kizzy's pinky finger with one end of the horseshoe tapered and hooked to go in a piercing. Shackle glass? She said in surprise. Shackle glass was illegal for use by civilians, but you could get it if you were rich or connected enough. She hadn't seen a piece in person for years. I want confessions. Kizzy looked carefully into Demir's eyes. There was an edge to him that hadn't been there in his youth a hardness that mirrored the changes to his appearance. Perhaps he had already become a violent man. He was a glass dancer after all. Was he going after something bigger than the killers themselves? Perhaps the hands that swung the cudgels were merely a loose end. Does Caprick know what you're borrowing me for? He does not. Demi sipped his coffee, studying her right back over the lip of the cup. I told him I needed some extra security around the hotel. Why me? Demi raised an eyebrow as if the answer should be obvious. Because you have a hard-earned reputation for being the only honest enforcer in Osa. You put personal integrity above your loyalty to the Vossian. I'm out of favour for exactly that reason, Kizzy snorted. 
And I like that. We were also childhood friends. I could use a friend right now. So? Will you take the job? That phrase echoed something that had gone through Kizzy's head just minutes ago, lowering her guard. She should say no. A murdered assemblywoman was something for the cinders to deal with, not a lone enforcer. But it sounded like the cinders had already moved on. The Grents were the full guys, and Demi didn't accept that explanation. You might not like the answers I dig up, she offered. I'm prepared for that eventuality. One last question? Ask anything. Is Montego going to be involved in this? Demi hesitated just a moment too long. He has been summoned. I have no idea when he will arrive. Are the two of you still estranged? Interesting choice of words, Kizzy replied with a tired chuckle. We also haven't spoken in fifteen years. Just thinking about Montego was vaguely unpleasant for a number of reasons. Their personal past was one. Another was the reason that Montego made everyone nervous. He killed for sport. I won't ask you to work with him, but you might see him around, Demir said. In a self-abusive way, Kizzy realised that this sealed the deal. The chance to see Montego again, with Demir acting as a buffer between them, was too good to pass up. Fifteen years without so much as a letter passed between them, after the way it ended last time, the sudden yearning for closure was a powerful motivator. She snatched up the piece of shackle glass and stuffed it into her cork-lined pocket, the momentary contact causing her to feel a little tired and giddy. Fine, she said. I'll do it. Something seemed to pass across Demi's expression. Relief, perhaps? The assembly won't tell you any more details. They covered things up pretty well, and they'll probably be irritated if they find out that you're meddling around their investigation. I have circumvented official investigations before, Kizzy replied. Most experienced enforcers had. It was, after all, their job to manoeuvre the space between the National Guard, the Guild families and the law. Demir suddenly downed his coffee in one go and stood up, tossing enough coins onto the table to pay for them both. Find me at my hotel if you need me. Breenan will arrange for expenses and payment. Thank you, Kizzy. This takes a weight off my shoulders. Kizzy raised her cup to Demir, then watched as he walked away. And, she said quietly, puts that weight onto mine. Despite her misgivings, Kizzy was intrigued. She had never been given permission to stick her nose into a proper conspiracy before. It might be simple. She might track five killers to the Grant border and then tell Demir that it was exactly as it seemed. She had a feeling, however, that this job would be anything but simple. Chapter 5 Tessa used the cover of the early morning darkness that crossed the river, commandeering one of the many public canoes that could be found tied to docks throughout the Grent Delta. She was no strategist or soldier, but as far as she could tell, the invasion of Grent seemed focused on the east many miles away. The attack on the Grent Royal Glassworks appeared to be an isolated contingency. She almost turned back a hundred times, reasoning with herself that Castora might have rallied their small garrison and turned away the Osen invaders. But she'd been given a task, and she would deliver the schematics to Adriana Grappo. If Castora wanted them with the Grappo, despite the breakout of war, then she would follow his instructions. By dawn, just a couple of hours after the attack on the glassworks, she had reached the northern boroughs of Grent. Church bells rang, people crowding the street, rumours spreading faster than wildfire. The Duke was already dead, one man claimed. The Osen surprise attack had failed entirely, another shouted. Some people screamed and panicked, while others stood on their doorsteps and stared toward the smoke rising to the east, 
loudly positing that this was all some sort of mistake. Tessa stopped Tony long enough to ask for news from passers-by. None of it was helpful, and yet she kept moving. She'd been given a mission. She intended on carrying it out. She found herself staring at the sky, looking for Eki's familiar silhouettes circling above the glassworks far behind her. His absence felt like a hole in her gut. He was, she realised, the last thing she had from home, given to her as a chick when she apprenticed with Castora ten years ago. He'd been her companion ever since. By noon, she had reached the suburbs. Roads turned into dirt tracks, tenements giving way to houses which gave way to farmsteads. She walked for miles, her feet hurting in her heavy Silicea's boots, her apron discarded so as not to so candidly give away her profession. She had no money, no god glass, and no papers. She was exhausted and scared, but she forced herself to keep her eyes up and her shoulders squared. If she walked with purpose, she would be less likely to be questioned. She couldn't cry for Eki, not yet. Her plan was simple. Follow the cobbled highway all the way around Osa and enter the city from the north, where she was less likely to be questioned. She might have to sleep under a hedge for a night or two, but it should be safe. It was getting into the late afternoon when she came over a hill to see a small group blocking the road just below her. It was a large family, perhaps twenty people all told, mostly children and the elderly. They had three wagons, all piled with what looked to be their worldly possessions. The last of these wagons was stuck in the ditch at the bottom of the hill, one wheel sunken deep into the mud. The four healthy adults and their ox couldn't get the cart unstuck. The children and elderly stared back toward the smoke rising from Grent, wringing their hands nervously. Refugees, then, fleeing the city at the outbreak of the fighting. Mom, one of the men called. He was perhaps in his forties, covered in mud from trying to get the wagon unstuck. Mom, please help us. Tessa had already moved to give them a wide berth, and it took her a moment to realise they were talking to her. She hesitated. Slowing down meant that more fleeing refugees might overtake her on the road. These poor folks seemed worried about the same thing. Could she risk stopping to help? Please, ma'am, the man called again. Just one more to help push should do it. We're all about spent and we still have miles to go. Tessa weighed her options for half a moment. Where are you headed? She asked. Of Lorstad, the man replied. I've got an Osen cousin up there who'll take us in until whatever is happening blows over. Tessa's route would pass Vlorstad later this evening. It was still many miles away, over the border. Travelling with a group like this might actually be safer. Give me a ride to Vlorstad, she asked. Absolutely. Tessa rolled up her sleeves and hurried down to the bottom of the ditch. She was no ox, but years of working the furnaces had given her a strong back and arms. She set her heavy boots against the slippery sides of the ditch and threw her shoulder against the back of the wagon with the other four. True to the stranger's word, they managed to rock it back and forth until the wheel popped out of the rut. Within minutes they had freed the wagon entirely and helped push it up the next hill. The group caught their breath there, where they were joined by the others. Tessa quickly found herself swamped by children hugging her legs and elderly men and women shaking her hand enthusiastically. The leader, the man who'd called to her, shooed them all away. My name is Ceres, by the way, he offered his hand. Tila, Tessa replied, giving the fake name she'd thought up a few miles back. Mighty obliged, Tila. Had half a dozen others pass right by us without so much as a glance. You said you're going to Vlorstad? Passed it, actually. But a ride would save my feet. No problem at all if you're willing to help us out of any more pickles like that one. The agreement was made, 
and Tessa was soon riding on the back lip of the wagon she'd helped rescue, sitting beside a sleeping child and listening to Sarah's wife sing softly to pass the time. It was a massive relief to be off her feet, but it also gave her empty time to think about Eki. She could still hear his pained screech after that musket shot, and, though she had not witnessed it, she could imagine the plume of feathers and blood as he tumbled to the earth. Her dark reverie was interrupted by Ceres. Teela, do you know what's happening in Grent? He asked over his shoulder. Nobody seems to know why Osa attacked. I don't either, Tessa admitted. That wasn't strictly true. If Kasora was correct, then the Osans had decided to seize Cindersand and research from the smaller city-state. He nodded as if that was what he expected. Where are you heading? he asked. Tessa sought an easy lie. I have a friend in Havshire. As soon as I heard the cannons, I thought it was a good idea to get out of town. You're a wise woman, Ceres responded, passing a trunk lashed in place just behind him. We did the same thing. The missus had us up at five o'clock this morning, packing everything we could fit. If Osa has finally decided Grant's time has come, it's best to get somewhere we can pretend we've been Osan all along, right? I doubt anyone will even notice. He paused. Havshire is forty miles. Are you really going to walk all that way in those boots, without a jacket? I panicked, Tessa said, hoping she sounded passably sheepish. My family was at Holocan when I was a kid. I spooked pretty easily at the sound of cannon fire. Sarah shuddered. My sympathies, young lady. I've heard the rumours about that place. Glass damned Osens. If you'd like to stay with us in Vlostad tonight, I can't offer you a bed, but might be able to rustle up a spare blanket and let you huddle under the wagons. It was better than sleeping in a bush. That's very kind of you, Tessa said. She would prefer to make it into Osa tonight, even if she had to walk past midnight, but this gave her an extra option. She could make the decision once they reached Vlorstadt. She looked down at her boots dangling off the back lip of the wagon, covered in mud. She wasn't supposed to wear them outside the compounds. They were heavy and expensive, and the less wear on them the better. The thought of Castora scolding her for tramping through a ditch in them almost made her smile. Surely that was exactly what would happen when he caught up to her at the Hyacinth Hotel. She could hear the lecture tumbling out of him as he distractedly examined the schematic she'd smuggled into Osa. Checking to be sure no one was watching, Tessa drew the vellum schematics out of her boot and unrolled them on her knee. It felt a little like opening someone's personal journal. She pushed past that thought, reminding herself that Castora was going to bring her into the project anyway. She might as well know what it was. Each piece of vellum was dominated by technical drawings of the Phoenix Channel and the compartment in which it was housed, viewed from several different angles. It looked like a weapon of war, a cannon in which energy was loaded in one end and sorcery came out the other. The margins of the vellum were crammed with tiny notes. She was mostly left to her own devices there at the back of the wagon, and it gave her plenty of time to study the schematics. Within a couple of hours, she had a good grasp of Castora's working theories and the materials he had used. Had anyone ever thought to use cinderite as the core of the Phoenix Channel before? Cinderite had its own sorcerous resonance, but in a thousand years of research, no one had ever found a use for it. She slipped the schematics back into her boot, her mind turning as she considered ways to improve upon his design. The sleeping child beside her soon woke, and Tessa was bemused to find him watching her. The little boy was perhaps eight or nine, curled up in a large tunic. Tessa looked towards Ceres, wondering if she should alert him that his child was awake. She was, she was the first to admit, not good with kids. Plenty of the apprentices at the glassworks were as young as twelve, but she didn't have experience with anyone younger than that since her own little sister died at Holocan. Hi, she ventured. The child remained silent. I'm Teela. 
It's good to meet you. Still no response. Tessa side-eyed the child for a few minutes, waiting for some kind of reaction, but he seemed content to watch her. She eventually let her gaze drift back to the south, where the plumes of smoke stood out in the golden rays of the setting sun. She felt a tug on her sleeve and looked down to find that the boy had produced a number of little wooden toys and laid them out on his lap. There were perhaps a dozen of them, all different animals. He displayed them without expression, as if waiting to gauge her response. Are those yours? A solemn nod. Tessa pointed to one of the animals, a little bird with wings spread. I have a bird. Had, she flinched, feeling her smile slip. His name was Eki, and he was a falcon. He had gorgeous brown feathers tipped with red and a speckled white and brown breast. The boy handed her the bird, placing it in her palm. Taking it between two fingers, she mimicked it flying around his head, then used it to pounce on one of the other animals in his lap. He finally cracked, a shy smile darting across his face so quickly she might have imagined it. Leon, Sarah's called. Leave our guest alone. He's fine, Tessa assured him. If he's bothering you, just ignore him. Sarah's stretched and yawned. Just a few more hours to go. I'll be glad to be off the road, let me tell you. I don't like travelling with all the old folks. He gestured to the two wagons in front of them, where the oldest of the group were riding in the back like Tessa, while most of the other children were walking alongside. Last thing we need is one of them catching sick. I... They came over a hill, the other wagons momentarily leaving their vision over the crest, and then Sarah's yanked at the reins, swearing loudly. The sudden jerking of the wagon nearly dumped Tessa off the back of the cart. Tessa steadied herself and craned her neck to look for the problem, half expecting to see a tree across the road. What she did see made her blood run cold. There, less than twenty paces in front of the lead wagon, was a handful of Osun legionaries. Four men, three women, all wearing their black uniforms with gold trim, muskets held with bayonets fixed. The soldiers blocked the road. There was no hailing, no conversation. The soldiers approached, two of them coming out front while the others hung back just a little ways. What's going on? Sarah's demanded. The soldier in charge, a woman with a crimson and silver braided collar, ignored him. This is good, she told her closest companion. Told you it would pay off. Mom, Sarah said firmly, I have papers showing Osin relations. We're simply trying to get to her family. The soldier didn't even seem to notice she was being spoken to. That one, she said, pointing at Sarah's. That one, that one, that one. Oh, definitely that one. She pointed directly at Tessa. The other soldier came over and grabbed Tessa by the arm. She tried to struggle, but found his grip like iron as he yanked her down from the wagon. She twisted, landing hard on one knee looking up to see a forge glass stud in one of his ears. No point in fighting him at all. The other five soldiers finally approached. They grabbed family members, yanking them out of wagons, pushing them to either side of the road, emptying each cart of people before guiding the cart horses to a clearing just to one side of the highway. Sarah's objections grew louder and more violent, until one of the soldiers flipped around his musket and bashed the stock across Sarah's head. Tessa stifled a gasp as he was dragged over to Tessa's side of the road and dumped beside her. It was all so sudden that Tessa barely had time to react. She stared at the soldiers, dumbfounded, then across the road to where all the children and older members of the group had been herded. The boy, Leon, stared at his father with mouth agape, clutching his wooden toys. Tessa wrestled with her fear and confusion, realising she should have made a plan for this eventuality not knowing what she could even do. Should she escape? 
abandon the family that had given her a ride? It wasn't like she could actually help them. Children cried, adults wailed, and with growing horror, Tessa realised that all the able-bodied adults had been deposited over with her. She looked around for some sort of leadership among the group, but they seemed even more shocked than she was. She knelt down beside Sarah's, splashing him with a little bit of water from his own canteen, pressing the hem of her tunic against the split in his brow until he came around. The sorting finished. The soldier in charge looked bored, yawning toward a weeping child, while one of her subordinates pointed across the street. What do we do with them, Sergeant? Run them off. We got no use for them. Sarah sat up, casting a grateful look toward Tessa. What are you going to do with us? he demanded. I have Ocean family. I have... The sergeant drew her pistol with the casual confidence of someone who was always prepared to kill. Sarah's fell silent, and a smile flickered across her face. Your trespassers, she said with a shrug. Spies, coming across the border to spread chaos and dissension. We are no such thing, Sarah objected. Another yawn from the sergeant. Does it look like I give a shit? We're confiscating your goods. The Osun Navy needs sailors. I need a country home. One of the other soldiers laughed at this. She continued, If you survive a few voyages, I'm sure they'll let you find your family when the war is over. Tessa barely listened. She was watching carefully, looking for the chance to escape. Sprinting off into the trees might be her best chance. There were only seven soldiers, and they had over twenty prisoners to corral. If even one tried to come after her, they would risk losing the rest of the family. Tessa had just planned out her escape route when a young man whom she had not met suddenly made a break for it, sprinting toward the very tree she'd be eyeballing. Without batting an eye, the sergeant took a musket from one of her subordinates, sighted, and put a bullet between the young man's shoulder blades. The crack of the musket felt like a physical blow. Tessa stared at the fallen body listening to the gasps around her. A middle-aged woman, probably the young man's mother, tried to run toward him, but was restrained by her family. Got no patience for your shit, the sergeant proclaimed. Friend of mine will be by in an hour, and then you'll all start your careers in the Ocean Navy. Get used to being on your knees, because there's a lot of decks that need scrubbing. To this point, Tessa had managed to keep some veneer of calm. Her glassworks had been attacked, she'd been forced to abandon her master, they'd killed her glass-damned bird, and now she was being sold like a dog. Her panic finally broke through. She couldn't help the family, but maybe she could help herself. She could not fail Castora. She leapt to her feet, facing the sergeant, squaring her shoulders. I'm not being sold to the Navy, she snapped. Nobody's selling anyone, the sergeant replied with a chuckle, as if amused by Tessa's outburst. Slavery is illegal in the Osun Empire. You're merely being impressed into service for an indeterminate amount of time. I won't do it. Whatever humour the sergeant found in the situation seemed to fade away. Reload your musket, she ordered her subordinates. Tessa sought desperately for something that could save her without revealing who she was. Castora's orders echoed through her mind. Trust no one. Get to Adriana Grappo. I'm more valuable to you here in Osa than I am on some ship. Do tell, the sergeant said flatly. I'm a Silasir. The sergeant's eyes narrowed. Everyone was staring at Tessa now, from the soldiers to Ceres to the rest of the kind people who'd allowed her to share their company for the last few hours. The sergeant stepped over and grabbed Tessa by the arms, pulling up her sleeves to examine the scars on them. She looked at Tessa's tunic, then at her boots. Well, glass damn, she said. I guess you are. What rank? Tessa hesitated. She shouldn't expose herself too much. Senior apprentice. 
Impressive. Tessa felt a wave of relief flood through her. I can arrange a payment for my freedom. I promise you'll get more from me that way. The sergeant seemed to mull this over, a thoughtful frown on her face. From who? Trust no one. But Tessa had to take a chance here, otherwise she wouldn't deliver anything. From Adriana Grappo at the Hyacinth Hotel. She's a family friend. The sergeant stepped away, conferring with two of her subordinates while the others kept a strict watch on the refugees. Tessa's heart pounded in her chest. She could feel her brief companion staring at her with a mix of fear, anger and jealousy. She hated to abandon them, but forced herself to keep her thoughts on her mission. Maybe she'd gotten through this. The conference stretched on for several minutes. Sweat began to trickle down the back of Tessa's neck, and the soldiers on guard duty shifted nervously. Finally, the sergeant returned looking irritable. Tempting offer? she said shortly, but I'm turning it down. Tessa's breath caught in her throat. Was she being literally shipped off into the Osa Navy? Was there any way to escape? Why? she demanded, putting every ounce of imperiousness into her voice that she could manage. The sergeant seemed unimpressed. Because we have strict instructions to deliver captured Grint Silicees to the Ivory Forest Glassworks, and, she shrugged, Adriana Grappo is dead. It's the whole reason for the war. I doubt we're going to get a good ransom out of her failure of a son. Tessa barely heard anything after the word dead. She stared back at the sergeant, her mouth hanging open, feeling numb. I... What happened? I don't... She tried to form a coherent sentence. No more questions, the sergeant sighed. Her demeanour had changed noticeably. Perhaps not respectful, but not as severe as she was behaving toward the other prisoners. Tessa tried to take solace in that, and failed. She'd had one ally within Osa, and a corpse wasn't going to provide the protection Tessa needed to get through this war. How was she going to meet back up with Master Castora? Where would she go? Assuming, of course, she could get out of this mess. Chapter 6 Grent was a city-state built daringly across the length and breadth of a massive river delta. Countless channels and canals divided the city into hundreds of island districts of various sizes, and incredible levees and dikes controlled the flow of the delta in a feat of engineering that had never been matched. It was a city long used to battling the inevitable, which is one of the reasons it had survived so long, mere miles from the capital of the aggressive Osun Empire. Osun soldiers often joked about invading Grent. It was a joke because it was so outlandish. Grent was not a threat to the Empire, and there was far more to lose than gain when invading such a headache of a city. That joke, Idrian Sapulki reflected, was funny right up until the moment the order came for the invasion. Idrian returned from the front line bruised, sore and exhausted after nearly 14 hours of savage street fighting through the eastern suburbs of Grent. In that time he had killed 18 people, watched three friends die and taken one wound that would leave a nasty scar. Killing was part of the job of a soldier and the wound was already mostly healed thanks to the powerful cure glass sorcery in his breacher armour but losing friends had never grown easier over his decades in the Foreign Legion. As was his habit, he would bury his feelings until the end of the conflict, at which time he could properly grieve. He paused at the top of a hill, leaning on his massive breacher shield, looking across the suburbs where his battalion, the Iron Horn Rams, trudged behind him carrying their dead and wounded. The sun was starting to set, shining gold of the placid river and half-blinding Idrian's view of the delta. Smoke rose from several places along the front lines, where the Osun Foreign Legion had pushed miles into the Grent suburbs, 
while the report of artillery duels had been going on for almost as long as the Ironhorns had been fighting. This sudden war was, Adrian didn't mind admitting to himself, disconcerting and frightening. He was used to shipping overseas, where he'd have weeks or even months to prepare himself for a coming conflict against a distant enemy. This time was different. Just two days ago he was playing cards with Tadius, enjoying their cushy ceremonial posting in the Osun suburbs. Now they were on the offensive against their closest neighbour. Almost back to camp, Idrian said encouragingly to a flagging engineer. Keep your head up. Thanks, Idrian, came the weary reply. Idrian was just about to continue on himself when the distant plume of cannon smoke drew his attention. It was followed mere moments later by the hair-raising whoosh of a cannonball flying overhead. He ducked behind his shield by pure instinct, though he knew a direct hit would cut him in half with or without his hammerglass armour. The street, which had been so peaceful moments before, was suddenly chaos. When Adrian raised his head, it was to screams of alarm and panic, accompanied by choking dust and a terrible rumbling series of crashes. It did not take him long to realise what had happened. The building just at the top of the hill, a massive five-storey tenement, had taken a direct hit and collapsed entirely. Adrian found himself sprinting toward the rubble. An officer wearing the silver-braided collar of a major came stumbling out of the dust, eyes wide, mouth gaping like a fish out of water. They're shooting at us! They're shooting at us! He screamed. You idiot! Idrian snapped, grabbing the officer by the jacket and giving him a shake. We've invaded their glass-damned country. Of course they're shooting at us. But we're supposed to be the ones who win! Idrian had to restrain himself from throwing the man to the ground. Another Osun Guild family officer without combat experience, baffled that their enemies bothered to fight back. Damned fools. Was there anyone in that tenement? Listen to me, man. Was there anyone in there? Half my battalion, the Major finally managed. Idrian's stomach lurched. Glass, damn it. Those are your people. Get a hold of yourself and start digging. Every moment you waste is a life lost. Me? Dig? Idrian finally did throw the idiot to the ground. He raised his sword in the air, the massive pink razor-glass blade catching the light from the sunset. He bellowed. We've got trapped soldiers. All hands to me. Move that rubble. He felt a tug on his shoulder and looked down to see Fenny, a soldier in his own battalion. She was a slight woman, little more than a waif whose black flat cap always looked too big on her. Her eyes were wide, her white skin especially pale. Idrian, she whispered loudly. Squeaks was in there. Idrian's head whipped back around to the rubble. What? How? We just got back. She ran in to buy a bottle of wine from one of the 42nd Quartermasters. We were going to share it tonight. Piss and shit. Where was she? Right there, Fenny coughed, pointing to a no longer existing tenement. I saw her in the first floor window half a second before the ball hit. She waved at me. Fenny began to tremble fiercely. Idrian turned and grasped her gently by the side of the face. Look at me. Look at me. Your woman is going to be fine. I'll find her myself. You run back down the hill and find Mika. Tell her to bring all her engineers up here to take charge of the digging. Idrian gave her a shove to propel her along, then tossed his sword aside and sprinted to the spot that Fenny had indicated. The tenement was little more than a massive pile of shattered bricks, with dust-covered limbs sticking out at odd angles. Screams and shocked moans issued from the pile sending a shiver down his spine. Idrian shucked his own exhaustion and soaked in the forged glass sorcery of his armour to give him strength and speed. He used his shield as a shovel, piling bricks on it until he could barely lift it, 
then taking it out of the wreckage to dump off to the side. The first body he found belonged to a young man he vaguely recognised from the 42nd. The poor bastard was already dead. Idrian was soon surrounded by his own battalion, dozens of men and women bending their backs to move brick and timber, pulling people, both alive and dead, out of the wreckage. Sweat poured down Idrian's brow and neck, soaking the uniform under his armour. At some point, the sun had set completely, and the site was lit by hundreds of torches and lanterns. Idrian kept digging, periodically calling out Squeaks' name. Slowly he became aware he was being watched. A young man stood somewhat back from the edge of the wreckage. He had white Pernian skin and was wearing an Osin uniform, though he couldn't have been more than seventeen with that fresh face of his. A large pack rested on his shoulder. He was staring at Idrian strangely. Are you going to help? Idrian demanded. I... I wouldn't know where to start. Move, bricks. You shouldn't use your shield like that. Idrian paused and shot a glare at the young man, who shrank beneath the gaze. There were few people who didn't find Idrian's purple god-glass eye disconcerting. This young man was not one of them. This shield is a tool used to protect my battalion, Idrian grunted as he lifted it onto his shoulder, heavy with rubble. One of my battalion is trapped under there. The tool does the job. He staggered through the rubble until he found a safe place to dump it off to one side, then returned. Well, he demanded, help or get out of my way. Squeaks, squeaks, are you in there? The young man finally moved, depositing his pack off to one side and joining in with the calls of the iron horns. The digging continued for some time, and Idrian's stomach twisted whenever he caught sight of Fenny carefully moving across the rubble, tears streaming down her face as she called out the name of her wife. He'd completely lost track of the hour when he heard a muffled sound somewhere off to his left. Sir, the young interloper called. Over here, sir. We've got a few live ones trapped under a support beam. Mika, Idrian shouted. Mika, come help me. Idrian was soon surrounded by a dozen engineers who carefully helped clear rubble until Idrian could get his shoulder underneath the support beam. Wait, one of them called. Wait, hold on. Okay, lift. Idrian slowly leveraged the beam up from its resting place. The weight was impossible, probably over a thousand pounds, and despite the forge glass sorcery enhancing his strength, he felt like every sinew was about to pop. He listened to the engineers as they scrambled around him until one slapped him on the back of his helmet. All clear! Idrian dropped the beam and staggered backward, tripping and stumbling until someone caught him and helped him right himself. Relief surged through him as he turned to find Squeaks lying in a clear spot with several others. She was a young woman, just a year or two older than Fenny, and a skilled engineer. One arm was mangled, but she was alive and alert, wrapped in Fenny's embrace. Idrian breathed a sigh as his adrenaline finally crashed, leaving him harder breathing and barely able to stand. He made his way out of the rubble, looking for his sword only to find it lying on the boardwalk next to a nearby tenement. The young man who'd accosted him about his shield earlier was standing over it as if he were on guard. To Idrian's surprise, the young man had a yellow ram stitched to the front of his uniform jacket. Why are you wearing an iron horn uniform? Idrian asked, setting his shield down on the boardwalk beside his sword and sinking down to lie next to them. He pulled off his helmet sweat dripping off his face and tossed it aside. I'm your new armourer, sir. Idrian lifted his head and stared at the young man. I've been asking for a new armourer for six months, and now I get one. What's your name? Brailier, sir. Brailier Holdest. How old are you? Eighteen. They really must be short of armourers if they sent you. Braylear flinched and tried to stand up straighter. 
I'm trained in working steel and godglass. I can make all necessary field repairs. Give me a forge and a glass furnace and I can do anything but a total rebuild. Your armour, sword and shield will be in good hands with me, sir. Idrin had his doubts. Most breacher armourers were experienced professionals in their thirties or forties. What about my back? Sir? Armourers are also soldiers, kid. I see that little hammerglass buckler strapped to your back and the small sword on your belt. But do you know how to use them? My job is to keep the iron horns alive. I am the sword of their vanguard and the shield of their flank. Your job is to keep me alive. Understand? You care for my armor, but you also go into combat zones with me. Braley's confidence seemed to wane. I have a few weeks' combat training, sir. Piss, Idrian sighed. If he hadn't done such a number on his shield moving that rubble, he might have sent the young man straight back to the Ministry of the Legion. But he was in a war now, and he needed his armour cared for. Piss and shit. All right, follow me. Idrian got to his feet and gestured for Brelia to carry his sword, shield and helmet. The young man did so without complaint, though he was carrying his own pack as well. They walked around the ruined tenement and headed over the next hill, where they descended into a makeshift camp that took up two streets and three more captured Grent tenements. A fire burned in the middle of it all, next to a banner stitched with a yellow ram's head that matched the sigil on Idrian's armour and Braylia's uniform. How much do you know about the Foreign Legion? Idrian asked. Um, sorry, sir, but I'm trained as a craftsman. They conscripted me less than a month ago, and they've been teaching me to shoot and stab and not much else. Idrian stripped off his gauntlets and ran his sweaty hands across his face. Glass damned ministry just can't get their training right. Fine. You've been assigned to the Iron Horns. We're a battalion of combat engineers. We repair bridges, put up barricades, level ground for artillery batteries. Whatever dirty work needs to be done, we do it, and often under fire. We've got 300 proper soldiers, 200 engineers, and one breacher. That's me. It's not a brag to say we're the most famous battalion in a foreign legion, and for good reason. We have a high success rate and a low casualty rate. Veterans think twice before engaging with us directly. Idrian turned to Brelia. Our motto is, horns ready, hooves steady. Keep your weapon on hand, your feet planted, your eyes sharp, and you might just live through the war. Brelia was very clearly trying to keep his eyes from bugging out of his head. Yes, sir. You okay? It's a lot to take in, sir. There's a lot more. I won't dump it on you now. What do you do for fun, Brelia? I play cards, play a little fiddle, I train rats. Idrian glanced at him curiously. Rats? To do tricks, steal coins, little fun things. Ah, good way to catch the plague. Fiddle will make you popular. You're a corporal, so Tadius will let you play cards with the officers. He's our commanding officer. He cheats, though you'd never know it. Mika and Valiant are the captains of our little outfit, in charge of the engineers and soldiers, respectively. They've been married for longer than I've known either of them, and both will try to sleep with you. My advice is to tread carefully on those grounds. Idrian scratched at the back of his neck. He was absolutely spent, ready to hang up his armour and get a good night's sleep. He'd need it too. The iron horns would be rotated back to the front before first light. Help me get my armour off. Repair it and polish it before you hit your bunk. I took that room right there. Idrian pointed at a tenement window on his left. 
I prefer privacy when I can get it. You can sleep in the hallway outside my door. Despite his youth and inexperience, Brelier clearly knew his way around a set of breacher armour. Idrian was stripped down to his under-uniform in less than a minute, and Brelier hauled off his armour, leaving him alone next to the fire where he let his sweat-soaked clothes dry. Despite his exhaustion, he found himself remaining there for some time, meditating as he stared into the flames, letting his body and mind recover from the day's fighting. He was soon joined by Mika. She was a short, marnish woman with cropped black hair, skin darker than his own, and wearing an ill-fitting Foreign Legion uniform that made her look like a sack of potatoes in bad light. She carried a massive pack, heavy with tools. Dozens of ram's horns hung from the back, clacking together as she walked. She swung the pack from her shoulder and sank down on the ground beside the fire, looking up at Idrian. You know, she said, I'm going to miss you when you turn in your debt marker. Idrian touched the little silver tag that hung around his neck by instinct. It represented the amount of his life that the Foreign Legion still owned, a debt he owed them until the time was done. You'll get another breacher, he told her. Not one who'll spend hours digging in rubble for a single infantryman. Fenny and Squeaks have always liked you. I think they're going to worship the ground you walk on now. Idrian chuckled and shook his head. They'll repay the effort some day. Or they won't. Or they won't, Idrian acknowledged. It didn't really matter. As he told Brelier, his job was to protect the Ironhorns. Idrian took that job very seriously. It didn't just mean when they were in active combat. How's she doing? Squeaks busted up her arm pretty good, but a few days with quality cure glass should have her back on duty. Glory is tending to her now. That cannonball was a fluke. Managed to hit the main support beam of a poorly built tenement. We'll know the casualty counts in the morning, but I'm guessing we saved two-thirds of that battalion. Now that, Idrian said, grinning at Mika, is a debt we'll collect. She grinned back producing a couple of bottles of wine from her pack. Already started. These are courtesy of the 42nd. She handed one bottle to him and popped the cork on the other. They clinked the bottles together. Have you seen Taddeus? she asked. I was just about to ask you the same thing, Idrian replied, setting his bottle aside for later. Last I saw him, he was called back to headquarters. Did you hear the rumours about his sister and nephew? Idrian frowned and shook his head. Demir? Yeah, rumour has it that this whole war is because of Adriana's murder a couple weeks ago. They traced the killers back to the Duke of Grant. Sounds like a pretty flimsy excuse for a war, Idrian snorted. He'd always liked Adriana, and her death had come as a shock to all of them. She was their sponsor, after all. But he wasn't going to happily get killed because of a political assassination. There's always another reason. From what I heard, there's a lot of reasons, Mika replied with a yawn. The Duke's covert operations have grown more and more aggressive over the last few years. Adriana's death is just the last straw. He poked the sleeping giant one too many times, and now we're at his door. It was not an uncommon story, and this would not be the first war Idrian fought purely as a show of force. Peace made the empire rich, but war reminded everyone else who ruled half the world. Lucky him. What about Demir? Mika shrugged. He's back, supposedly. He's already taken control of the grapple. Wonder what Tadius thinks of that, Idrian grunted, hiding his own surprise. He hadn't thought that he'd ever see Demir again, much less that the wayward grapper would ever return to Osa. Last time I saw him, I would have bet pretty good money he was going to put a bullet in his own head before long. Returning to Gil family politics might push him over that edge, Mika waggled her eyebrows comically. It was half a dark joke and half a truth. For Taddeus' sake, 
Adrian hoped it would remain a joke. Demir was the only other grappo left now. Adrian looked around and stretched, watching as the rest of Mika's engineers stumbled into camp. A few threw themselves onto bedrolls under the open stars, while others headed into the tenements, where they'd staked a temporary claim earlier in the day. The conversation was muted, the jokes few. Despite their taking few casualties, it had been a hard day. Everyone was just too damned exhausted, and it was only the very beginning of the war. I'm going to bed, Adrian said. If you see Taddeus, tell him to only wake me if it's important. I... He was cut off by the arrival of Valiant. Mika's husband was a light-skinned Pernian, tall and willowy, with a clean-shaved head and a musket slung over one shoulder. Hey, Adrian, he interrupted, yawning. There's a guy just over there claiming to be a Guild family member. Wants to talk to you. Adrian blinked back at him, then turned to stare into the darkness in the direction Valiant had indicated. There was a tiny bit of sight glass in his false eye, giving a very slight boost to his senses, and allowing him to see in the dark better than most. He could see a hooded figure lurking just beyond the light of the fire. None of the other iron horns paid the figure any mind. You didn't get a name? Didn't give one, Valiant yawned again, sitting down beside his wife and putting his head on her shoulder. Adrian glanced around, fighting a feeling of frustration. Some soldiers took on a client role with guild families, but he'd always been very careful to avoid that entanglement. The closest he ever got was the Grappo sponsorship paying a portion of his wages, and that was more about their public prestige than anything else. It didn't leave him beholden to them. So who the piss was lurking around in a war zone wanting to talk? You want me to get rid of him? Mika asked. Nah, I'll do it myself. Idrian walked over to where the figure stood out of earshot of the others, peering hard to try and get a look under that hood. He could make out embroidered cuffs and fine cloth. Whoever it was had money for sure, but he was also wearing gloves to hide his guild family sigil. I'm Idrian Sepulki, he said, drawing himself up. Hello, Idrian. Been a long time. Adrian's senses all perked up at once and he peered harder. He recognised that shadowy jawline and the clever glint of the firelight off those eyes. They looked exactly like a younger version of Taddeus. Demir? Demir made a shushing gesture. I'd prefer people not know that I'm hanging out in a war zone, he replied quietly. Adrian lowered his voice and tried to hide his shock. Had Demir been loitering here long? Did he hear Idrian and Mika gossiping about him? Does Taddeus know you're here? Not yet. I tried to catch him earlier, but he got pulled into a meeting with General Stavry. Demi grimaced. Like I said, I'd rather people not know I'm here. I need a favour. It shouldn't take more than a few hours. Now? Idrian looked around, bewildered. It wasn't even nine o'clock yet, and soldiers were already snoring. He wanted to do the same. Unfortunately, yes. I need an escort behind enemy lines. Idrian snorted. I need direct orders for something like that. Not from your new sponsor, you don't. I have some prerogative over your assignments. Idrian was still reeling from Demir's presence. This was the Lightning Prince, the provincial governor who squashed a major rebellion and made it look easy while doing it. Even though Holikon was ultimately remembered as a disaster, soldiers still whispered about just how good a commander Demir was on that campaign. The heights he'd fallen from were truly dizzying. Escorting you behind enemy lines is stretching that a bit, don't you think? Maybe. But I understand you have some interest in my mission. Which is... I need to extract Master Castora from the Grant's Royal Glassworks. Adrian had to resist the urge to reach up and touch his god glass eye. Is he in danger? I believe he is. 
I've been meeting up with my mother's old spies all afternoon. The Grant Glassworks was hit early this morning in an attempt to capture their designs, stockpiles and siliceas. They repelled one of our regiments, but Castora was wounded badly. Fighting in the area has tapered off and soldiers from both sides have moved east. The two of us should be able to slip in and slip out without being noticed. Idrian's mouth was dry. If something had happened to Castora, he didn't know what he'd do with himself. This time, he did touch his eye, thinking of the master Cilicia who made it. You're absolutely sure about that intelligence. There shouldn't be any obstacle that a breacher and a glass dancer can't handle, Demir assured him. Idrian warred with himself briefly. He was still reeling from Demir's sudden appearance and would be well within his rights to rebuff the demand. Demir had been gone for nine years, after all. Could he even be trusted? But this was Taddeus's nephew, and if Master Castora was in danger... I'll get my armour, he said. Chapter 7 Demir was surprised that Idrian came along so readily, especially looking so worn out as he did, but he wasn't going to look that gift horse in the mouth. The big breacher returned in his armour ten minutes later, sword and shield slung over his shoulders, a massive cloak draped over his armour to keep the moonlight from glinting off the steel. No one questioned him as he moved past his sleeping companions, and he simply nodded to Demir to lead the way. Demir remained for a few moments, watching Mika and Valiant sitting quietly by the fire. He desperately wanted to say hello. Back during the Holocan campaign, he'd spent only a few days with the Ironhorns, but they'd all treated him more like family than a commanding officer. He'd loved it then, and he craved it now. At a grunt from Idrian, he shook off the thought. The Iron Horns were not his family. None of them but Taddeus, anyway. And he had his own responsibilities now. It was the same with Idrian. The big breacher had aged in the last nine years. A little grey at the temples of his short black hair. A little more weathered and scarred. But he was the same man whose company Demir had enjoyed on the Holocan campaign. It was so damn good to see him that it hurt, and Demir wanted nothing more than to give him a hug. That would be wildly inappropriate, of course, and he doubted that Idrian felt the same. Once they were out in the darkness, Demir matched his stride with Idrian's, glancing sidelong at the breacher. I did the best I could to find us a safe route, but you know better than I do that things change quickly in a war zone. Stay close. Keep your eyes open. Horns ready, hooves steady, Adrian replied, lowering an eye patch down to conceal his purple god glass eye. Deme felt a flicker of a smile cross his face. His uncle had been saying that since he was just a kid. Anyone who'd ever served in the Foreign Legion, officer or soldier, knew that motto and who it belonged to. Deme nodded his thanks and the two set off into the night. Demir navigated the city partly from memory, he'd spent plenty of time in Grint in his youth, and partly from a memorised map provided by one of his mother's spies inside the Ministry of the Legion. They crossed a dozen bridges, went through six checkpoints manned by Osun soldiers, where Idrian was waved through by recognition alone. They finally crossed into the northwestern districts of Grint, where the combat lines were hazy and whole communities seemed untouched by the war going on less than a mile away. They were behind enemy lines for sure, but Grent's military presence was light, focused as it was on Osa's primary attack. Demir removed a glass egg from his pocket, holding it up in front of him and grasping it with his sorcery. He cracked it into half a dozen bullet-sized shards, letting them float just over his shoulder. If this action unnerved Idrian, the breacher didn't show it. Why would he? Demir had some idea how many glass dancers Idrian had fought and killed over the years, and it was not a single-digit number. The night was relatively silent, broken only by the artillery duels going on to their south. 
The normal evening traffic was practically non-existent, and the few Grint civilians they passed stared at Idrian's sword warily before hurrying on, no doubt mistaking Idrian for one of their own breaches. We're getting close, Idrian told him. Gesturing toward a wooded hill looming less than half a mile from them, smoke rose in the moonlit night, and the hillside flickered with building fires. It did not bode well for their journey. Demir swallowed bile, wishing he'd arrived in Osa just two days earlier. He could have gone in and gotten back out, questioning Castora without having to travel into a war zone. It was, Demir realised, the first time Idrian had spoken in over an hour. The silence was comfortable, between two men with a job to do, but it still made the small of Demir's back clammy. What was going on in Idrian's head? No doubt he'd come along because of his own ties to Castora, rather than as a favour to Demir. But what was he thinking about? Nine years since they last saw each other, and it was at the lowest point in Demir's life. Idrian was not the kind of man Demir could catch up with, not like Kizzy. It made him very difficult to read. Were his commanding officers just as infuriated by his quiet dependability? Or did they take it for granted? If there was one thing a Guild family member hated, it was not knowing how to get inside the heads of their underlings. Demi discarded his musings as they began to ascend the hill to the wrecked glassworks. The area was deathly silent and appeared to be abandoned. He stretched out his senses, looking for glass dancers. No one. He turned to meet Idrian's eye and gave a shake of his head as they hurried up to take position just outside the wall of the compound. No glass dancers, he told Idrian. In fact, I don't hear anyone. He tried to keep the frustration out of his voice. If Castora was dead or had withdrawn farther into the city, he was equally out of Demi's grasp, and his mother's mystery would remain unsolved. Two soldiers in that doorway there, Idrian said, nodding around a corner. A young man and a middle-aged woman. They're both half asleep. He put up his sword, sliding it into the strap across his back and hanging his shield from the hook on his left pauldron. Looks like you didn't need me after all. Demir glanced around the compound, his stomach falling. Not just for Castora, but for the place itself. The main office had gone up in flames, possibly taking decades of silic knowledge with it. Furnaces had been destroyed by the flames, and one of the two dormitories. The destruction made him sick. He rounded the corner, keeping his senses taut, and approached the pair of Grent soldiers in their orange and white uniforms sleeping in the doorway to the only remaining furnace room. Neither noticed him until he was practically on top of them. The young man started awake, leaping to his feet and levelling his musket at Demir while hissing at his companion. Show us your hand, stranger. Looters will be shot on sight. Demir carefully removed his left glove and showed his glass dancer sigil. I'd suggest lowering your weapons. He subtly altered his accent, giving himself the slightest grent drawl. Both soldiers were up and alert now, and they paled visibly in the firelight before lowering their weapons. The woman, nervous and haggard, swallowed hard. Apologies, sir. We didn't know. Demi waved it off. I'm looking for Castora. I haven't been able to find him, nor get news of his health. The soldiers glanced at each other, seemingly about to answer, when the woman gasped. Holy shit! It's the ram! Idrian moved up to stand beside Demir. Demir shot him a glance, wondering if it would be easier or harder with him out in the open. At ease, soldiers, Idrian said. You're... you're not supposed to be here, the young man said. If they'd balked at seeing a glass dancer, they were practically shitting themselves now. You're an Olsen. Olsen or not, Idrian replied. Castora is my friend. He peered at the woman. Tinny, right? And... Gib? 
you're part of the glassworks garrison. We met last time I visited to have my eye worked on. The ram remembered my name, Tinny whispered loudly to Gabe, her mouth hanging open. Demi put his hand over his mouth to hide a smile. No pretending to be a Grent glass dancer then. But this might be easier. Castora, he prompted gently. The pair seemed to deflate. Gabe said, I'm sorry, Ram. He's hurt. Hurt real bad. The garrison was ordered out, and even with all the best god glass at hand, we couldn't stabilize him enough to move him. He's not going to last the night. Tinny and I volunteered to stay with him until the end. It's the least we could do after he's been so good to us over the years. Demir's gaze fell on the open door behind them. By the flickering light of the burning buildings, he could just make out a makeshift cot, piles of bloody bandages and blankets, and a person lying in that heap. He shoved his way between the soldiers and approached quickly, falling on his knees. He had met Castora long ago, but had no memory of the kindly, pained face that stared back at him through half-closed eyes. Demir examined the face for a few moments, then glanced down at the bloody coverings. He was no surgeon, but an aggressive bayonetting was the only thing he could think of that would put a man in such a state. Castora, he asked. The old man opened his lips to reveal that he was clutching several pieces of milk glass and cure glass between his teeth. He used his tongue to move them off to one side. Who are you? he muttered. I'm Demir Grappo, Adriana's son. She sent help, did she? His words were slow, but surprisingly coherent for someone at death's door. He'd probably made that milk glass himself. Could have come sooner, lightning prince. Demir flinched at the nickname, surprised someone like Castora even knew about it. He turned and gestured for Idrian to join him. The breacher said something quietly to the two soldiers, then joined Demir at Castora's bedside. Idrian, this, I could have used the two of you this morning. I'm sorry, master. Idrian said softly. I would have come if I'd known. Of course, of course. Castora's eyes returned to Demir. What's your excuse? My excuse? Demir felt his eyes narrow and tried to remind himself that he was talking to a dying man. My excuse is that I only just returned from the provinces yesterday. My mother has been murdered her death used as pretext for this war, and all I have from her is a note telling me to talk to you immediately. Castora stared back at him in silence for some time. That's a good excuse, he finally admitted. What happened to Adriana? Demir could see the death in the old man's eyes. It would be here soon, no helping it, but he bit back his questions and recounted the details of his mother's death, and the subsequent outbreak of war, as best he could in a brief few moments. He had barely finished when he realised Castora was muttering to himself. He leaned forward to listen. They couldn't have known what we were up to, could they? No, it's impossible. No one knew. It must have been unrelated. But the confession, the war, it is too convenient. It is... He stopped, his eyes once again focusing on Demir. The prototype. It was... He tried to gesture. Destroyed in the fire. What prototype? Demir asked, feeling his breath catch in his throat. Here it was, the reason his mother had partnered with Castora. Some kind of silic advance? A new god glass? He grasped Castora by the shoulder, hoping the physical touch would help the old man focus. Adriana didn't tell you. Demir felt a pang of conscience. If he'd been here, he would already know what was going on. If he'd been here, his mother might still be alive. She didn't get the chance. Of course, 
the prodigal son. Do you know anything? The final word dripped with despair and derision. You'll have to be more specific, Demi replied, trying to keep the sarcasm out of his voice. Castora let out another shuddering sigh. There is so much to explain, and not enough time. Where to begin? He raised his voice. Tinny! Geb! Leave us in private, please. The two soldiers, still standing in the doorway, withdrew without protest, leaving Demir and Idrian alone with Castora. Despite how well acquainted he must be with dying men, Demir was surprised to see Idrian looking very uncomfortable. Idrian said, I should go too. Whatever you two have to discuss is silly business. I'm just a soldier. No, Castor objected. This is my deathbed confession. I will not give it before just one man that I do not know. You will stay, Adrian. If only to repay the kindness I've shown to you. Adrian's apparent discomfort grew but he remained, pressing gently on his god-glass eye with two fingers. Demir reached out to take Castora by the hand. Blood smeared between their fingers. Tell us what you need to say. Castora stared at the ceiling in silence for some time, and Demir worried that he was slipping away. He gave him a shake, his patience waning. Come on, man. You have to tell me. There... Is too much, Castora said again in barely a whisper. Stronger, he continued. The cinder sand is running out. Demir scoffed. He couldn't help it. It was a simple statement, at once true. Cinder sand was a finite resource, after all, and ridiculous. That can't be possible. There are thousands of mines and quarries all over the world. They produce so much. He trailed off at the serious stare from the old master. Explain. Those mines, Castora said, are empty or close to it. Governments all over the world are already tapping into their stockpiles. Production is down, prices are up. At the current rate, it will take less than six months before the general public will find it impossible to buy god glass. In a few years... Only guild families and kings will be able to acquire it. Demir glanced at Idrian. The breach's facade was close to unreadable, but there was a glint in his one eye. Fear, perhaps. Demir didn't blame him. Without cinder sand, you couldn't make god glass. Everything depended on god glass. What Castora was intimating wasn't just the loss of a lesser material, but of sorcery itself. Civilization would collapse just as surely as it would with the disappearance of gunpowder or printing presses or water wheels. It couldn't be true. Demir's mind warred against the idea, and yet here was one of the greatest Silic masters stating it as his deathbed confession. Demir thought back to his last day in the provinces, unable to buy a piece of cheap sky glass. Before that, he'd struggled to find wit glass, and before that... Forge glass had been more expensive than he expected. At the time, he'd just described it to the breakdown of supply in the poorer regions of the empire, but now he wasn't so sure. What do I do with this information? Demir asked, not bothering to hide the edge of desperation in his voice. He felt as if a massive burden had been placed upon his shoulders. What did my mother have to do with it? What is the prototype? Castora took a deep breath, as if summoning some reserve of inner strength just to get the words out. He seized Demir by the arm. The master's hand was surprisingly strong. Do you know what a phoenix channel is? It sounded familiar, like something Demir's studies had brushed upon long ago. He glanced at Idrian, who just shook his head. It is the great goal of the Silic sciences, Castora explained a mechanism by which energy is turned into sorcery, effectively allowing us to recharge spent pieces of god glass. Demir scowled. 
memories of long-forgotten studies leapt forward. What did his tutor call the Phoenix Channel? Simple, elegant, unobtainable. A Phoenix Channel would allow us to avert the disaster of sorcery running out, Demi replied slowly. He could feel his eyes widen at the implication. You made one, didn't you? I did. Your mother and I designed it together. It was her idea to use cinderites rather than just regular god glass. It was destroyed in the fire. You can find what remains, Castorius shuddered again, closing his eyes briefly. In the corner, over there. It can be rebuilt, but you will need the schematics and someone talented enough to follow them. I sent both away. Demir searched his pockets for a small notebook and a pencil. He wrote down the word cinderite. It was a rare material, formed naturally when lightning struck deposits of cinder sand. Where did you send them? To your hotel. Her name is Tessa Folir. Castora took a deep breath. She is a twenty-two-year-old journeyman and my protégé. She is the only one I trust to finish my work. I have not seen more raw, silic talent in my lifetime. If she does not make it to the hotel, you must find her. Demir stared over Castora's head, mind churning, trying to form some kind of a plan. Tessa could be anywhere, captured, dead, on the run. She might be at the hotel by the time he returned, or she might have already boarded a ship for Pernia to escape the fighting. What does she look like? Castora stared back at him with the eyes of a dying man who'd just been asked for a laundry list. But Demir did not retract the question. I need to know, he pressed. Finally, Castora said, A little taller than you. Dirty blonde hair. Soft features. Light skin. He seemed to push the words out with great effort and Demi wondered if he had more than moments left. Castora continued. She has the scars of a sailor's ear, but she is also an experienced falconer. You'll see those scars as well. Demi scribbled more notes, Tessa's name, her description. He let Castora talk, giving him additional details about both the Cilicia and the Phoenix Channel. He could sense the life slipping out of Castora, each word growing more pained, each breath more laboured. When he finished, his whole body seemed to sag in exhaustion. The soldiers who attacked you this morning, Demir asked, did they know about the Phoenix Channel? I'm not sure, Castora gasped painfully. They didn't seem to be looking for anything in particular. They just wanted to capture the glassworks. Good strategic sense at the start of a war. He chuckled, though Demir wasn't sure what was funny about it. Perhaps the giddiness of so much pain-killing milk glass. Castora's head lolled to one side, his skin pale, the light in his eyes growing dim. Demir squeezed his hand, silently wishing the old man more life so that he could get more information. Castora gave another shuddering sigh and this one felt more final than the others. His face relaxed, his body sagging against his makeshift bed. His grip on Demir's hand loosened. I can't fight it anymore, Demir. Is there anything else? Demir begged, shaking Castora's shoulder once more. It's time to let him go, Idrian said. Demir swore under his breath. So many questions. No time. This wasn't Castora's responsibility anymore. It was now Demir's. It's all right, Demir relented. I'll make sure your work is finished. You must find Tessa, Castora ordered. Enough of this. Let me die. He spat the cure glass out of the corner of his mouth 
and though he still held the milk glass between his teeth, he began to convulse. It took him several minutes to die, and he did not go quietly. Demir clutched the master's hand until long after he was dead, thinking. There was so much to consider, more than he could fathom in a single day. Finding out that the cinder sand was running out was enough to stagger anyone. The possibility of a phoenix channel, of recycling pieces of god glass, was a light at the end of a very dark tunnel. He was brought out of his reverie by the appearance of Idrian, who he did not even realise had left. The breacher carried a piece of canvas, which he laid gently over Castora's body. Demir got to his feet and took a step back to stand next to Idrian, wondering what was going through the breacher's mind. You understand, what you just heard must remain a secret, Demir asked. Idrian nodded solemnly. If it were anyone else, Demir would have already killed them with a shard of glass through the back of their neck. There was enough lying around to make it easy, and this was too big to be trusted to flapping mouths. But he knew Idrian's character. He trusted him, just as Castora had trusted him. Demir forced himself to walk away from the body and found, resting in the opposite corner of the furnace room, the remains of what had once been Castora's prototype. It was an odd contraption, mostly destroyed by the flames, but what remained was a box containing a broken tube, several large pieces of god glass, and half-melted sheets of tin. Castora had said that the design was Demir's mother's idea, another gift she'd left behind, but one that had been destroyed by idiot soldiers trying to capture the glassworks. Demir ran a hand through his hair. I have no idea how I'm going to do this. I don't have the knowledge to make a new one of these. I don't even have the connections with people who could try. Idrian snorted. Fantessa. I know her, and she's just as skilled as Castora claimed. But if I can't find her? You're the lightning prince. You'll think of something. The lightning prince has been dead for nine years, Demir snapped. He lived a short and horrible life. He pinched the bridge of his nose, trying to keep his temper under control. This was too much for one man, and he could feel the very concept of it threatening to break him. He pushed back. He could not afford to break again. There was too much at stake. In mere minutes, everything in his life had become an afterthought. Hiring Kizzy to pursue those killers on his behalf suddenly seemed like the smartest thing he'd done in years. I apologise. He turned to find Idrian staring at him. The normally stoic breacher had a desperate, almost crazed look in his eye. For half a moment, Demir thought that he was going to be attacked. Idrian said, This Phoenix Channel, it can recharge spent god glass. That's what Castora said. So, if you rebuild that, you could recharge the god glass in my eye. Demir was taken aback. I suppose I could. Idrian nodded to himself as if making a decision. If you need anything, anything at all, I will exchange my services for use of the Phoenix Channel. Oh. Demir raised both eyebrows. Clearly that eye was even more important than he'd suspected. One would be a fool to take such a promise from a breacher lightly, and from the ram in particular. Demir had just been offered a very valuable piece of credit. He sucked on his teeth, thinking of a way he could use it, but stopped himself. I won't make any promises, he said. I don't even know if I can rebuild the damn thing. I suggest that you make every effort possible to do so, Adrian said quietly. And I'm not just saying that on my own behalf. I'm only a soldier, but I know what will happen if the cinder sand runs out. This Phoenix Channel could save the Empire, the world. Demir looked back to the other side of the furnace room, where Castora's body was still warm. 
The pressure of this sudden new burden weighed on his shoulders like an anvil. Despite this, his thoughts were starting to focus better, his ideas feeling more concrete than they had in years. Purpose, not just pursuit of wealth or fame or sex or revenge, but real purpose, had been thrust upon him. It did not resurrect that old part of him entirely, but it did wake it up. Anything at all? he asked. Anything within my power, Idrian responded. This is more important to me than you realize. For now, help me get the prototype back to the Ironhorn's camp. I'll have Tadius deliver it from there. Demis stepped outside, glancing aside long at the two Grent soldiers sharing a cigarette some ways down the road. He felt a pang of guilt that he hadn't thought to summon them over for Castora's final moments. They had earned it, after all. He walked over to join them, offering them each a piece of fine quality god glass. Castora has passed, he told them. Thank you for what you did for him. Tinny cleared her throat. I don't know who you are. I don't even really know why this war broke out. But I'm glad you and Idrian were here for his final moments. We'll be going, if that's all right. She said the last words with trepidation, as if still waiting to be murdered at any moment. Demir gestured for them to withdraw and turn back to the glassworks. He frowned at something that caught his eye. There, sitting up in the branches of a large tree that stretched over the compound walls, was a falcon. He couldn't name the species in the darkness, but it was a big, beautiful bird. It was wearing anklets and jesses, the little leather straps dangling from its legs. A trained bird for certain. Was it Tessus? Idrian, Demir called. Lend me your gauntlet. Chapter 8 Enforcers for the guild families of Osa fulfilled many different roles. Most were mere thugs, foot soldiers who could wield a cudgel and didn't mind breaking legs or skulls or property. Some were bodyguards or security. The most trusted of enforcers worked as personal couriers, taking contracts and correspondence between guild family matriarchs and patriarchs. Kizzy had always been good at two things. Her favourite was making Vorsian clients feel comfortable. Did a warehouse get burned down? Kizzy would hold the client's hand, commiserate, and liaise with the National Guard investigators. In her hands, an otherwise unimportant client would think the Vorsian had their best interests at heart at all times. Sometimes they really did, and sometimes Kizzy put on a good show. It helps that she had the Vorsian name and Silic symbol, even if she wasn't a real member of the family. Her other skill set, the one she'd had to rely on more since falling out of favour, was finding people. She started her work for Demir immediately, and spent the first day finding out everything she could about the one man who'd already confessed to having a hand in Adriana Grappo's death. He was a Grent national named Espensi Darfour, a well-known blackguard from a family of medium importance within the Grent government. He was a gambler and womanizer with a dozen successful duels under his belt. He had no public connection to anyone in Osa. So why, Kizzy wondered, did he come to Osa to kill Adriana? The official explanation, the one that the cinders had torn out of him using powerful enough shackle glass to drive him mad, was that he'd been paid a hefty sum by the Duke of Grent to participate in the killing. Was that true? Could Kizzy trust the cinders? or the inner assembly to actually tell the truth? Or was it all a convenient lie for a convenient war? The thought was a discomforting one, but Kizzy tried to focus on the facts as she knew them rather than jump to conclusions. Six people, all meeting in Assembly Square, wearing masks to kill a well-liked reformer. As Demir had intimated, that was a conspiracy. Why a conspiracy? rather than just a good old-fashioned knife-in-the-dark assassination. 
With Espenzi in cinder custody, insane from shackle glass, Kizzy would have to find his co-conspirators in order to get her answers. Kizzy started at the beginning, looking for any clues that might lead down an untrodden path. She found the coach service that brought Espenzi into Osa. She spoke with the waiter at the restaurant he ate at the night before, and then the concierge at the hotel he stayed at. She even tracked down the cafe he ordered tea from the following morning. She followed his footsteps perfectly all the way up until an hour before Adriana's death. He had no clandestine meetings with hooded figures, not at the restaurants, cafe or hotel. To everyone that had met him, he was simply a middle-aged man slipping into Osa for a brief change of scenery. He wasn't even armed. It was frustratingly mundane. Not a single clue that Kizzy could follow to find one of the other killers. The following morning, she changed her tactics, heading down to Assembly Square in person. The square was a busy place, filled with politicians, clerks, loitering bodyguards, and beggars. Winter solstice celebrations were still going on, causing impromptu parades of masked revelers, following the bread wagons as free food and drink were passed out to all who wanted it. Kizzy used gossip columns and newspaper reports to rebuild Adriana's murder in her mind's eye, trying to figure out in which directions the killers would have scattered to escape a passing National Guardsman. She crossed the square, looking for a little nook underneath a towering statue of one of the founders of Osa. The nook was barely two feet square and maybe six deep, and it was the home of a beggar who called herself Madame Under Magna. Hey, Corina, Kizzy said, squatting down next to the nook and peering inside. It was hard to tell in the bright morning sunlight reflecting off the marble, but the nook was crammed with blankets, newspapers, and the odds and ends a beggar might collect to survive the mild ocean winter. A pair of beady little eyes stared back at Kizzy, and a tiny, wizened hand was thrust out of the nook. You will address me as Madame Under Magna. Kizzy glanced up at the statue rising above them. It was, she realised, quite anatomically correct, despite wearing a long tunic. Sorry, how are you, Madame Under Magna? She placed a heavy coin in that wizened little hand. The hand and coin disappeared immediately. Well enough, Cassandra. I heard you cleaned out the Castle Hill garrotters. You hear a lot of things. Poor Iasmos, what a nice little boy. Dory was the cruel one, the real leader, but they're all gone now. There was a strange little giggle. I hear and I see, Cassandra. You want my services? I can tell you about a stavery mistress or a corrupt foreign legion secretary. The eyes seemed to grow a little closer. There are things that walk in the night. I have seen them. But to tell would be a king's ransom. Madame Under Magna cackled loudly. Kizzy had never actually been able to tell if Madame Under Magna was insane or just a good actress. I'm hoping you can tell me about Adriana Grappo's death. Who was behind it? Spies, revolutionaries, a fulgurist society? Madame Under Magna made a clicking sound with her tongue. Oh, that I cannot do. You didn't see the killing? I did, in fact. I saw her stop to check her pocket watch, as was her habit at the bottom of the stairs over there. I saw the killers flock, and I was the first to scream for help as the cudgels fell. If you saw it all... Then why can't you tell me about it? I can pay. Because the cinders have already bought my silence. I have a reputation to uphold, after all. Kizzy settled back on her haunches, watching the afternoon light reflect off those beady little eyes. Madame Under Magna was one of the most reliable sources of information in the city, a truly neutral figure who actually followed her codes of silence. Once someone paid her to withhold information, there was no getting it out of her short of shackle glass. 
Kizzy did have that piece that Demir gave her, but was not about to inflict it upon Madame under Magna and certainly not in public. Kizzy asked, Can you at least tell me whether the facts presented to the public are true? Ah, hmm. Madame under Magna stared at her for a few moments before answering. I would not break my contract with the cinders to tell you that the facts are indeed true. That was a surprise. Six killers? Kizzy asked. And the Spenzi hired by the Duke of Grant? All true. Kizzy thought she saw a fiendish little smile in the dark nook. Her informant was leaving something out. Kizzy considered the possibilities for a few minutes, crouching in silence beside the statue, before asking, Was Espenzi caught on purpose? Offered to the cinders to let the others get away? You're a clever girl, Cassandra. I'm sad you didn't come to me before the cinders. Kizzy snorted in frustration and considered her options. The cinders swept through right after Adriana's murder. Kizzy would get a similar response from every beggar, busker, food vendor and loiterer. Any possible witness had already been threatened or paid into silence. Espenzi was a dead end, and so was Madame under Magna. Although, perhaps Kizzy was just asking the wrong question. If I can't ask you about Adriana's murder, then who should I ask? Kizzy held out two more heavy coins. Very clever girl, Madame under Magna said again. She sniffed. I have a cold. Kizzy fished in her pocket until she found a good quality piece of cure glass and added it to the two coins. The hand snatched all three from her palm, and Madame under Magna cackled again. You should ask Torlani the breadman. A wizened little hand thrust into the sun to make her go away gesture. No more questions. Kizzy found Tulani the breadman in one of the dozens of alleys that separated the various government buildings of Assembly Square. It was a narrow track, crammed with vendors, with barely enough space for two people to pass each other. The breadman had a small cart at the far end. He was an old man, bent from years of reaching into ovens, his cart constantly being loaded by boys who rushed back and forth between him and his bakery on the other side of the district. He wore a tiny nose piercing, a little piece of low-quality aura glass, no doubt in the hope that he made him seem more enticing than his competition. Tolani eyeballed Kizzy as she approached. Taking in the stiletto at her belt and the silic sigil on her right hand, "'You're Cassandra Vossian,' he said, as she glanced over the various loaves. She found a small loaf, particularly crusty with burnt edges, and plucked it up, handing him a banknote. "'I am,' she replied. "'I heard there was a gang over in Castle Hill stealing from you folks.' "'Glass dam. Word sure got around quick these days. "'Not any more.' She bit into the bread, chewed, and grinned at him over it. This is really good, she said between bites. Thank you. He looked down at her silic sigil again. I'm not looking for protection, Kizzy snorted, and I'm not here to shake you down. Ah, the old man replied, visibly relaxing. My mistake? She made a magnanimous gesture. No offence taken. She glanced around to make sure the other vendors were far enough away not to overhear her and said, I was told you might know something about Adriana Greppo's murder. Tolani went white. It was impressive, really. His whole face went slack, his eyes filling with fright, hands shaking slightly. This, this is my little alley here. I was here when she was killed. Couldn't possibly know anything about it. He paused, seemed to gather himself. Who told you that I did? He demanded. Who do you think? Kizzy snorted. Madame under Magna, that bitch, that... Tulani made a frustrated sound. 
I've already told the cinders everything I know. I have nothing to add and certainly not to a Vorsian. Kizzy took a step back to examine the alley as a whole, then glanced toward the centre of Assembly Square. If six people murdered Adriana and then scattered, it was almost guaranteed that one of them would run down this alley. Kizzy scoffed to herself and looked Lani in the eye. You saw one of the killers. I... I have nothing to say. I'm not asking on behalf of the Vossian, she said. Tulani frowned in a moment of confusion. Then who? Demi Grappo hired me. At the very least, this information seemed to catch Tulani off guard. A dozen different emotions crossed his face in the space of a few moments, from surprise to consternation. Why you? Because we were childhood friends, and I have a reputation for personal integrity. It wasn't a boast. Everyone knew she'd fallen out of favour for exactly that reason. She pulled a calling card out of the pocket of her jacket, putting on an air that made it seem as if he were just one of dozens of leads. You can ask around if you like. If there's something you'd like to get off your chest, just find me at this address. Tolani didn't reach out for the card. He licked his lips. She could see immediately that he wanted to tell her something. It was on the tip of his tongue, straining to get out. All Kizzy needed to do was coax. He said, The senders paid me well not to make a fuss. I'm not asking you to make a fuss, Kizzy replied gently. Just tell me what you know. Adriana was a secret patron of mine. It was Kizzy's turn to be caught off guard. Secret patrons were not common. The whole point of the client-patron relationship was to publicly display prestige, clout and allegiance. A secret patron might get a cut of the profits from, say, a bakery, but they couldn't tell their friends that they had ownership in the best bakery in town. The client, on the other hand, couldn't take advantage of their patron's name to prevent shakedowns or get better service from their suppliers. Why secret? Kizzy asked. Independence is important to me, Tolani replied with a sniff. Adriana financially supported my bakery on six different occasions and sent her enforcers around anonymously when the Dolani got pushy. I owe... I owed her my livelihood. Kizzy picked her next words carefully. Is there anything you want to tell her son? About the way she died? She could see Torlani wrestling with himself. He picked up one of his own loaves of bread and bit into it, chewing savagely, muttering to himself. He swallowed and said, If this comes back to me, I will deny everything. I'm not doing this for a magistrate, Kizzy said bluntly. Nobody is going to know who it came from. He hesitated for several more long moments before he spoke quietly. Fine. I was standing, just here, at the moment of her murder. I heard yelling from the square, and when I looked, he glanced toward the other end of the alley. A man wearing a plain white mask came sprinting from that way. He tripped right in front of my cart, and his mask came off for just a few seconds. I pretended not to see but he didn't even look at me. He put his mask back on and took off. And you recognised him? Of course I did, he's bought bread from me before. Kizzy felt her heartbeat quicken. And? It was Churian Dolani. Kizzy felt her knees go just a little bit weak. Churian Dolani was not, as these things went, a very important person, he was a mid-ranking cousin in the Dolani Guild family. The fact that he had the Dolani name at all was what caused a sweat to break out in the small of Kizzy's back. They were one of the five most powerful Guild families in Osa, and their matriarch sat on the inner assembly. This was supposed to be a Grent conspiracy. Why was a Guild family member involved? Did you tell the cinders? she asked. Tolani shook his head. Of course not. 
Outing one of the Dolani to the cinders would be a death sentence. But you told me. Even if you owed Adriana your livelihood. Kizzy stopped herself. Was she so surprised by this she was questioning the intelligence of her own witness? Instead of being annoyed, Tolani simply shook his head. I sold a lot of bread to Adriana and to Demir. People have tried to forget him, but I remember when he was the most important person in Osa. I remember how hard he tried to get people to see him as a politician instead of a glass dancer. There aren't many people who pass by my cart who want to change the world for the better, and I make note of those that do. If Demir wants to avenge his mother, I will aid him in what small way I can. Thanks for the tip. Kizzy pulled a wad of banknotes out of her pocket. Demir could afford to be generous, and slipped them onto Tolani's tray, taking another loaf of bread with her. She walked back out into the square again, pondering her predicament. She'd half expected some guild family to be involved, but the Dorlani. This job had suddenly gotten a lot more complicated and a lot more dangerous. Part of her wanted to go back to Demir, return his money and tell him to deal with it himself. She buried that inclination. She was not a coward. She'd taken on a job and she would damn well see it through. She would have to be careful from here on out. Chapter 9 Demir returned to the Hyacinth in the early morning. He'd been up all night trying to piece together the rest of his mother's spy network within the Foreign Legion. Dozens of contacts, of which only seven proved viable, and he'd done it all while lugging around an injured, frightened falcon. It wasn't his best work, and by the time he slipped through the back door of his hotel, he was exhausted and frustrated. He went directly up the back stairwell to the roof, where there was a flat section set back from the vision of the street below. The muse here was a large one, nearly as big as a stateroom, a massive cage divided into sections for multiple birds and with its own equipment closet. It was long abandoned, seemingly untouched since his own falcon died when he was twelve. He took the injured bird with him into the biggest of the cages and gently let it find a perch before removing the makeshift hood. It shuddered, looking around and giving a loud, piercing screech. The falcon leapt from one perch to another, favouring its left wing, trembling slightly. It shied away from the sound from the street below, and Demi wondered if he should erect a baffle along that side of the roof to stop some of the sound. It was a project for another day, or one of the hotel staff. Demi sank down to the floor of the mews, watching the falcon adjust to its new surroundings, and took a deep breath. He had pored over the morning newspapers on his ride back to the hotel. Every piece of news he came across seemed to read in a completely different light. A minor increase in the price of cinder sand made his heart skip a beat. The closing of a major quarry in Pernia caused his jaw to clench. A Stavry cinder sand warehouse burning down, all contents ruined left him feeling genuinely ill. Yesterday, all of those things would have been discarded as unrelated incidents. Nothing major to worry about. Today they were obvious symptoms of a greater disease. The world was running out of cinder sand. Without intervention, common sorcery would die out. Just to settle himself down, he'd spent the final leg of his journey reading a page three story about monsters being spotted in the provinces. That kind of lunatic rubbish usually put him in a better mood, but it had only caused his thoughts to grow darker. How could he solve the world's problems when the average person believed in ghosts and swamp crawlers and tree men? The effort required to face the road ahead seemed insurmountable. Best I can do for you right now... Demir said to the falcon, looking around at the muse. I'll send someone up to tend to that bloody wing, and I bet the kitchen has a hair or two. For now, though, I have something of my own I need to deal with. He left the poor animal in the muse and headed down to the hotel garden, purposefully avoiding his own staff and the problems they present him with. 
he could let Breenan take care of all those, at least for the moment. The hotel garden was a massive enclosed area the size of a regular city block, lined on all sides by hallways on the main floor and hotel rooms above those. It was a peaceful spot, keeping out the worst of the city noise, filled with trees, the beds layered with winter flowers. On the far side of the garden was an old glassworks, a small furnace room left over from when the hotel used to keep a silicea on staff, well before Demi was born. He made a mental note to have it fixed, just in case he managed to find Tessa. The old glassworks was not his destination, however. The only other building in the garden was a mausoleum. It was a beautiful construction of rare white Pernian marble, with thick veins of purple running through it, decorated with the likenesses of the founders of the Grappo dynasty, their carved faces looking severe in the stone. On the surface, the mausoleum was not very big, just a decorative obelisk with a heavy, worn wooden door. Most hotel visitors walked right past it, more interested in the rest of the massive garden. The heavy door opened on oiled hinges, revealing a dark pit that Demir lit by turning a screw beneath a gas lantern just inside. White and purple marble stairs descended sharply into the ground. Demir proceeded slowly, lighting every lantern, as if dispelling the darkness within the crypt would dispel the same within his mind. The narrow stairway opened into a larger, vaulted room, deep beneath the garden, a long chamber bigger than a hotel suite, and lined with the marble busts of every guild family matriarch and patriarch going back thirty generations. Adriana Grappo's ashes were contained in an urn near the far end of the crypt. The pedestal above the ashes was empty, as her bust had not yet been completed. Demir gazed at that empty spot with a frown, wrestling with something deeply unsatisfying about seeing her remains without her likeness to gaze upon. Of course, the likeness would not be the mother he remembered. The sculptor would produce a likeness of a young Adriana, taken from a portrait of her in her early twenties. He knew he would struggle with that, too. Hi, mother, he said to the empty room. To his surprise, it felt good to say it. But there was no answer. There never would be, and he felt a pain deep within his chest. You really screw me over didn't you? I could have handled the hotel and the clients and sponsoring the Ironhorns, but a phoenix channel, the weight of saving the Empire on my shoulders. You should have said something earlier. You should have prepared me. We saw each other just a few months ago. You could have told me then. He wrestled with his thoughts, feeling them pulled this way and that. He was being unfair, and he knew it. I'm sorry I wasn't here to protect you. I was selfish and a fool, and I've spent a third of my life hiding from the person you raised me to be. He turned away abruptly, walking back to the stairs and pausing there for several minutes before he was able to return to her urn. I hated you so much after Holican, he said, hearing the anger in his own words. I hated the way you had raised me, the tutors and the schedules and the expectations. I hated that my childhood was years shorter than those of my friends because you saw my potential and sought to cultivate it. I was a prodigy at what I did, but the pressure you put on me made me brittle. I wasn't prepared for a disaster like Holican. It was my fault, my responsibility, but you were culpable. I don't think I can blame you any longer, though. You just did what you thought was best. I know how much you love me. Love is in short supply among the Guild families, and I wish I had told you that I loved you back while you were still alive. I wish I'd forgiven you. He paused, staring at the empty pedestal. I forgive you, mother. You made mistakes, but you also put a lot of good in me. You made sure that I cared about people and ideals and not just god glass and money. You made sure I was the type of person who would save a glass damn bird from a war zone, even though it was a waste of my time. 
you made me different from the rest of these guild families. And if there's anything that redeems me, it'll be that. I can't promise I'll make you proud, but I will try. He knelt and touched the urn briefly before turning his gaze toward the marble bust immediately to the right of the empty pedestal. It was of a young man with a strong jaw, high forehead and flat ears. He looked nothing like Demir, oddly enough, until you peered into the eyes. Even in marble they were clever, and the cocky smile on the man's lips looked like the sculptor had taken it from Demir's mirror. Demir ran his hand over the familiar contours of the man's face, like he'd done hundreds of times as a child. Take care of her, Dad, he said, and turned and left the crypt. He emerged into the afternoon sun and took a moment to stare up into the sky, composing himself until the pain in his chest began to recede and he could breathe deeply without difficulty. He felt a little more complete, like he'd taken a step he didn't know he needed to take. He shook it out of his head, forcing himself to return to the greater world. There was a lump caught in his throat and no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get it down. How was he possibly going to do this? To find Tessa? To make a phoenix channel? To protect all his new responsibilities? His mother's note had said not to trust even Breenan with knowledge of the phoenix channel. Did he really have to do all this alone? A sound suddenly reached him, echoing from inside the hotel. He tilted his head, listening carefully until it repeated again, then again. It was his name, and he recognised the voice that was shouting it. He was sprinting for the garden door before he could stop himself, flying down the hallways. Demir, the voice demanded. Where is Demir? He reached the top of the stairs to find the biggest man he'd ever seen standing just inside the front door. He was six and a half feet tall and half as wide with the light skin of a northern provincial and the thick accent to match. He wore a fine embroidered jacket of crimson and purple that made Demir's whole wardrobe look drab. His face was enormous, as big around as a barrel, small eyes and mouth buried in flesh like a bucket full of bread dough. His brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail that went down below his shoulders, Demir could pick out the newest members of the hotel staff by which ones were staring with absolute awe and fear. Baby Montego, world champion cudgelist, one of the few people who can make a glass dancer piss themselves in fear. Baby! Demir yelled. He took the stairs two at a time and sprinted across the lobby. Demir, what are you? Do not do that. Demir leapt into the giant's embrace wrapping his arms around the thick neck and squeezing as hard as humanly possible. Montego gave a long-suffering sigh, and Demir felt a hesitant pat on the back. He dropped to the floor, took a step back, and gave his best friend a long and thoughtful look. Baby, you have gotten really glass-damned fat. I have broken stronger men for smaller insults, Montego grumbled. Then you should stop looking like a milk-fat, overgrown toddler, Demir shot back. He turned to call toward the concierge's office. Brennan, have the suite next to mine made up for Montego. Make sure he gets every service and comfort. I am here on the matter of your mother's death, Montego replied, shaking a newspaper at Demir. I will not be babied. Then I shall not have our carpenter construct an enormous crib, Tell me how you got here so quickly. My yacht had just returned to port when Capric's message arrived. I bought every spare horse and carriage between here and Yavli so I could travel without interruption. Speak, Demir. Tell me what has happened. In private. Demir grabbed Montego by the sleeve, dragging him toward the stairs. They were soon inside his office where he closed the door and allowed himself to collapse onto one of the sofas. For the first time in two days, he felt all of the public masks he wore fall away, and he was able to be himself 
raw and unguarded, around another person. At that moment he made the conscious decision to tell Montego everything. To piss with Mother's warning. If he couldn't trust Montego with the world, he might as well hang himself now. The giant cudgelist remained near the door, staring at Demir. You look awful. Thanks. I'm not joking, Demir. I haven't seen you look this out of sort since Holocan. This isn't just your mother's death. Something has happened. You will tell me now. Mother is dead. I have returned. I now have to save a young woman so that she can help me save the world. I think I'd like the longer version. Demir took a deep breath, resisting the urge to reach for a glass of whiskey or a piece of mind-numbing day's glass. Then you shall have it. He recounted the events of the last two days in detail, leaving nothing out, talking until his throat was dry and his head pounded. Montego sat on the sofa opposite of him, leaning on a silver-headed cane, a look of focus on his comically broad face. When people saw Montego, they rarely looked past his size or his cudgelling record. But Demir knew that beneath that heavy brow was a mind not unlike his own. Montego was sometimes quiet, sometimes gregarious, but always brilliant. Demir finished his tale with a sigh, throwing his arms wide. It's too much, baby. I can't do it. Slow down, Montego responded, holding up a massive hand. You do not trust the Assembly's investigation? Of course not. Kizzy was a good choice. I'm glad you brought her in. Will that be awkward for you? Your mother is dead, Montego replied seriously. She funded my first fight. She adopted me. I want Kizzy to continue the hunt for her killers. Awkwardness has no place in whatever happens next. Well said. Montego made a few thoughtful sounds. We shall let her work that angle. You do believe, Castora, about the cinder sand? No reason not to. I haven't worn god glass for years, Montego snorted. Makes the glass rot scales on my legs itch. I suppose I would miss it, at least for those around me, he grimaced. The consequences of his absence would be drastic. Demir chuckled. Your talent for understatement will never cease to amaze me. And your talent for despair will never cease to amaze me. Don't try to hide it, I can see it in your face. You're wearing the same expression you wore that month you convinced yourself you were in love with that Nasud princess. You don't think I should despair? Castora was clear on one thing. We need this Tessa woman if we're going to remake his Phoenix Channel. And she's disappeared. Demir finally did cross the room and pour them each a finger of whiskey. He brought one glass to Montego, then lifted his own, noting that it was the glass he'd destroyed the other day when he thought he saw someone outside his window. A glass dancer could force glass back together again, but he'd done a sloppy job of it, leaving the cup warped and ruined. Montego sipped his whiskey and shook his head. No, I don't think you should despair. Clearly there are enemies to be rooted out. Clearly there is an economic disaster on the horizon. Clearly, look at me. Demir, look at me. Demir forced himself to meet Montego's beady eyes. Clearly, Montego continued, this will be a difficult road. But you are Demir Grappo. I am baby Montego. I have returned and I will not leave again until the world is set right. I swear it. Demir swallowed hard, only to realise that the lump in the back of his throat was gone. He felt lighter, almost giddy, the darkness that had covered him retreating before Montego's unflinching gaze. Your optimism, he said, his voice cracking, is foolhardy. And your despair is pointless. We have work to do, Demir. You are a glass dancer and the finest mind of our generation. You were a provincial governor at fourteen. You negotiated a massive trade agreement between the Nasud and the Balkany, ending centuries of enmity 
and your province got rich on the deal. Demir felt the corner of his mouth twitch upward at the memory. I was the finest mind of our generation. I believe you still are. You're just out of practice. Demir wanted to fight him. Every fibre of his being protested against his own abilities, convinced that he could not possibly accomplish this task in front of him. His whole psyche felt on wobbly ground, waiting to crack and crumble like it had at Holicon. But Montego hadn't been with him that horrible day. The cudgelist was a firm foundation upon which to get his mental footing, his confident optimism battering down Demir's most powerful doubts. He took a shaky breath, pulling himself together, restoring his public masks so that the hotel staff wouldn't see how he truly felt. Fine. We'll do it your way, you big, dumb optimist. But when I fail, I'm going to blame it on you. Montego slapped his thigh and bellowed out a laugh. Ha! I knew I'd bring you around. Remember, Demir, you can't conquer your enemies until you conquer yourself. One of Mother's sayings, Demir said, cocking an eyebrow. That spectre he felt last night, the niggling, hesitant memory of his old self, seemed to pace around in the back of his head, coaxed out by Montego's presence. Perhaps he really could do this. He closed his eyes, forcing out all the chaos until he could focus on what was immediately before him. Fine. We can do this. Breenan is taking care of the hotel. Caprick is helping me set up a number of business deals to buoy the grappo coffers. I still have the responsibilities of the Patriarch, but you and I must cast our net wide if we're to find Tessa. Where do we look first? Demir had been asking himself the same question all night. She would have gone either north or south from Grent, giving the fighting a wide berth to enter the city. I'll go looking in person, Montego offered. You're not tired from your journey? Bah, my friend needs me. What is sleep before such an obligation? I shall leave immediately to begin my search for Tessa. And I'll find out if one of the guild families snatched her up. Demir could feel his confidence growing the strength returning to his mind and body. Thank you for coming, Montego. Montego cracked a smile at Demir's use of his given name. I wouldn't be your friend if I didn't. But you're hesitating again. Do not hesitate, Demir. Act. He leapt to his feet and threw open the office door. Renan, he bellowed. I need new horses for my carriage. I must fly. With that, he disappeared. Demir did not allow himself the time for doubt. He began to write letters immediately, preparing queries for his mother's spies, his own contacts, and old acquaintances that might be able to help. He was careful in his wording, never inquiring directly after Tessa, making sure not to tip his hand to anyone he might prove untrustworthy. He'd been at it for some time when a porter appeared in the doorway. Sir, you have a delivery from Idrian Sepulchi. The soldiers guarding it said you wanted to receive the delivery yourself. Demir sealed several of his letters and gave them to a bellhop. He followed the porter down to one of the rear delivery doors of the hotel, where he shooed everyone out of the room before prying open what looked like a standard military musket crate. Inside were the burnt-out remains of Castora's Phoenix Channel. It was Demir's first good look at the prototype and he circled it for several minutes as he tried to work out what it had looked like before the fire. The outer shell, a chamber with thin tin walls stuffed with cork insulation, was mostly burned away. Inside that, cracked and broken, was a two-foot-long piece of cinderite decorated with omni-glass rings. Demir had rarely seen a piece of cinderite this big, and the clear omni-glass with which it was encircled was almost as uncommon. Omniglass was an expensive, finicky, sorcerous material that enhanced other god glasses, probably used in this case to accentuate the energy conversion process Castora hoped to capture. To recreate the prototype, Demi would need both the materials and someone skilled enough to put them all together without ruining it. His and Montego's energy would go toward the latter, 
but that didn't mean he couldn't acquire the former while they worked. He found a porter waiting for him outside. Have this taken up to my rooms, he told the young man, and then take Breen and a message. I want him to locate every large piece of cinderite in both private and public collections within fifty miles. Chapter 10 Idrian sat in one corner of his temporary tenement room with the palm of one hand pressed against his god-glass eye. Sunlight streamed in through the narrow window, slashing rays through the dusty air, and he could hear the organised chaos of his battalion preparing themselves for the day just outside. Sleep had not come easy for him, not after watching Castora die and then making sure that the Phoenix Channel was delivered to the Hyacinth. He felt beaten down, imagining mud on his knees and welts across the back of his neck, though it had been decades since his father had dared to raise a hand to him. Somewhere in the tenement, a child laughed. Idrian forced himself up, leaving his bedroll and crossing to the other side of the room, where Brailleur had set out his armour. He ran his fingers across a few small mendings, feeling the deep notches in the steel frame of the shield and the heavy scratches across the hammer glass of his left pauldron. It was apparent that repairs had been done, though it would be a stretch to say they'd been done well. Idrian grimaced. Was an inexperienced armourer better than no armourer at all? Brailleur hadn't made the damage worse, at least. Idrian looked in his pack for a pencil and paper, half-minded to write a message back to the Ministry. When he could find neither, he began to compose it in his head. Brailleur needed a few more years of training before he saw active duty. His presence was a disservice to them both, Idrian needed an experienced armourer. Returning to his armour, Idrian did a more thorough examination. One of the broken straps was mended, and quite well. The polish on the metal was properly done. There were, he admitted to himself, a few competent points. A child laughed again somewhere in the tenement, and Idrian shook his head. Glass damn civilians needed to get out of here. He could be sympathetic that many of them had no place to go, but fleeing into the countryside or deeper into either Grent or Osa was a better alternative than staying in an active war zone. He stepped into the hallway, following the sound of the laughter to the end of the building, where he found a tenement door opened a crack. The child's giggle issued from within. Listen, he said loudly, knocking on the door and pushing it open. You need to move. He trailed off, staring at the room for several moments. It was abandoned, just as threadbare and empty as his own, with the bedroll and pack belonging to one of the iron-horned sergeants sitting in the corner, but nothing else. Certainly no children. Idrian swallowed hard and pressed on his god-glass eye. Shit, he whispered. He gripped his god-glass eye carefully and pulled it out of the socket lifting it to peer into the purple, cloudy depths with his one good eye. The colour was a little duller than the last time he checked, but not so much as to reduce the effectiveness of the sorcery it emanated. Sir, called the voice. Idrian pushed the eye back into its socket and whirled around to see Brailleur standing just outside the door. Everything all right, sir? Idrian glanced into the empty room and closed the door forcing himself to ignore the child's laughter that came from within instantaneously. It is. Your breakfast is ready, sir. Idrian joined Brailleur back in his own room, sitting down on his bedroll as the young man set a tin plate in front of him. Idrian was deep in his own thoughts, trying not to think about that child's laughter while coming up with a way to let Brailleur down easy. Would the young man be ashamed of being immediately removed from his position, or secretly relieved not to have to go into combat? Or both? He tapped his knife against the tin plate a few times thoughtfully before using it to shovel food into his mouth. He was immediately jolted back to the present, his palate hit by several powerful flavours. He looked down. This isn't Laurent's gruel, 
he said. Braylier was watching him keenly. I'm sorry if it's a bit substandard, sir. The quartermaster... Laurent. Laurent wouldn't believe that I was your new armourer, so I had to swipe a few things from the cast-offs at his prep station. It's just potatoes fried in lard with onion leaves, some old garlic and a bit of cheese. Adrian took another bite and chewed slowly, tilting his head to one side to listen for more distant laughter. Nothing. His phantoms were silent for the moment. Pleasure of any kind tended to quiet them. This is better than anything Laurent has ever made us. And you whipped it up from his extras. Yes, sir. You always light-fingered? Braylier seemed to sense the trap in that question and ducked his head. I'm not a thief, sir. I'm the youngest in a big, poor family. If I wanted to eat, I needed to swipe from my brother's plates without getting caught. Then how do you know how to cook? I apprenticed with an armourer's chef for three years. One day the armourer's regular assistant got ill, so I filled in. The poor girl died, and I learned quick, so I became an armourer's apprentice. Idrian finished his meal, enjoying every bite, taking solace in the warmth and richness of the food. When he finished, he leaned back against the wall and set aside his plate, watching Braylia right back. The work you did last night is, well, it's not bad, but it's not good either. I understand, sir. I won't lie. My master argued with the recruiter for over an hour when they came around and conscripted me. Said I wasn't ready. And he was right. I can't do a perfect job, but I guarantee I'll be better than nothing. Adrian already liked this kid. Quick. Self-aware, attentive. A foreign legion armourer pays a lot better than an armourer's apprentice, he observed. That it does, sir. Adrian licked clean his knife, wiped it on his uniform pants, and returned it to his belt. How much? A thousand a month, sir. Braley hesitated for a moment. Are you going to dismiss me from your service, sir? Mm. Idrian looked at his plates and seriously considered licking that clean as well. Not yet. We'll see how you fit in, he said. Where is Tadius? Major Grappo is just outside, sir. Idrian left Braylier to roll up his bedroll and headed outside, where various Einhorn squads all headed off in different directions. It was clear that orders had already been handed out but Idrian himself hadn't been included. His commanding officer and longtime friend stood in the centre of the makeshift camp, hands on his hips, his eyes raised to the sky as if deep in thought. Taddeus Grappo looked like an older version of his more famous nephew. He was in his late forties, with black hair, a scarred and weathered face, and thoughtful brown eyes. Despite having renounced his assembly seat long ago to Demir, he still held himself like a guild family member. His shoulders were squared, head up, a hint of regality in his presence, despite his sweat-stained, dusty uniform. Finally joining us, our illustrious breacher, he called as his eyes fell on Idrian. You didn't send anyone to wake me up, Idrian replied. They aren't ordering us to the front today. Taddea shook his head. They split us up to babysit a bunch of artillery as they move them up. It's drudge work, but better than what we went through yesterday. Agreed. Idrian came to stand next to Taddeus, pressing gently on his godglass eyes he made sure they were alone. It's happening again, he said softly. Already? Taddeus's gaze snapped to him, his expression immediately growing worried. I thought you had a couple years left until the eyes started to degrade. I thought I did too, but Demir was here last night. At his request, I accompanied him to the Grand Royal Glassworks to extract Master Castora. We found Castora mortally wounded, 
and he died within minutes of our arrival. Adrian spoke as if giving a report to a fastidious general, trying to keep all emotion out of his words, lest that dam burst. Tadius didn't even twitch an eye at the mention of his nephew. Either he already knew he'd been here, or he just wasn't surprised by it. He put a hand on Idrian's shoulder. I'm sorry. Your agreement with the Ministry. They know the eye holds your madness at bay. They'll have to find you a Silasir to make a new one, correct? Per our agreement. But I despair that no one out there can replicate Castora's work. He was the best. We'll find you someone. The words were hollow in Idrian's ears, but still offered a margin of comfort coming from a friend. I have a policy of never grieving for someone until after the war. But it was hard last night. Castora saved my sanity. He was a good man, and our own stupid glass-damned soldiers bayoneted him to death. He should not be dead right now. Captured, maybe, but not dead. I know he meant a lot to you, Taddea said softly, both as a friend and, I suppose, a doctor of sorts. What form has the madness taken? Taddeus leaned forward to examine Idrian's god-glass eye like a surgeon. Child's laughter. I don't remember that one. It's new. I should report this to the Ministry, Taddeus said unhappily, for your safety. Idrian snatched Taddeus by the arm. Don't. The last thing he needed was to be dragged off by Ministry doctors, taken away from his friends and observed like an asylum lunatic for all hours of the day. I'll be fine. The madness will not impair your ability to fight. The question was asked carefully, and Idrian snorted in response. Tadius already knew the answer. No, of course not, Idrian replied. You'd tell me if it did. Yes. Tadius gave him a doubtful look. Perhaps your mind was just reacting to Castora's death and it will settle back down. Your eye is still full of colour. You should have a couple of years to find another master Silicea before it runs out of resonance. Idrian swallowed, holding back a thousand worries and insecurities. He found no shame in voicing them, but it was unnecessary. Tadius knew them all. Instead, he said, I can only hope... He did have to bite back the urge to tell Taddeus about the Phoenix Channel. He trusted Taddeus with any secret, of course, but he took his promise to Demir seriously. It would not leave his lips again, nor would he let it cloud his thoughts. If Godglass disappeared, Idrian's fate would be sealed. No sense in dwelling on it more than that. Taddeus shook his head, touching Idrian gently on the shoulder. I'm sorry. When this war is over, I'll help you deal with the Ministry and finding a new Master Cilicia. That's kind of you to offer, Idrian replied. It definitely helped to have a friend who cared at his side. Breaches were important, but a Guild family member could get results easier than Idrian. Sometimes I wonder if I'd have gone mad if I'd never lost this eye and I wonder if I'll be able to resist killing your father if I ever meet him, Taddeus snorted. I don't know how you do it. Patricide doesn't look good in front of a ministry tribunal. Only if they can find the body. Taddeus checked his pocket watch. Shit, I have to get to a staff meeting with General Stavry. Nothing for you to do today, so get some rest. Mika will be through here any time with one of those artillery regiments. Stay out of sight, or one of those puffed-up guild family pricks will try to bully you into guard duty. Idrian bid his friend farewell with a raised hand, watching Taddeus jog down the street. He touched his godglass eye briefly. Most people assumed he'd lost his eye in battle. He let them think that. 
Only Taddeus knew about the paternal cruelty of the screaming and the beatings. He tried to cast it all out of his mind. He needed the rest after yesterday's events. But he wished there were something for him to do, if only to keep his thoughts off of his own encroaching madness. He paced nervously, ignoring the looks from the Ironhorn support staff as they cleaned the camp and washed and mended uniforms. Braylear came out on a nearby stoop, laying out Idrian's armour, sword and shield. Idrian paused his pacing long enough to watch. Perhaps the young armourer would do a better job at his repairs in the light of day. Even if he was just coming out to give them another polish, it was good that he was staying busy. Idrian joined him, sinking down onto the stoop and staring up into the sky. Do you think a lot about death, Brillia? he asked. No, sir. You will, if you stay with the foreign legion long. Idrian bit his own tongue immediately after the word slipped out. It wasn't like him to maintain such a dark mood around someone he barely knew, and a fresh recruit at that. Brady didn't deserve it. You'll see the best of life as well, he added. Yes, sir, Brady said, ducking his head to his work. Idrian wondered if he'd scared him. A movement caught Idrian's eye, and he turned to see a small girl watching him from the window of a tenement down the street. Most Grent civilians had fled ahead of the fighting, trying to stay well clear, but thousands were left hunkering in their homes with nowhere to go. Idrian waved. The girl waved back. A young woman suddenly appeared behind the girl and pulled her inside, closing the shutters with a quick, angry glare at Idrian. He didn't blame her. Nobody wanted this. Not the civilians, not the soldiers. If not for the orders coming down from on high, he might be on holiday on this very street right now, enjoying the solstice and Grant's darker, high-quality winter ale. The sound of a small explosion reached him, and Idrian's head came up at the sound. Another followed, far too close for comfort. Really? he hissed. Those are Mika's grenades. He was on his feet in half a moment, pinpointing the sound. Arm yourself and come with me, he ordered, snatching his helmet from Braylia's hands and slamming it onto his head. He grabbed his sword and shield and set off at a run, not bothering to make sure the armourer had followed. As he drew closer to the source of the explosions, he could hear screaming. Grant Breacher, someone shouted. We have an incoming Breacher! Idrian emerged from an alleyway to see a full-fledged battle taking place in front of him. A dozen artillery pieces were stretched out down the street, their crews huddled around them protectively, trying to keep the horses from panicking, while a mix of soldiers and engineers with the iron horn crest on their uniforms formed a perimeter. That perimeter had already collapsed at the head of the column. A Grent breacher wearing full-plate armour chopped a brutal path up the line of artillery. Two horses were already dead, their artillery pieces cleaved into useless pieces the bodies of crew and ironhorns alike scattered around them. As Idrian watched, an artillery officer lost his head. In moments that breacher had killed the next horse, sliced off the wheel of a six-pound gun, and cleaved through half the crew. The rest fled, while the ironhorns peppered the breacher's armour with musket shot. You can't go out there without your armour, Braylia gasped as he caught up. He carried his small sword and hammerglass buckler and looked absolutely terrified. Try and stop me, Idrian snapped. A wave of Grent soldiers, probably a small company's worth, followed in the wake of their breacher, bayonetting the wounded and returning fire to drive the ironhorns back. Idrian searched his comrades until he found Mika standing with their engineers right in the path of the enemy breacher. She held a sling loading it with a small grenade, before whipping it over her head to send the explosive soaring into the enemy. The explosion drew their attention, and Idrian used that to his advantage. He broke cover at a full sprint, praying that the sorcery in his helmet would be enough to get him through this. He hit the Grent soldiers from the side, 
sword first, sweeping through them just as easily as their own breacher was slicing up the iron horns. Their organised shouts became screams, and within moments he was covered in gore. A grenade soared over Idrian's shoulder, clattering across the cobbles and exploding right at the feet of the Grint breacher. She was too busy turning herself to face Idrian to notice the grenade, and the resulting explosion knocked her off her feet. Idrian blocked a bayonet thrust with his shield, felt another slice across his calf, and cut through an entire squad of Grent infantry with a razor-glass blade of his sword. A bullet whizzed past his ear, and, conscious of the fact that he wasn't actually wearing his armour, he whirled toward the enemy breacher as she regained her feet. She closed on him in moments, and he caught her opening thrust on his shield, batted it aside, and slammed the dull edge of his sword against her hammerglass armour so as not to break his razor glass. The blows staggered her, but she recovered quickly. She tossed aside her own shield, caught Idris's riposte with the flat of her sword, and then came at him swinging with all her might. The blunt edges of their swords slammed off each other, enormous slabs of metal and godglass crashing together with the speed of a fencer's small sword and the force of a miner's pickaxe. Idrian felt each reverberating blow all the way to his toes, and it became quickly clear that while he might be the more skilled of the two, the forge glass in her armour made her just too strong and too fast. He fell back, trying to figure out a way to disengage without being cut in half, praying that the damned fools behind him had retreated to safety. They hadn't, of course. Even with Idrian's singular focus, he could sense the continued battle raging around him. His sword arm was growing heavy, his legs sluggish, trying to wield sword and shield without the extra forge glass. He caught a blow at the base of his sword that numbed his fingers and rattled his knees. He grunted, shoving the breacher back, staring into her victorious smile. A ball suddenly flew through the air, bonking the grent breacher in the side of the helmet. She barely seemed to notice, a brief frown crossing her face. Idrian might have laughed if he didn't recognise that ball as one of Mika's grenades. There was his exit strategy. He threw himself backward, putting his shield between himself and the grenade, just as the explosion threw him and his opponent in opposite directions. He felt his ears pop. A great pressure passed through his chest. He allowed himself to continue falling backward, knocked from his feet, rolling across the cobbles and then coming back up with his sword at the ready. The Grent Breacher had done the same, her armour protecting her from the blast, and she turned to sprint away. Idrian blinked sweat out of his eyes, hearing the Grent's bugle call that signalled a retreat. The rest of the Grent infantry fell into an organised flight, waiting until their breacher was safely among them before turning tail completely. A loud whistle cut through the air, followed by two short bursts. Idrian felt a wave of relief wash over him. That would be Taddeus, and with him, valiant reinforcements. Musket shots ceased, leaving an eerie silence over the smoke-filled street, filled only by the tramp of boots and the cries of the wounded. Idrian was soon surrounded by ironhorn soldiers. You all right, sir? One asked. Where is my armourer? Idrian asked, casting about. To his surprise, he found Braylia standing just behind him. The young man's sword was still clean, but his shield was scratched, and a rivulet of blood ran down his brow from a close cut. His eyes were wide, but he seemed otherwise unhurt. Were you with me that entire time? Idrian asked. Braylia's whole body trembled, but he managed a nod. Good lad. Idrian slapped him on the shoulder and knew in that moment that he would not dismiss him. He let himself sag, feeling suddenly sapped of all energy, his arms almost too weak to hold his sword and shield. He set them down where he stood, and removed his helmet to wipe away the sweat. He turned around just in time to see Taddeus running toward him. If you ever, Taddeus shouted, ever rush into battle without your glass-damned armour again, I will have you pissing court marshaled Adrian gazed back at his friend flatly. Taddeus's face was red, and his eyes were full of worry, searching Adrian for wounds. 
Whatever you say, boss. Don't boss me, damn it. Tad, Mika said, right on Taddeus' heels. If he hadn't intervened, we would have lost a whole battalion's worth of artillery, their crews, and the engineers that were helping them. Nothing compared to losing a breacher, Taddeus spat. Adrian held up both hands, palms out. There was no arguing with Taddeus when he was in a rage like that. He was right, of course. That was damn stupid of Adrian. I'd do it again, he told Taddeus, hoping that his calm voice would help bring down Taddeus's blood. You think I'm going to take the time to put on my armor when people are dying? You've met me before, right? You? Taddeus shook his finger at Adrian. Damn it. How about you find out who let a Grant strike force slip through our sentries? Mika said, grabbing hold of Taddeus's arm. Taddeus shook her off, his face contorting through a dozen different expressions before settling on dismay. At a glance, Adrian estimated they'd lost several engineers and twenty or thirty soldiers from the Ironhorns, not to mention a handful of artillery crews and their commanding officer. It was a testament to just how much damage a good breach of strike force could do in minutes. Valiant, Taddeus called. Find out who glass damn let that strike force through our sentries and bring them to me so I can cut them into little pieces. You got it? He shouted back from the other end of the artillery column. You, Taddeus whirled back on Adrian. See a medic for stitches and cure glass. I'm fine. Adrian's blood had finally cooled, and he could feel the sharp pain of the cut across his calf. He bent to examine it, happy to find that it was superficial. Did we get new orders? he asked. We did, and they're damn strange. Did you even notice she cut off your earlobe? Adrian touched his left ear. It stung badly and his fingers came back covered in blood. That was my favourite ear, he said to Mika as Taddeus stormed off. Mika raised both eyebrows and said in a low voice, I appreciate it. You just saved a shitload of my people. That's my job, Adrian said, waving off the thanks. That grenade at the end there saved my life. You look like your arms are about to fall off and your armorer was about to get skewed by a grant bayonet. Thanks. Another thirty seconds and she would have had me. That sword is blasted heavy with only the forge glass in its grip and my helmet. He nodded Mika off, letting her go check on her wounded engineers, and found a piece of cure glass to slow the bleeding until one of their medics came to check on him. By the end of the hour, he had stitches up a long gash on his right arm, as well as around what was left of his earlobe. It hurt like piss, but he forwent his milk glass. The pain reminded him not to be so stupid next time. He probably would, but a reminder couldn't hurt. At some point, he could hear Taddeus screaming at someone around the corner. Probably the poor bastard in charge of their sentries, some middling officer from the regular infantry. Fighting soon broke out close by as the regular infantry struck back at the Grent lines. Idrian waited for word for him and the Ironhorns to join that fighting, but it never came. The dead were all but cleaned up, the wounded taken care of, when Idrian saw Taddeus heading back toward him from across the street. Idrian went to intercept his friend. What happened? Taddeus sighed and sat down on one of the destroyed artillery pieces, staring at the flies buzzing around the dead horse in front of it. A good strike force, he replied. Damned good. Took out our sentries and killed seven squads of regular infantry without even raising an alarm. Nobody's fault. Wish it was. Then I could have them shot. We gonna hit them back? Adrian asked. Taddeus shook his head. The fourth will deal with that. We just got new orders. He scowled as he said this. The seventh is making a go at the Ducal Palace. General Stavry figures if we can capture that, we can force the Duke to consider an early surrender. It will satisfy the bloodlust of the masses angry over Adriana's death and will have suitably slapped Grent on the wrist for their political meddling. Over bloody and quick, Adrian nodded. 
That's what I like to hear. Are we helping the Seventh go after the palace? That we are. From what I heard, the fighting is even hotter than what we saw yesterday. Adrian groaned. He liked the strategy, he just didn't like the idea of spearheading it. But that was, he reminded himself, their job. To his surprise, Taddeus shoved something into his hand. It was a letter, still sealed with purple wax stamped with a grapposilic sigil. What's this? he asked. Letter from my nephew. Idrian broke the seal. It said, The Duke of Grent has a large piece of cinderite in his art collection at his palace. I've arranged for the iron horns to be moved closer to the fighting there. Fetch me this piece of cinderite undamaged, and you have yourself a deal. What does it say? Taddeus asked. Idrian shook his head, reminding himself that he'd promised Demir not to say a word about the Phoenix Channel to anyone. His heart was beating hard now, a pleasant tingle between his shoulders. Not only had Demir accepted his offer, but he'd done so quickly. With a working Phoenix Channel, Idrian could restore the sorceress resonance in his eye. He wouldn't need another Master Cilicia. Idrian might actually be able to save his sanity. He thought hard, back to a meeting at the Duke's palace some months ago, where he'd gone along as a ceremonial guard, and realised that he'd actually seen this piece of cinderite. It was on display in the foyer of the palace. He needed to be the first person through the front doors of the palace, and since he was a breacher, that wasn't completely unlikely. Never mind the brutal fighting. He'd do what needed to be done if it meant saving civilization and his own damned sanity. Chapter 11 Tessa was loaded unceremoniously into a cart and bundled off north by her Osan captors, taking the exact highway around Osa that she had intended to use in the first place. She watched forlornly while they passed by the road she would have followed down into the city. She couldn't stop thinking of Sarah's and his family. The adults and teens impressed into naval service. The elderly and the children chucked off to one side, robbed of all their possessions. Would they even survive the cold winter night? Would they find help or succour? All she could do was hope that they managed to reach their relations and scrape together enough of a bribe to get their family back from the Navy. If she wasn't thinking of them, she was thinking of Eki. She tried to reason to herself that he'd gotten away, but she'd heard that pained screech. Even if he survived the shot, an injured falcon was as good as dead in the wild. She did not have much hope for Eki, but perhaps Castora had gotten through unharmed. Palua too, and all the other apprentices. Tessa's captors handed her off to a pair of magna enforcers, a man and a woman in their mid-forties, heavily armed and silent, with pinky nails painted red to show their guild family allegiance. They did not mistreat her, but they made it very clear that an escape attempt would result in broken bones. All three of them slept crowded together in the back of the carts that night. Tessa dreamed of fires and screaming once more, but this time she saw the solemn little figure of Leon standing in the muddy streets, holding his toys, staring at her unblinking. In the morning, they continued their journey. Tessa wrestled with her despair, trying her best not to give in to the abject terror swirling in the back of her head. This was just a hiccup, she told herself, a side trip on the way to her ultimate goal. She would escape. She had to escape. The future of silic science was stuffed in her boot. It was mid-afternoon when they trundled into a smoky, downtrodden town on the edge of a dark forest. Tessa was pulled from the back of the cart and marched through the front gate in a high wall. She instantly recognised the type of place. It was a large glass-making compound, much bigger than the Grent Royal Glassworks, with proper streets and dozens of buildings spewing black smoke into the air. Everything was coated with soot, and the streets were packed with hundreds of people, labourers, silicias, assistants, all heading in different directions. There were also enforcers carrying bayoneted muskets, and they watched the crowded streets in a way that made it clear that they weren't a normal garrison. These were prison guards. 
Tess's escort pushed her into a small room just inside the gate and closed the door behind her before she could ask any questions. She found herself staring at the door in frustration, a thousand questions on the tip of her tongue, worry, anger and fear causing a maelstrom of emotions that made her want to cry or punch someone. Tessa! She whirled, reaching for a belt knife that had been taken away from her, but her hand immediately fell away from the empty spot. Sitting on a little wooden bench in the corner of the room was Axio. The young assistant looked exhausted, his face streaked with tears, expression wide-eyed. He leapt to his feet and ran to her, catching her up in a hug before she could respond. Tessa hugged back, a wave of relief rushing through her. A familiar face, even in a place like this, was as refreshing as a sip of cold beer. Her raging thoughts calmed instantly and she took a deep breath. Axio, what are you doing here? She broke the hug, pushing him out at arm's length and looking him over. His left eye and right cheek were both blackened from a beating, but he seemed otherwise unhurt. She wasn't sure if it was some kind of motherly instinct or just her position as an authority figure at the Grent Royal Glassworks, but she felt instantly protective. She wanted to know who had done that to him and then make them hurt. As she had with the thoughts of that family who helped her yesterday, she forced herself to let go of her fury as pointless. Axio shook his head. That soldier gave me a bit of a beating, but they were soon calling for a retreat. I tried to get away, but they dragged me with them when they were true. And Master Castora? Tessa couldn't imagine the sweet old master fighting enemy soldiers, but it seemed he had rallied the garrison. She wished she'd listened to her instincts and returned. I didn't see. Tessa pulled him back into a hug. You did well. Thank you for distracting that soldier. Master Castora sent me. She paused, considering her story. Best not to mention the schematics in her boot to anyone, even Axio. He told me to flee to some Olsen allies of his, but there were soldiers guarding the border. Axio sniffed and wiped a grimy sleeve across his nose. Like her, he was still wearing the same clothes from the previous morning. She paused at that thought, shocked. That was only yesterday morning. It felt like weeks had passed. She laughed out of horror more than anything else. It's okay, she reassured Axio again. She looked back at the door, then around at the featureless little room. She was a journeyman, a proud Cilicia, and she now had the extra responsibility of protecting someone beneath her. That felt far more concrete than simply delivering important schematics. Another deep breath. She could do both. I don't know how long we have alone, she said in a low voice. Tell me what you know. Axios seemed to also take some courage in her presence. Not much, he said, his voice growing more steady. Just that we're at the Ivory Forest Glassworks. I see. She recognised the name and tried to remember what she knew of this place, though it wasn't much. It's a big glassworks, she told Axio. They specialise in mass-produced low-resonance god glass. Based on what I saw just now, this is a labour camp. Explains a lot, I suppose. The quality coming out of here has never been good. She paused to think for a moment. If it's a labour camp, they're going to put us to work. They'll give me daily quotas and a set schedule. They'll give you... What's wrong? At the mention of quotas, Axio looked like Tessa had just kicked him between the legs. I, uh, told them I was a Cilicia apprentice. You're shitting me. It didn't take half a second for Tessa to realise what that entailed. A Cilicia, even an apprentice, was a first-rate commodity. Skilled labour. A Cilicia's assistant, however, was only a step above a common labourer. Axio had claimed to be an apprentice for better treatment, not thinking ahead to when someone asked for work out of him. He looked ill. Sorry, Tessa. Piss and shit. Fine, 
We can deal with this. I'll... I'll think of something. She could hear people talking just outside the door and lowered her voice even further. If anyone asks, my name is Teela. We're both apprentices at the Grint Royal Glassworks. You can claim to be new. Maybe that will help keep your quota low. You won't use your real name? No. Don't tell them who I am or my rank. It's very important. Follow my lead and we'll both get through this. As she finished speaking, the door opened to reveal a small, squirrel-faced man. The man's apron was stitched with an inverted triangle covered in wavy lines emanating from a single point. Within a glassworks, it was the symbol for cure glass, but in Osen society, it was the sigil of the Magna Guild family. The man had a small matching sigil tattooed on the back of his right hand. He looked to be in his mid-fifties, with long black hair, a pointed face, and sharp, nervous eyes. He had a tiny piece of aura glass in his ear, a common god glass that enhanced the wearer's natural charisma. Aura glass, in Tess's experience, was worn only by those who lacked confidence. His arms bore no scars, reminding Tessa of one of Castora's sayings, Scars are the true reflection of a Cilicia. Too many, and she is an oaf. Too few, and she's never truly worked the furnaces. None of this boded well. The man stared at Tessa and Axio for a few moments, his expression bored. These are the new arrivals from Grant? He asked the enforcer standing just behind his right shoulder. Yes, sir. Do we have a file on them? No, sir. The man sniffed and looked from Axio to Tessa. Tessa met his eye, hoping that some confidence would divert his attention to her. It worked. He settled his gaze on her and said, I am craftsman Philip Magna. You may call me sir, or craftsman, or craftsman Magna. I am the overseer of this compound. Is this a labor camp, sir? Tessa asked. A flash of annoyance crossed his face. This is a workshop for undesirable Cilicers, convicts, hostages, debtors, enemies of the state. You are both prisoners of war, and this will be your home until your ransom is paid or the war has ended. Sir, Tessa said, trying her best to conceal this sudden avenue of hope. What is our ransom? He glared back at her and Tessa got the distinct feeling that craftsman Magna wasn't accustomed to being questioned by his wards. He removed a board from under his arm, to which were clipped several pieces of paper. He flipped through them and his eyes settled on one. Ah, no ransom being allowed. Too early in the war, you see. We need you working for our war efforts, not the enemy's. A cruel little smile cracked his face. No one knows you're here. You will be allowed no visitors or contact with the outside world. He turned to the enforcer behind him. Search them. The enforcer stepped into the room. Before Tessa could react, she found herself shoved face forward against the wall. Thick fingers probed her in places they shouldn't, running up under her tunic, through her hair, touching her everywhere, making her stomach flip. It was blessedly brief and about as professional as she could have hoped. She closed her eyes and tried to relax, though her heart was beating hard as she could tell what was coming. Boots off, the enforcer commanded. Tessa tried to come up with an excuse not to follow his instructions, but nothing came to hand. Reluctantly, she pulled her boots off. The enforcer picked them up one at a time, shoving his hand inside. He came away with the rolled-up schematics, which he handed over to the overseer without comment. The overseer unrolled the vellum sheets, frowning as he flipped through them. Well, well, what have we here? This looks interesting. He peered at Tessa. Where did you get these? Tessa stared at the ground, speaking the first good lie that came to mind. I took them when I fled the glassworks, sir. A thief, eh? I didn't know. Don't try to explain yourself, he cut her off. 
I'm not going to listen to excuses. What are they? I'm not really sure, sir. I just snatched them from the furnace room. I thought maybe I could sell them. Better to be thought a thief than Castora's protégé. She let her gaze flick to the overseer's face. He was looking at the schematics again, turning them this way and that with a frown on his face. Finally, he rolled them back up and put them in his pocket. He did not seem bothered by her explanation. Tessa glanced at Axio, hoping that her message to keep quiet had gotten through to him. He knew she'd never steal from Master Castora. At a nod from the overseer, the enforcer grabbed Axio and submitted him to the same quick, thorough search. He came up with nothing. Tessa forced herself to watch. Seeing Axio's hands tremble and the look of fear on his face gave her strength. She was his superior. She needed to be confident for both of them. With no ransom being allowed, she was glad she decided on a fake name. She and Axio might have to be here a long time. Without knowing who she was, the overseer would expect less of her. She might even be able to get away with sabotaging their operations in some way. Grits in the molten cinder sand, impurities in the fires of the furnace. She forced herself to focus, formulating a quick plan. First, learn to navigate this place. Second, plan an escape. Third, get the schematics back. Fourth, if escape was impossible, figure out how to fight back. The overseer studied his papers again. He produced a nub of pencil from behind his ear and looked directly at her. Name? Tila. His eyes narrowed, so Tessa added. Sir. Last name? None, sir. I was an orphan. Rank? Senior apprentice, sir. He nodded along with their answers, firing off a number of basic questions about who she was, her role under Master Castora, and what kind of work she did at the Grent Royal Glassworks. She replied with half-truths and a few outright lies, presenting herself as a lowly cog at her old glassworks, someone who barely saw Master Castora and rarely spoke to him. By the time craftsman Magna finished, Tessa felt like she had learned more about him than he had her. She knew his type precisely. An administrator who played at silic knowledge, half competent in an office, uncomfortable in front of the furnace. He was small minded, probably petty, more concerned about his ledgers than about any other people under him. She would have to figure out a way to use that. He turned to Axio. Name Axio Darnassus, sir. Axio's voice was unsteady. Rank? Tessa cut in. Junior apprentice, sir. I did not ask you, Craftsman Magna snapped. The overseer's patience with her had clearly worn thin. I'm sorry, sir, he's just very new. If you speak out of turn again, I will have you flogged before the entire compound. Tessa heard her own teeth click shut. She nodded sharply looking at her feet in what she hoped was a subservient gesture and hoping that Axio didn't give himself away. Much to her relief, he went through the rest of the questions without arousing the overseer's suspicions. Craftsman Magna finished the questions and put the papers and board back under one arm. Follow me, he said sharply, turning on his heel. They followed close, their enforcer escort hovering ominously just behind them as they were marched down the street. Tessa remained alert, counting the buildings, examining the walls, trying to gauge the people they passed. The compound appeared entirely secure. There was one main entrance, but there were several service hatches through which labourers brought firewood, cinder sand and other necessities. Every exit was heavily guarded by armed enforcers. While the Silesiers were all wearing drab matching tunics and aprons in a sort of prison uniform, it appeared that support staff was all hired. They wore their own clothes, talked freely. Some wore forge glass to help them carry loads. Perhaps Tessa could get a message out through one of them. 
But to whom? Adriana was dead. Castora was besieged. The former would have been the better option, since they were already in Osa, but the latter might be able to smuggle them out or arrange the proper bribes. Of course, anyone she might contact might very well be unable to help them. Tessa needed to assume that, for the moment, she and Axio were on their own. As they were escorted across the compound courtyard, Tessa's gaze turned to a young man being dragged in the opposite direction. He wept violently, held under each arm by an enforcer, and Tessa found herself following his journey with morbid fascination. The back of the young man's tunic was ripped and bloody from a horrible flogging. Ah, Craftsman Magna explained, a failure. He didn't meet his quotas, and I'm afraid I have very little patience for laziness. Tessa risked speaking out of turn to ask, What will happen to him? He's going to the lumber camps. If he can't make god glass, then we'll put him to work in some other way. This way, please. Tessa was careful to keep her expression neutral, but she caught Axio's worried eye. She shook her head, hoping the gesture gave him some reassurance. The young man's weeping echoed in the back of her head as they were escorted to a door marked clearly as Furnace Number 3, where the room inside was instantly recognisable. An immense furnace took up the centre of the room, workstations radiating from it like spokes on a wheel. There was space for fourteen siliceas, far larger than any workshop in Grent. Most of the workstations were occupied, with a variety of men and women of all ages sweating badly as they navigated the heat. A few glanced up, eyeballing Tessa and Axio as the overseer led them around to the other side of the room to a pair of empty workstations. Each station was neatly prepared, tools set out, blue tubes and bit irons on an overhead rack, and a bedraggled plain apron hanging from a hook. Tessa breathed a sigh of relief when Craftsman Magna directed them to the two workstations. Working immediately next to Axio meant she could look out for him, instruct him, perhaps even cover for him. Craftsman Magna paused, glancing at them both, his eyes lingering briefly on Axio. Tessa hoped he could not see just how uncomfortable Axio looked standing in front of the workstation. He was, after all, accustomed to running and fetching, not to making god glass. Are these our workstations, sir? Tessa asked to bring the overseer's attention back to her once more. Indeed. Get to know them well, for you will be at them six days a week until the war is over. Craftsman Magna went on, droning through dozens of small rules and telling them where to find their mess hall and dormitory. Tessa half listened as she examined the rest of the furnace room, trying to get a feel for the people here. Their body language spoke of exhaustion and fear. No wonder. How far could they fall behind before they could expect a flogging? Or being sent to the camps? Lumber camps were notoriously dangerous places. An accident in the glassworks might end your career, but an accident at a lumber camp would take a limb or kill you outright. No one met her gaze. Shoulders remained hunched, eyes downcast. No one wanted to attract craftsman Magna's ire. She brought her full attention back to the overseer, as he said, Your daily quotas will be enforced. Finish them quickly, and you will be allowed to rest. Fail, and you will work all night. Fail continuously and you will be sent to the lumber camps. As he said this last part, he looked directly at Axio. Tessa swore silently to herself. Sweat poured from Axio's brow, and probably wasn't just from the heat. I'm sure we'll keep up, sir, she said. That cruel little smile flickered across his face again. See that you do. He inhaled sharply and checked one of the papers under his arm. Without another word, he turned on his heel once more and marched out of the furnace, leaving Tessa and Axio at their workstations, staring after him. She forced herself to focus, glancing surreptitiously around the room. Several of the Siliceas seemed to relax the moment the overseer was gone. A few glanced in her direction with varying amounts of interest. 
most kept themselves bent to their work. Aside from the shuffle of feet, the creak of furnace doors and the roar of the flames, there was very little sound. Only a handful of the Cilicias spoke to each other. The usual furnace banter, it seemed, did not exist. This place was a stifling, heartless labour camp, and was clearly meant to be. Tessa bent to scratch at her ankle. The schematics in her boot had been chafing her skin for the last day and a half, but now that they were gone, she felt the emptiness acutely. Tessa, Axio hissed, what do I do? Tessa took a deep breath and turned her attention on her workstation. Her tools were cheap and well-worn, but everything was here. Each workstation had clear access to the furnace, including a reheating chamber and a god funnel, used to direct heat at tiny pieces of god glass. There was already molten cinder sand in a crucible in the furnace, and on the workstation was a piece of paper with the day's date and her quota. She showed it to Axio, and he showed her his. They were the same. So much for getting him a lighter quota. I'm going to teach you to make god glass, she told him. How? The same I teach any apprentice. We can do this. Forge glass is the easiest thing to make. You've seen it done hundreds of times. I've never actually paid attention, Axio replied. His eyes were a little wild, his face pale. Then pay attention now. Tessa kept her tone calm, quiet, but firm. She took down bit iron, a four-foot rod, and set the end into the reheating chamber. Always heat the iron first, she told Axio. Then dip, like this. Once the iron was cherry red, she used it to gather molten cinder sand from the crucible inside the furnace. It was just a tiny dab, and she brought it to the steel plate on her workbench, where she began to manipulate it with a pair of heavy tweezers. Her movements were easy and fluid. These circumstances might be terrible, the equipment subpar and the workstation unfamiliar, but Tessa could do this kind of work blindfolded. Axio's nerves, on the other hand, seemed entirely shot. He was trembling, sweating, his eyes looking everywhere at once. If Tessa couldn't get him to focus, this wasn't going to work. Watch closely, she instructed. Axio shuddered deeply. He snatched down his bit iron, clutching it with both hands, still facing away from his own workstation. Tessa continued the task in front of her, rolling the small gather of god glass across the steel plate, adjusting it with her tweezers. She stopped once to hold the molten glass in front of the god glass funnel, operating a foot pedal to blow hot air up through the furnace and keep the god glass glowing. Back on her workbench, she bent over the tiny piece of molten cinder sand, listening for the soft resonance of sorcery. You do it like this. It might take you a few days, but you'll get the hang of it. Twirl, crimp, shape. Move the molten cinder sand around until you start to hear the hum of the sorcery, then slowly try and make that hum louder. If it goes away, undo the last thing you just did. If it fails, have no shame in giving up and starting over. You can reheat the piece at the funnel here, or discard it for a new one. Looking up to make sure Axio was paying attention, she saw silent tears streaming down his face. I can't do it, he whispered. You can, she shot back quietly. You're strong, Axio. You were strong enough to fight an Olsen soldier to give me time to escape. Lowering her voice even further, she reached deep down, stealing herself digging around in the anger and indignation she felt at her treatment. They attacked our home. They killed Eki. They shot Captain Jero. Now they're going to steal our labour and I will not stand for that. Understand? We're going to survive this place and escape. We're going to get through this. Together. Axio took a shaky breath. You really think we can? I know we can, but I need your help. I need you to be the strong man I know you are. Axio hesitated for a few moments and then gave her an uncertain nod. It would have to be good enough. Practice, 
she ordered him. You need to look like you're working. I'll try to cover for you until you can do these on your own. That meant twice as much work for her, and then sneaking finished pieces onto his tray. It wasn't going to be easy, and she had no idea how terrible the consequences would be if she was caught. She tried to keep all her uncertainties off her face. Escape did seem impossible. With Adriana Grappo dead, they had nowhere to go even if they did manage to flee the prison walls. She stopped herself. She couldn't afford to despair. She had to figure out how to get those schematics back from the overseer, and now she had the extra burden of Axio. She couldn't abandon either of these duties, nor would she. One step at a time. Chapter 12 It was Montego who picked up Tessa's trail, following scant rumours of a young woman walking north out of Grent alone. He explained his method and findings in brief, and though Demir couldn't be entirely confident that they had the right person, he knew all he could do was follow that thread until it either broke or proved fruitful. Within four hours of Montego's report, Demir stared across the cafe table at a diminutive woman sitting across from him. She wore a demure grey coat over her tunic, embroidered richly but not ostentatiously. She had light Pernian skin, an easy smile, and an affected calm manner that made her, at times, infuriating to deal with. Her name was Duala Jass, and she was one of the thousands of independent brokers who made their living setting up deals between guild families. It was just after dark in the assembly district, a humid chill seizing the night air and cutting through Demir's light jacket. The cafe courtyard was lit by gas lamps, casting shadows across Duala's face. I think it's your girl, Duala said. Tessa Falia, Demir confirmed, leaning back in his chair, trying not to look too eager. Dwala had served as his spy master while he was governor all those years ago. She might be a broker now, but she was damned good at moving around information. He'd been half tempted to send her after his mother's killers, but violence was where she ended her services. You're sure? As sure as I can be with the trail Montego was following, Dwala said, spreading her hands. A woman matching Tessa's description was filed into the Ivory Forest Glassworks this afternoon at three o'clock. Demir checked his pocket watch. It wasn't that far after six. How the piss did you find out already? Because the Ivory Forest Glassworks is a labour camp for Silesiers, and the Foreign Legion has a standing order to send any Grint Silesiers they capture directly there. She gave him a tight, self-satisfied smile. Tessa gave them a fake name, calling herself Teela, but I cross-checked with the records I had on hand, and there was no Teela at the Grant Royal Glassworks. It's either your girl or a damned big coincidence. Demir let out a relieved sigh. So he'd located her. That was step one. Step two. Does the labour camp know who they have? I doubt it. Ivory Forest is not a prestigious position, and is not run by clever people. All they care about is turning a profit off the back of prisoners of the state. So, how do I get her out before they realise they've got a genuine talent on their hands? That's more complicated, Duala replied. The Ivory Forest Glassworks is a government contract. It has exclusive rights for Cilicia prisoners within the Empire, her provinces and overseas colonies. They have very strict rules for how the prisoners are treated and how ransoms and prison sentences are dealt with. They are not going to let Tessa out of there until the war is over. Then I need to gain access. Who owns it? The Magna. Will they sell any shares? Absolutely not. Soupy Magna likes to keep it completely within the family. Demir drummed his fingers on the table next to his teacup saucer, considering his options. The easiest way to retrieve Tessa would be to buy up shares in the glassworks, get access to their books, 
and figure out the right people to bribe on both the Magna and the government sides of things. But that didn't seem to be an option. So how else could he gain access? Do you have a list of names of the people who oversee the glassworks? Dwyla's self-satisfied smile faded. That's harder to get with the Magna owners. They keep a pretty tight lid on things. I have the names of a few government secretaries involved, but that's it. She pulled a piece of paper out of her pocket and slid it across to him. Demi ran his eyes across the names, feeling irritated and glum, worried he'd hit another dead end, when his eyes fell on the name at the bottom of the page. It was a name he knew well. All right, he told her. I think that'll give me a good start. I'm sorry I can't help you more with that, Duala said. Is there anything else? The Stavry deal is going through, Demir asked, switching over from spy work to Duala's basic brokerage services. Yes, that lumber mill is yours. And the Prozotsi steelworks? Also yours. Good. Demir mentally filed through the dozens of deals he'd made in the 48 hours since returning to Osa, putting the cash he'd made fixing fights in the provinces into tangible money-making ventures that would enrich the grappo. His new investments avoided glassworks. The whole industry was about to fall apart, after all. Making all these deals made him realise something that he'd never really stopped to take stock of out in the provinces. He was rich. Not just as a guild family patriarch, but independently wealthy in a way that few people unsupported by dynastic wealth could claim. He'd gone out into the provinces with a handful of coins and a few cheap pieces of god glass, and he'd turned it into a fortune over nine years. Even with everything else, he could be proud of that, and he could use it in the trials to come. He mulled over this thought for a moment before moving on. I have a strange question. Are the major guild families acting out of character in their silic dealings? The cool look that Duala returned was almost answer enough. It was not, it seemed, the strange question at all. She leaned across the table. There are rumours. What kind? That all the major players are conducting a secret silic war? Nothing formal, mind you, but serious. They're buying up cinder sand, tripling their espionage efforts, even sabotage, though none that can be proved. They're trying to be the first to develop something, but what it is only the Silic Masters and the Guild family heads know. They were all trying to make a Phoenix Channel. It was the only logical leap that Demir could make. Those Masters and Matriarchs and Patriarchs would have access to the same sorts of information that Castora and Demir's mother had. They knew the cinder sand was running out, and they were scrambling to come up with a solution. Demir clicked his tongue and pulled out a few banknotes, weighing them down with his teacup. Fine. Let me know if anything changes. See if you can dig up something else on the ivory forest glassworks. Quietly. Of course. Thanks, Dwala. I'll be in touch. My pleasure, she answered. Before he could stand up, she reached across the table and touched the back of his hand. It's good to work with you again, Demir. Is it? You always pay on time, and you're never boring. I have few clients who can claim both of those things. It's good to see you too, Demir told her. Say hello to your adorable husband for me. The three of us should have dinner soon. He got up, kissing her on the forehead as he left. He walked out into the middle of the street, where he could see up and down the well-lit avenues of the assembly district. The streets were packed with dinner-time traffic, businessmen making last-minute deals before the year's end, assembly members chatting quietly about their next votes, young guild family scions flaunting their wealth at respectable establishments. Despite the deals he had put in motion to secure the future of his tiny guild family, he couldn't help but feel as if it would all be for nothing unless he could rescue Tessa from the ivory forest glassworks. He needed the schematics she was carrying and her expertise. If he got those, 
and if she was able to recreate the Phoenix Channel before anyone else finished theirs, well, the Grappo wouldn't be a tiny guild family anymore. He could save the Empire and get mind-blowingly rich at the same time. There were a lot of ifs in there, and that made him nervous. He still had to figure out how his mother's murder connected to all of this. Was it really the Grent? Was it a conspiracy? Did it have to do with the Phoenix Channel, or her reforms, or some deal gone bad? So many questions. With any luck, Kizzy would start answering them. In the meantime, he needed to be careful that no one got wind of Castora's Phoenix Channel. The moment they did, the Hyacinth would be crawling with Guild family's spies, saboteurs, and assassins. Montego's presence might keep them at bay for a while, but not indefinitely. Demir reached into his pocket for the list of secretaries Dwala had given him, then raised his hand for a hackney cab. The slag was often said to be the largest slum in all the world. Demir had seen bigger, but he'd never seen more miserable. Just down river and downwind of Glastown, he could taste the smoke from the glassworks on his tongue as he exited his cab. He'd gone less than two miles from the assembly district, but the world had changed completely. The streets here were trenches of mud, haunted by gangs, the darkness deep and impenetrable without those neat rows of gas lanterns. Beggars wallowed in the mud or fought over the few slices of dry sidewalk, and every surface was covered in a thick, tar-like film. You make a wrong turn, a voice asked, as Demir gathered his bearings. It belonged to a rough young man, leaning against the wall with three others about his age, crimson painted across the middles of their faces in a gang marking that Demir did not recognise. Demir glanced sidelong at them, his senses finding the closest glass window by pure instinct, and laid his left hand flat against his chest to display the glass dancer's sigil there. The young man who spoke gave out a slight gasp, his face turning an amusing shade of green. I'm sorry, sir, he said quickly, tripping over his own words. The other three took a long step back, as if to disassociate themselves from their friend. I just meant to offer you directions. Sure you did. Demir did not let him linger. Where's Harlan's place? The cab dropped me off too early. After a whispered conference, the four all pointed down the street in unison. Demir fished around in his pocket, found a piece of low-resonance forge glass, and tossed it to their leader. He could hear them fighting over it as he headed down the street, striding through the mud, pasting a look on his face that he hoped would discourage any more interruptions. He found Harland's two blocks down on the left, tucked between a pair of factories. It was a small door at the end of an alley, lit by a single gas lantern, the name of the establishment written in chalk across the alley wall. Demir stepped through the open door into one large, low-ceilinged room that reeked of cigarette and cigar smoke. It was poorly lit, but comfortable in a low-class sort of way. Demir flashed his guild family's sigil to the hulking enforcers standing just inside the door. They let him pass without comment. A handful of men and women lounged on cushions in the middle of the room, enjoying the mind-numbing effects of the little maroon pieces of day's glass in their earlobes. Demir found a short, fat goblin of a man wearing expensive clothes and with a tooth capped by low-resonance sight glass. He grinned at Demir, throwing his arms wide. Demi! Harlan, been a long time. I got your note yesterday. Placed all those bets for you. A thick wad of banknotes appeared in his hand as if by magic, and he tossed it to Demir. You keep winning like that, and people will get mad. Uh, it was just a lucky day, Demir replied, grinning back at Harlan. They'd known each other since Demir placed his first bet at the age of eleven. Harlan might not be upper-class material, but he never got greedy over the percentage Demir paid him. He did, Demir noticed, eyeball his glass dancer tattoo with some trepidation. Demir fought down his annoyance. An old business associate should know better. 
but he supposed that was the price of being a glass dancer. One more person just a little too nervous to be around him. I need a favour, he told Harlan. Anything for my friend? Does Lashari Pergos still place his bets with you? Of course. Does he still lose way more than he wins? Harlan smirked. Excellent. How much does he owe? A hundred and fifty-three thousand. Demir swore under his breath. Glass down, Lashari. That gambling habit had gotten bad. Good. Call in the debt. Oh? Harlan said, raising his eyebrows. Right now? At this very moment. Demi could see in Harlan's eyes that he was curious about this little development, but the bookie knew better than to ask too many questions. As much as Demi resented his status as a glass dancer, it did come in handy. I can do that. Oi, Geely, grab a piece of forge glass and run this note to the assembly offices right damned quick. As he spoke, Harlan scrawled out a note, which he then handed to one of his thuggish young guards. The woman took off, and Demir listened to her sprint down the muddy alley. He borrowed a piece of low-resonance day's glass from Harlan and threw himself onto one of the dirty cushions in the corner, enjoying the way the sorcery made him feel pleasant and tingly. He was there for less than half an hour when the thug returned, and ten minutes after her, a familiar face rushed through the door. Lashauri Pergos was a tall, thin man with a striking combination of olive skin and long, fire-red hair. He wore the colourful robes of an assembly clerk, and his pinky nails were painted crimson to show his allegiance to the magna. He was shouting as he entered. Harlan, I still have two weeks, damn it. I have my receipt right here. What kind of a business do you think you're running here? Two more weeks. Harlan turned to face him with a long-suffering expression of someone used to such tirades. I'm running my business. Debts get called in all the time, and I'm calling in yours. Demi removed his day's glass, immediately missing the pleasant feeling that came with it, and sauntered toward the pair. He leaned against a support column and removed the wad of banknotes from his pocket, holding it conspicuously in one hand. The showery continued to rail at Harlan. You can't call in my debts two weeks early. This is criminal. This is... He trailed off, slowly turning his head toward Demir as if finally registering his presence. Hi, Lech, Demir said with a grin. The Shauri stared at Demir for several moments, his face pale, looking like he'd seen a ghost. Demir? I heard you were back in town. Fancy us meeting in a place like this. Demir tossed the roll of banknotes into the air and caught it. Having trouble with something? Lachari's eyes followed the roll of banknotes. He licked his lips and Demir could see the thoughts turning behind his eyes. Yeah, he said slowly. Crazy meeting here. His eyes narrowed. You son of a bitch. You called in my debts, didn't you? I would never. But it sounds like you need some cash. I thought maybe we could help each other. The Chowry eyed Demi's banknotes greedily. And what do you want? Step into my office, Demi said, gesturing for the Chowry to follow him into the alley. Once they were alone, Demi slapped the Chowry on the shoulder. How are you? I heard you married a magna. I got a cushy job as an assembly clerk. Yeah, Lachari answered flatly. Demir searched his old friend's face, looking for all the telltale signs of a down-on-his-luck gambler. The worry lines, the exhaustion, the shifty eyes. Of course, Demir knew just how much Lachari owed to Harlan, and if Lachari's magna in-laws found out about his gambling problem, things wouldn't go well for him. Remember that play we wrote? Demir asked, allowing himself a moment of nostalgia. We were, what, thirteen? Visited every whorehouse on Glory Street trying to get actresses. They didn't take her genius seriously. 
Those were good days, Vichari agreed half-heartedly. What do you want, Demir? Demir feigned a surprised look. Well, now that you mention it, just get it out, Vichari said impatiently. I understand that one of your duties includes clerical oversight work for the Ivory Forest Glassworks. And how did you find that out? That's not important. Is it true? The showery kicked at a clod of mud underfoot. Yeah, it's true. I need information, Demir said. Lots of it. Every little scrap you can get me on the Ivory Forest Glassworks and piss let's say the entire Magna Guild family. I want bank records, prison records, enforcer rosters, family member dossiers. Lachari scoffed. You're joking, right? Not even slightly. I can't do that. If Soupy found out shit, even if my wife finds out I'm a dead man, they'll never find the body. Is that preferable to the pieces left behind by Harlan's goons? You're not going to pay off 150,000 Oza tonight, are you? You can't know that, Lashauri said defensively. Demir just stared at him until he began to fidget and said, Okay, so maybe I won't. I still have two weeks left. Harlan has to give me that much time. It's in our agreement. Can you get that much money in two weeks? No, didn't think so. Demir threw the roll of banknotes into the air and caught it again. Get me everything I just asked for, delivered to my hotel before breakfast tomorrow morning, and I'll pay off sixty grand. The Chowry's eyes bugged out. How the piss do you have access to that kind of cash? Demir held up the banknotes. There's fifty right here. The money meant nothing to him. It never really had. Greed had never been his vice a fact that had separated him from the rest of the Guild family scions at an early age. Glass dam, the Shabri muttered. He eyeballed those banknotes greedily. Demir almost had him, but he could see the hesitance in his eyes. I can't make copies of anything that quick. I'd have to give you originals. I don't care about the details. Do we have a deal or not? The Shabri's face contorted in faux pain. I... I just can't. I'd still owe Harlan a lot of money and... Seventy grand, Demir offered, cutting him off. And I'll ask Harlan to extend you a courtesy of four months on the rest of your debt. And I suppose no one will notice a few records going missing. The Magna family is huge, after all. Demir grinned at Lachauri. It's so good to see you, Lech. Lachauri made a noncommittal noise, which turned upward into a squeak, as Demir tossed him the roll of banknotes. He juggled the roll, finally got it in his grasp, and made it disappear into his pocket as deftly as a street magician. He was bought and paid for now. With any luck, he'd be able to get Demir the information he needed to mount a proper rescue attempt. Demir said, I'll pay the other twenty and get you that extension the moment I get those files. I'll be waiting at my hotel. Chapter 13 Kizzy had never met Churiondolani, but she'd seen him from a distance on several occasions. As a first cousin in the Dolani Guild family, he'd fallen into an overseer's job at a large lumber mill just outside of Osa, where he collected an immense salary, letting his more competent underlings do the entirety of his job for him. He was not smart enough to truly excel, not dumb enough to truly fail. He was, Kizzy reflected, a man who had gone far in life by being entirely average. It was a common story among the Osin elite. Kizzy tried not to think of the injustice of it all. It cost her two hours and a pittance of Demir's money, to find out everything she could possibly need to know about Turian, his hobbies, lovers, social groups. Kizzy then spent the rest of her evening waiting down the street from his Fulgaris society on Glory Street. Glory Street was a tiny little borough 
between the assembly district and the slag, dividing the richest of the rich from the poorest of the poor, and giving them a place to meet. Kizzy watched the second-rate Osin elite come and go, entertaining herself with fantasies of one day joining their lazy hedonistic lifestyle. It was a fantasy. Her father, one of the most powerful men in Osa, had publicly denounced the whole concept of legitimizing bastards. Without legitimization, she would never be anything but a favored enforcer, allowed to wear a smaller version of the Vorsian Silic sigil as a birthright, but having only a fraction of the other privileges that came with it. If she were to ever have children, they would have no Silic sigil of their own. Right now, she wasn't even favored. Her oldest half brother, Sibriel, hated her more than usual because she refused to lie to that magistrate. Father Vorsian was irritated at her. The chances of her surviving Father Vorsian's death and the ensuing power transfer had gone from slim to none. Kizzy spotted one of her own cousins, a 19 year old layabout wearing next to nothing, despite the cold and hanging on the arm of a powerful glass dancer go into the cockfighting arena that housed Turian's fulgurous society. Kizzy swallowed her irritation and checked her pocket watch. It was almost eight o'clock. The mild winter night was cool and dark, the street filled with the sound of chattering passers-by and clattering carriages. She blew on her hands to warm them. Few people so much as glanced in her direction. Bodyguards and low-level enforcers hung around, waiting for their wards to emerge from whatever whorehouse, gambling den or day's glass hotel they were enjoying. She nodded at an enforcer who raised his hand in greeting, then pulled the brim of her felt hat down closer to hide her face. It was just after nine when Churi and Dolani emerged from the cockfighting arena. He was a middle-aged man, tall, balding, and awkward with one hand crudely shoved up the back of the short tunic of the young woman next to him. She leaned into him, giggling in that obviously fake manner of a mistress who puts up with a lot because she has bills to pay. Kizzy waited for them to reach the end of the street and then detached herself from the shadows to follow. It was not a long walk, just five blocks to one of the nicer tenement buildings on the edge of the assembly district. Churian had two mistresses and a mister, and he brought them all to the same apartment. It was, as far as these things went, rather tasteless, but it made Kizzy's job a lot easier. She watched them go inside, waited five minutes, and then approached the doorman. Excuse me, she said, raising one hand. The side door of the building is wide open. I can't imagine anyone will be happy for the cold. The doorman swore quietly. Every damn day. I even put up a sign, he complained. Sorry. She replied with a sympathetic smile. I figured you'd want to know. My own doorman was dismissed for such a breach. I thought it was unfair, but a magna owned my building, and you can't argue with them. Thanks, he replied. He glanced in both directions, seemed to decide no one needed his help for the moment, and then hurried around the corner. Kizzy slipped inside the tenement the moment his back was turned. Kizzy walked with purpose chin raised and eyes confident, an excuse on her tongue in case anyone questioned her presence. She found Turian's apartment and stopped outside to check that she was prepared. Her stiletto was hidden underneath her jacket, along with a pistol just in case, and Demi's shackle glass was still in her cork-lined pocket. Putting one ear to the door, she listened until she was certain that the pair inside were occupied. She often wondered what other pathway she might have followed. What if she hadn't tried to blackmail that professor her first year at university? She might be off in the provinces, running a winery, with her choice of provincial misters and mistresses. She sighed to herself and removed three small, square, regular glass beads from her pocket. No point in ruminating over past mistakes. At least she was listening to idiots have sex instead of slitting the throats of gang members. She could thank Demir for that tiny step up for the moment. She knelt beside the door, holding the three beads in her palm and focusing. A minor talent in glass dancing was not considered valuable, 
certainly not one worth adoption into a great guild family, and the respect, fear, and authority that came with it. Still, she found it had its uses. The beads rose up into the air, moving forward as a clump into the lock. A drop of sweat sprang to her forehead as she manoeuvred the beads around inside the lock's mechanism, putting three different amounts of pressure on the tumblers until they finally clicked. Within the minute she was inside the apartment, closing the door gently behind her and walking softly across the wooden floor. She ignored the sounds of the liaison in the bedroom and did a quick sweep. It was a simple place with vaulted ceilings, a few cheap pieces of art on the walls, and gas lanterns. She turned all but one of the lanterns down and found a chair that looked at the bedroom. This wait felt longer than the one outside the club, though in reality it couldn't have been more than forty-five minutes. Kizzy held her stiletto in one hand, resting her head against the chair, lounging in the dim light until the mistress emerged from the bedroom. The young woman paused briefly at the sight of her, then closed the bedroom door behind her. She had her clothes clutched to her chest, and her makeup was smeared. Is he asleep? Kizzy asked quietly. The mistress nodded. Is everything as we agreed? You won't kill him. He's not evil, just... She trailed off, as if even she wasn't sure why she cared about Turian's survival. I won't kill him, Kizzy promised, removing a wad of banknotes from her pocket and placing it on the table next to her. It was enough money to pay several months' rent on an apartment like this, or several years on a place in the slag. The young woman plucked it up, regarding Kizzy warily, then crouched in the corner of the sitting room to pull on her tunic and jacket. She was soon gone, leaving Kizzy alone in the apartment with the soft sound of snoring. Kizzy entered the bedroom, looking down at the slovenly guild family arsehole sleeping nude under a sheet that left little to the imagination. His breathing was heavy, indicative of a deep sleep, and she very carefully slid the shackle glass through one of Turian's piercings. Shackleglass was not a violent sorcery, and his body didn't so much as twitch at the feel of it. Sure that everything was prepared, she shoved Turian's own undergarments into his open mouth. That woke him up, and she stood above him and watched him flail and grunt for several moments before giving him very specific instructions. You are to remain still. Do not speak unless to answer a question. Do you understand? Kizzy turned up the gas lantern above the bed. She could see in Turian's eyes that his panic was warring with the sorcery of the shackle glass. Eventually, the sorcery won out. His expression became one of frightened acceptance, and he nodded in response to her question. Low resonance shackle glass was known to make people suggestible and truthful. It was commonly given to convicts and prisoners, and sometimes to the house staff of particularly paranoid or cruel guild families. High resonance shackle glass forced the wearer to tell any truth and obey any command. The piece that Demir had given Kizzy was medium resonance, and it would be perfect for her needs. She removed the undergarment from Turian's mouth, sitting on the bed next to him. What is your name? Turian Dolani, he answered fearfully. What is your most embarrassing secret? His eyes widened, but he answered immediately. I once let out a fart at a fancy dinner party. Who came out with it? I blame the dog. Kizzy rubbed at her nose to cover her smile. Well, the shackle glass definitely worked. She tugged on the gloves, hiding her silic sigil. Do you recognize me? she asked. No, he answered. Good. Did you participate in the murder of Adriana Grappo? Turian's eyes grew wide. He began to tremble, struggling as if against invisible ropes, his body unwilling to disobey Kizzy's direct command. His mouth opened, closed, then opened again as he fought the sorcery. He chewed on his tongue, not enough to bite it off, but enough to draw blood. Kizzy lost patience and pulled out her stiletto, pressing it against his throat for added incentive. Did you 
participate in the murder of Adriana Grappo? She asked again, more forcefully. Y- y- yes Chirion answered. Kizzy gazed down at him, frowning. Well, damn. She had expected this answer. The breadman seemed like a reliable witness, but she still didn't like it. But why did you do it? Chirion licked his lips, glancing over Kizzy's shoulder as if to search the room for help. Sweat poured off his brow. Finally, he said, I was ordered to by my grandmother, Elia Dolani. That's it? Kizzy asked. You were ordered to? You don't say no to Elia. Elia was the matriarch of the Dolani guild family and widely considered a sadist. Saying no to her was akin to saying no to Father Vorsian, except she would kill you herself rather than have an underling do it. Kizzy's uneasiness grew. If the Dorlani were behind the killing and word got out, it could start a guild family war. They had enough enemies, and the tiny Grappo guild family was well liked enough that it wouldn't take but hours before enforcers were gunning each other down in the streets. Do you know why she wanted Adriana dead? I don't, I... Chirion hesitated and spat out. I didn't want to. I didn't even know, Adriana. Why would I kill her? But Grandmother said to. So you followed orders, Kizzy sighed. That was not nearly as good a lead as she'd hoped. It wasn't like she could slip into the Dolani estate and do something similar to Aelia. Hiss even asking to see Aelia would raise suspicions among both the Dolani and her own family. The other killers... Were they also ordered there by your grandmother? I don't know. Guess. Chirion's eyes twitched. The blanket beneath him was soaked with sweat now. I don't think so. Why not? We met anonymously, just before the killing. Everyone was wearing masks. I recognized one of them. My grandmother would not have sent a Magna for a public killing. A cold finger seemed to creep up Kizzy's spine. A Grent agent, a Dolani, and a Magna. Glass damn, this was a conspiracy. Conjectures began flying around inside her head, and it took all her willpower to silence them so that she could properly work. Who was it? Chirion had stopped trembling. He was nothing but resignation now, his whole body looking slack and exhausted from trying to fight the shackle glass. Glissandi Magna. Another guild family cousin. Kizzy chewed on her lip, considering. Don't move, she ordered Chirion, withdrawing to the sitting room where she could pace and think. Was this a real conspiracy? Were the guild families and the Duke of Grent somehow working together? Had Capric lied to Demir about that captured Grent agent? It all seemed so impossible, but so did the idea that agents from three major powers had come together for the murder. Kizzy vacillated on what to do next. While Churian was considered little more than a bureaucratic nobody within his own family, Glissandi had actual power within the Magna. She was as close to the main family as was possible without being an actual daughter. Fiercely independent, quite rich, and with connections all over Osa, Glissandi would be a difficult target. But it was also Kizzy's best lead. She walked to the door. You definitely didn't recognize anyone else? She asked. I didn't, I swear, came the answer. This was becoming more dangerous by the minute. Once again, Kizzy found herself wondering if she should just return Demir's money and swear off the job. Just a day and a half had passed. She could probably back out. If she did, the question of what had actually happened would haunt her for the rest of her life. What's more, she would miss her chance at reconnecting with Montego. Something else about this whole thing was bothering her. Assuming Capric was telling the truth about the Grent agent, then at least two of the six killers were patsies. They were killers but not conspirators. Neither of them knew why Adriana Grappo needed to die. Glissandi might. Kizzy tossed her stiletto up into the air 
and caught it deftly by the blade between two fingers. Glissandi Magna. She would be difficult to corner alone, but not impossible. Certainly easier than Aelia Dolani. She forced herself to stop worrying. The politics wasn't part of her job. All she had to do was get the facts back to Demir. If he wanted to start a guild family war, that was his problem. Kizzy would have to hide her involvement in all this from her family. But if they somehow found out, then she would have plausible deniability. They were, after all, the ones who loaned her out to the grappo. She returned to the bedroom once more and tapped Chirion's bare chest with the flat of her stiletto blade. I'll give you two choices, she said. You can either sell all your worldly possessions by noon tomorrow and board the next ship to Marne, or I can tell baby Montego that you took part in the killing of his adopted mother. Which do you choose? The trembling returned and Kizzy quickly caught a whiff of the scent of piss. I'll leave, Churian said. I'll be gone. I... I won't talk to another soul. I won't even sell anything. You'll never see me again. Satisfied with the answer, Kizzy leaned over and plucked the shackle glass from Turian's ear. If you try to follow me, I'll kill you. If you try to find out who I am, I'll kill you. I'd lay there for a few minutes after I'm gone if I were you. I promise that if you haven't disappeared by noon tomorrow, baby Montego will be visiting you by dinner. She left that threat, letting herself out of the apartment and then leaving by the same side door that she tricked the doorman with earlier. It was around ten o'clock. Perfect time to get a drink. She would need it if she was going to figure out how to fit the next piece of this puzzle without getting murdered by Glissandi Magna's bodyguards. Chapter 14 The Chowry was true to his word, and by morning... Demir's office was filled with files on the ivory forest glassworks. He enlisted Brennan, Montego, and even the hotel's master at arms, Tirana Kirkovic, to comb through everything. He did not tell them why they had to extract Tessa, just that it needed to be done. He could afford little time, and he himself focused on the owners of the ivory forest glassworks. I don't mean to complain. Tirana said quietly after several hours of reading, comparing notes and discarding useless information. But do you do this sort of thing a lot? Demir flipped through the documents in front of him, what looked like internal Magna spymaster reports on their own family members, and was amazed that Lachauri had even gotten his hands on them, let alone handed them over. He must have been terrified of Harlan. When needed, he answered. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see Tirana grimace down at yet another ledger outlining the glassworks financial records. Oh, that's, uh... A waste of time? Demir guessed. I was trying to come up with a more polite way of saying it. When I was young, Demir explained, I had a very particular method. I would gather every single piece of information I could get my hands on, then use high-resonance wit glass to analyse it. I could fully understand this much content in about 90 minutes, taking into account the fact that I'd have to remove the wit glass periodically for my own safety. Tirana's eyes widened, though it hadn't been Demir's intention to show off. You did all this by yourself? she asked. That's what happens when you get a genius who wasn't driven mad by high-resonance wit glass. Montego rumbled. His own stack of missives and reports had been set aside so he could read the morning newspaper. He held a large glass of wine in one hand, his fourth of the morning, though he showed no effect of intoxication. Demir allowed himself a demure smile. That was before I... broke at Holocan, he said, tapping the side of his head. I still like to use the same method, but it takes much, much longer. And this is really useful? Tirana asked. Demir said, The more you know, the better you can plan. Primary plans, secondary plans, tertiary plans, 
plans for failed plans, plans for the failed plans of failed plans. Information is not just useful, it is everything. He glanced at Serana. You think I didn't look into you within hours of our meeting? I memorised your military record and everything I could find about your personal life. Tirana glanced sidelong at Brennan, but the Major Domo just shook his head. Deme could read that silent message. Get used to it, he's in charge now. She said, You couldn't have possibly memorised everything about me. Everything I could find, Demir answered, flipping to the next document and running his eyes over it. Oh yeah? How could... You were engaged to Sandri Vorsian for six months. You both seemed happy with the match, but Johanna Vorsian cancelled the marriage at the last minute because she didn't want Sandri marrying a woman, despite how well that would have worked out for two non-inheriting granddaughters. Some bullshit about wanting proper great-grandchildren and not adoptees. Tirana gasped and half stood, her hand going to her sword. That is not public information. Demi immediately felt a stab of guilt. That time he was showing off. He rubbed his eyes and gestured for her to sit. I apologise. I took that too far. He glanced at Tirana and saw that her shoulders had slumped as she fell back into her chair. I joined the army because of that, Tirana said quietly. Demir's guilt grew deeper. He tried to stave it off. He did, after all, have more important things to worry about than hurt feelings. Again, I apologise. Information is very important to me. The world is a great big calculation. I did not keep you on when I returned because my mother hired you or because your grandfather and I are friends. I kept you on because everything about your history showed an independent but loyal woman I could depend on to guard my hotel. Tirana glanced up at him shyly. You're not just saying that? No. Now read that glass damned ledger to look for more information we can use to rescue Tessa. Demir rubbed his eyes again. I think I may have something. Brennan, how long will it take you to find Yulina Magna? Thirty minutes. Do it. Brennan left the room with a nod, stepping carefully through the stacks of documents. Deme continued his studies until the Major Domo returned. She's at the Castle Hill Arena, Brennan reported, enjoying the afternoon fights in her private box. Demir selected a few pages from the spymaster reports and stuffed them in his tunic pocket for further study. He plucked up a newspaper, found the arena schedule, and grabbed his jacket. I used to be very good at layered plans, he told Tirana. I may have lost that skill, but let us hope I'm still good at primary plans. Now I must go introduce myself to a magna. Baby, I will need your help. Montego folded his newspaper and joined Demi without a word, and they left Brennan and Tirana in the office, hurrying down to the lobby where a carriage was prepared for them in minutes. They were soon trundling down the road at speed. It was Montego who broke the silence. Why are we confronting Yulina Magna at the Castle Hill Arena? he asked. He didn't seem particularly bothered by the prospect of meeting a magna, Montego was hard to ruffle at the worst of times, but he leaned forward curiously. Demir showed Montego what he'd been studying back in his office. This, he explained, is a spy master report on Yulina Magna. She's one of 47 Magna grandchildren. She's 28, by all reports, quite pretty and charming, and she owns a 16% share in the Ivory Forest Glassworks. Montego took the document from Demir and studied it, his beady eyes darting across the page rapidly, his expression growing thoughtful. He handed it back. Looks like a lot of funds enter and leave her personal bank account every month. Hundreds of thousands at a time. Exactly. Could be debts, could be corruption, could be gambling. We need to find out what and then use it. Demir tapped the paper against his cheek. 
I think Yulina is exactly what we need to save Tessa. Do you have a plan? Sort of. I might have to wing it. Montego rolled his eyes. The old Demir always had five plans. I'm not the old Demir, Demir answered. Montego waved his hand as if to concede the point. Their carriage rumbled across the assembly district and up Castle Hill, soon depositing them at the base of the old castle that had long been gutted and converted into a cudgelling arena. A massive sign hung over the gate, declaring that the arena was sponsored by the Glass Top Cudgelists, a popular fulgurist society for retired athletes. Demir loosened his jacket collar, tousled his hair, and prepared a thick wad of banknotes. He needed to look like someone who attended early afternoon cudgelling matches on a regular basis. I'm sorry, sir, a porter said as Demir exited the carriage, but the arena is full for the afternoon. No more entry. Demir had never wanted to use the phrase, do you know who I am, so much in his life. Instead, he peeled several banknotes off his wad and pushed them into the front pocket of the porter's tunic. You're sure? The porter gave Demir a regretful smile. I'm sure I... His eyes widened as Montego exited the carriage, nearly tipping it over onto himself as he stepped on the running board. Montego put one hand on the porter's shoulder and tripled the amount Demir had tipped him. Baby Montego and Demir Grappo, Montego rumbled. Surely you can find some room for a retired world champion and his friend. Oh, oh, of course, sir. Let me see what I can do. He scurried off without another word, leaving Demir to gaze after him ruefully. Did I undertip? Demir asked. No, you're not a dues-paying member. Montego nodded to the sign over the front gate. You may have the run of the provincial cudgelling arenas, but there's a different language spoken in Osa. Do I have to eat to you to gain your powers? Demir asked flippantly. You'd have to eat me to get this big. There he is. Come on. Demir fell back, allowing Montego to cut a path through the crowd. Those that didn't move out of the way were gently but forcibly pushed to one side, and Demir could hear a trail of whispers in their wake as they passed. Holy shit, one woman said. Is that baby Montego? I had no idea he was back in town, a man replied. Do you think he'd sign an autograph? Piss on an autograph, another woman cut in. What hotel is he in? I've heard he's an absolute monster in... Demir chuckled to himself as they met up with the porter, who led them down a narrow hallway, leaving the whispers behind them. Montego had a point. Demir was famous in his own right, but in a cudgelling arena, Montego was a god. You found a place for us? Montego asked the porter. Yes, sir. It's not a perfect view, but if you make arrangements for next time, we will absolutely clear a box for you. They emerged from the hallway into the back of a packed crowd in the courtyard of the old castle. The actual cudgelling ring was on a raised platform in the centre of the courtyard, with some tiered seating on the east side, boxes built haphazardly into the north and west walls, and more people watching from a handful of windows and lining the tops of the castle walls. The porter led them to a spot about halfway between the walls and the ring. As he'd said, it was not a good position to see the actual match, but Demir barely glanced toward the ring. He scanned the walls, windows and boxes, searching for a woman in her late twenties. He found one, but she was a Nasud blonde. He kept looking until he spotted an eager-looking woman staring down toward the ring from the window of the corner tower. The porter shoved people aside until there was room for Montego and Demir, then stationed himself at Montego's shoulder with the clear intent of someone who's ready to serve and plans to make some very good tips doing it. Demir hadn't been to a proper Osan cudgelling match for over a decade, but Montego acted as if this was all to be expected. Even when people began edging away from him, staring in wonder, he didn't really seem to notice. Why is it so crowded? 
Montego asked. Special exhibition match, the porter shouted above the noise of the crowd. Do you know Fedori Glostovica? The Balkany champion, Demir asked. I didn't see his name on the schedule. Oh, he's the very last match, the porter said. Everyone packs in here will watch the whole afternoon just to get a glimpse of him. Very exciting. He might have even been a match for you in your heyday, Master Montego. Montego grunted noncommittally, but Demi could see the way his eyes narrowed. Perfect. Demi didn't like going into these things on so little information, but he could use this. Who's his sponsor? Demir asked. That would be the Magna. Oh, I haven't spoken to any of them since I returned to town. Is anyone here to watch the match? Lady Yelena Magna, the porter answered, pointing up at the tower Demir had already suspected was Yelena's private box. She's here almost every day. Demir turned toward Montego, feigning surprise. Weren't you just saying you wanted to meet Yulina? That I was, Montego replied, playing along. The porter made a tutting sound. I'm afraid Lady Yulina doesn't like being disturbed during the match, is I? Montego leaned over suddenly, putting his arm around the porter's shoulder as if to take him into his confidence. He said, I have heard Yulina is very pretty. My friend and I would very much like to meet her, if you could arrange it, as a personal favour to me. The porter's face went red. Of, of course, he stuttered. Master Montego, I'll do what I can. Once again he hurried off and Montego turned to Demi with that same smirk. I've still got it. Of course you've still got it, you big oaf, Demi responded. Your glass dams, baby Montego. Can you see a damn thing? Enough to see that both the men fighting right now will never get further than regional exhibition bouts. Ah, is the quality in the capital slipping so much? Demir stood on his tiptoes, trying to get a view of the arena. He could see the fighters' heads moving back and forth, the occasional raised cudgel, and nothing else. He gave up and waited for the porter to return. The young man was back soon, looking very pleased with himself, and shouted to be heard. Lady Yelena has graciously offered to share her box with you today. This way, please. Demir allowed himself a flicker of a smile. Perfect. Once again Montego ploughed through the crowd, cutting a path that Demir followed gladly. They were taken back the way they came, through a series of narrow passages, and then up an original stone spiral staircase that Montego barely fit through. They arrived at the box to find what looked like Yulina's entourage standing outside, pushed out to make room for Montego and Demir. The small group wore unhappy glares that were immediately replaced with surprise. It is him. Montego, I saw your last fight. I can't believe it's you. Hands reached out, touching Montego as he passed. One of the young women actually swooned while the men stared in awe and fear. None of them objected as Montego entered the box. Demi gave them a smile as he shut the door to the box behind them. Yelena Magna was a statuesque woman, well over six feet tall, with long, curly black hair that cascaded over a crimson and white tunic. She spun away from her view as Demir and Montego entered, somehow managing to sweep across the narrow box. My dear Master Montego, what a pleasure it is to meet you. I cannot believe my luck. Lady Yelena, Montego responded, grasping Yelena's hand in his and kissing it gently. My friend, Demir Grappo. Ah, the new patriarch of the Grappo Guild family. A double pleasure indeed. Yelena's tone cooled noticeably upon greeting Demir, her eyes giving him a quick up and down and a silent judgment that indicated she did not think much of either him or his minor Guild family. Her gaze dipped toward his glass dancer sigil, 
the corner of her eye twitching. Demi pretended not to notice. Her smile remained warm through it all, and she quickly turned back to Montego. Demi did not mind. He didn't need attention right now. He needed to observe. The box was small, with just six seats all crammed in together. Yelena deposited herself between them, leaning against Montego's arm, pointing down to the cudgelling ring below them. The last fight had just finished, and Demi could see the two new fighters preparing themselves while blood was mopped up. He settled in to watch, glancing through the newspapers available in the box as well as a pamphlet printed up by the arena for the day's fights. He'd heard the names of several of the fighters. No one of particular skill or fame, but men and women who put on a good enough show to get fans into seats. Fidori Glostovica was clearly the draw for most of the crowd. Yulina talked non-stop, seemingly without bothering to take a breath, a constant stream of anecdotes that were interrupted only by demands for food or drink from the attending porter. Montego danced through the conversation skillfully, interjecting witticisms and occasionally challenging her knowledge of the sport. This was clearly not the first wealthy young fan that he'd watched a cudgelling match with. Only one thing broke up the conversation, and that was when Yulina ordered a second porter to run to the bookie in the arena foyer to make bets on her behalf. The bets were rapid fire, sometimes contradicting a previous bet with even more money as the fight wore on. She discussed each decision with Montego in detail, occasionally changing her bet upon his advice. Demi remained silent, studying and thinking, and it was by the fourth match that Yulina excused herself for a moment, stepping just outside the door to the box to berate one of her porters. You seem to be getting along well? Demir commented. Montego shrugged. She's quite knowledgeable, but too arrogant for my tastes. Do you have a plan yet? I believe I do, Demir replied. Do you remember that little con we used to do when we were kids? Montego snorted. Of course. How do you feel about resurrecting it? Here? Are you serious? If I can make it work, yes. I'm not properly dressed. If you were, the con wouldn't work. Montego considered this for a moment. The last time we did it, we were chased out of the Black Tree Arena by six angry bookies and their enforcers. We gave fake names. This was before you were famous. We're both famous now. If we get caught... Demir nodded in understanding. If they were caught, he would lose what little standing he had with the other guild families. The cudgelling league would begin to tail him, and his whole operation throughout the provinces could be at risk. Considering that that operation was funding his above-board purchases for the grappo, it was a dire risk indeed. But he needed access to the ivory forest glassworks immediately. Let's do it, he finally said. Fine. Yelena reappeared a moment later, another drink in her hand. The porter was being too slow she explained sweetly. So I sent her to be flogged. Are we about to start yet? Yelena, Demir said, raising a hand. Hmm? She turned to him as if only just remembering that he was here. Yes, Demir. I'm getting the gambling itch. Huh? Of course you are. Please, feel free to make use of my runner. I don't want to get involved with bookies so soon after returning to the capital, how about a friendly wager between you and me? Yulina regarded him for a moment, looking at him closely for the first time in the last hour. What did you have in mind? I don't know the next fighters, but I'm feeling lucky. Who do you favour? It'll be close, but I think Blago. Then I'll take Wasti. A thousand dozo? Yulina's face split in a grin. If she feared his glass dancer tattoo, she had now forgotten all about it. You're on. The fight went much as Demir expected. He did, in fact, know both of the fighters. Blago had been indirectly on his payroll several years ago, and though Blago was older and losing energy, it was an easy win for him. 
Deme pulled out his wad of banknotes and peeled off ten of them as the match ended with Wasti's forfeit. Good fight, good fight, he said to Yelena. When she reached for the money, he pulled it back slightly. Give me the chance to win it back? Yelena's attention had shifted from Montego now. She smiled slyly at Demir. Double or nothing, I'll give you the choice of fighter. He had her now. Demir won the next match and then lost the following three, then won another. Yelena sent one of her entourage to the closest bank and a hefty stack of banknotes began to build on one of the empty seats in the box. Montego looked on in bemusement, refusing to participate in the betting despite Yulina's repeated invitations. By the eighth fight, Demir's blood was pumping and his mouth was dry. Over 200,000 Ozo had bounced between them, and even he had not guessed that it would escalate so quickly. He looked at the schedule. Just one more fight. The exhibition match between Fidori and a local champion that Demir did not know. Demir reached for the pile of money. Uh-uh, Yulina said, slapping his hand playfully. What do you think you're doing? Collecting my winnings. There's still one more match. Demir laughed and shook his head. Fedori is on the Magna payroll, and for good reason. I've been having fun, but I'm not going to bet against him. Oh, please, Yulina pouted. Demir pretended to consider, then shook his head again. Not a chance. I'll give you good odds. Again he hesitated. No, I'd be a fool. Yelena glanced down at the pile of money. From her personal ledgers, Demir knew that she won and lost piles like this on a monthly basis, but it was still a lot of money. A very tempting pot for anyone, no matter how rich. Suit yourself, I suppose, she sighed. She managed to maintain her composure, but Demir could see the frustration in her eyes. Preparations were made for the last match. The crowd was noticeably excited, pointing and waving, screaming Fedori's name as he strolled out among them and entered the ring. He was truly a specimen, almost as tall as Montego. Light skin, sun-bronzed, muscles oiled. He held a cudgel in one hand and a bouquet of flowers in the other, which he threw to the audience as he gained the ring. Demir glanced sidelong at Montego, who rolled his eyes. He stole that from me, Montego grumbled. Yelena was noticeably muted, though still a gracious host. She leaned forward, putting in an extra-large bet with the arena bookie, no doubt hoping to recoup some of the losses she'd made to Demir. Instead of putting his winnings in his pockets, Demir left them on the chair beside him. Yelena glanced in their direction every so often. The fight was, he had to admit, very good. Fidori and the local champion sparred back and forth across the ring with astonishing speed and strength, blows connecting that would have felled normal fighters. You're sure you won't bet? Yelena asked Demir. The local chap is doing quite well. Demir waved her off, and it was a good thing too. The local fighter was soon bashed across the shoulder, staggering to one side and failing to protect himself as Fedori wailed on his useless arm. He fell to one knee, clearly trying to signal the referee for a forfeit. Come on now, Montego roared, leaping to his feet. End the fight! It was his first display of real investment the whole afternoon. The referee scrambled into the ring, pushing Fedori back while the local fighter was quickly carried away. Montego turned to Demir red-faced. That was not a good fight. Oh, don't be like that, Yulina said dismissively. You've killed dozens of fighters in the ring. I never swing once the forfeit signal is given. He didn't signal. He was trying to. Always give a fighter the chance to back out. That's good sportsmanship. Fidori only does that with fighters he considers worthy, Yulina laughed. Demir pushed his way between them. Hey, hey, it was a good fight. Sit down, baby. That fighter will be good to go after a week on Kyoglas. Montego rumbled angrily to himself as he sat down, and Demir could tell it was not an act. 
I'm sorry, Deme said to Yulina. He feels very strongly about these things. Hmm, Fedori is at the top running for champion next year. Unofficially, of course. The season hasn't begun. He's not that good, Montego snapped. Ah, he's incredible. Don't be sore. Fedori has a long career ahead of him. I bet he could have even beaten you in your heyday. It was the second time someone had said that, and was the moment Demir had been waiting for. You really think so? He turned to Yelena curiously. Yes, most certainly. Demi pretended to think hard about this, letting a grin sneak its way onto his face. All right. I'll give you the chance to win your money back. In another match, here and now, Montego against Fidori. Yulina gasped. You're kidding. Not at all. Baby, how are you for a fight? I don't have my cudgels, Montego complained. He drew out the words like a petulant child, though Deme could practically feel how badly Montego wanted to put the younger fighter in his place. Yulina practically leapt at him. We can get you cudgels. Oh, this will be the most glorious match of the century. And all for just us. We'll clear the arena, pay off the manager, old champion against future champion. She actually squealed, an ecstatic sound that made Demir's ears hurt. Let the audience stay, Montego rumbled. Give them a show. Of course. Whatever you want to make this happen. What will you bet? Demir asked. Cash, just tell me the amount. Come now, let's make it interesting. I have a new lumber mill I just purchased the other day. Put down some property. Demir spoke casually, but every inflection was purposeful and chosen with care. He wanted to pull her in like a master fisherman, not scare her away. From her file, he knew exactly what property she had. I could put down a mine in Fortshire, she said. What kind? Copper. Done. How will we validate? Yulina gestured dismissively as if she'd done this many times. The manager and porters will be our witnesses, and Montego, of course. The arrangements were made in a secret whirlwind. The arena manager was paid off, a new referee summoned, and the porters cleared a large area immediately in front of the ring so that Demi and Yulina could watch from the very best seats. There was an announcement about the surprise fight, and Demir could feel the excitement ripple through the crowd. People who'd grown tired from standing all afternoon were back on their feet, cheering and laughing at the prospect of seeing baby Montego step into the ring once more. Demir consulted with Montego while Yulina did the same with Fidori. Montego did not, Demir had to admit, look great. In a cudgeling girdle, he seemed even more obese, his arms flabby his stomach drooping. Montego reached down and touched his toes while Demir eyeballed Fidori. You are, Demir asked quietly, his words almost drowned out by the roar of a re-energized crowd. Sure you can win? Eh? Montego responded. What the piss is that supposed to mean? He is actually quite skilled, Montego admitted. It will be a good fight. Even if you lose. Even if I lose. Demir groaned. Please don't. Aside from the money, this is our best chance to rescue Tessa. Montego didn't answer him, pulling himself up onto the raised ring and taking a few experimental swings with his cudgel. Fidori watched him sceptically, and so did Demir. Montego was not a young cudgelist anymore, many years retired, and Demir wondered if he'd made a mistake. A forge glass was handed to both men. Montego examined his distastefully before fixing it to his ear, and the match began slowly, the pair circling each other. There was no time limit, and the crowd did not seem to care. It was clear both fighters wanted this to happen in its own time. Demir took up a spot beside Yulina and glanced at the arena manager who held a promissory note for both properties and the pile of cash from earlier. You really think Fedori could beat baby Montego in his prime? Demir asked Yulina. Well, Yulina said, 
watching intently as the first blows were exchanged. Perhaps not in his prime, if I'm being honest. But now, look at Montego. Your friend can barely move his cudgel without wheezing. Demi resisted the urge to defend Montego. It wasn't that bad. On the other hand, he couldn't actually tell whether Montego was acting as he barely blocked a flurry of blows from Fidori. The Balkany champion pressed the attack, putting Montego on the back foot, hammering at his thighs and shoulders mercilessly. Montego took the beating without so much as a groan of pain. His own reposts were slower, stronger. When they landed, they certainly staggered the younger Fidori, but they did not put him down. Up the bet? Yulina asked slyly. Demi responded with a negative gesture. Two to one odds, Yulina said. Demi let her hang herself on that rope. How could you possibly back up a bet like that? he asked. Fidori was practically chasing Montego around the ring now. On any other day, it would be a good fight. It was always fun when an outmatched fighter refused to back down. But for a world champion, it was comically pathetic. I have a 16% stake in the Ivory Forest Glassworks. It's a big complex just outside of Ursa. I'll put down my whole stake. And what would I have to answer that with? Let's say 400,000. Fine. A coal mine in the glass aisles. He glanced at the manager and the accompanying porters who nodded that they'd heard the bet. Montego stumbled and fell heavily to one knee. The crowd screamed, some in jubilation, some in anger. A group of women just behind Demir shouted for Montego to get back up. He managed to get his cudgel up between his face and Fidori's, but the barrage of blows was so withering it looked like he might drop it. Forfeit, Montego, Fidori shouted between blows. There's no shame in it. I don't want to kill you in an exhibition match. Montego's arm drooped, but he did not go down. Fidori backed away a step and glanced at Yulina. He won't forfeit. Then finish him. In that moment, Montego's eyes met Demir's. Demir gave the slightest of nods, and Montego took a deep breath. Fidori turned back toward him and raised his cudgel. Last chance, old man. He waited half a second, then swung with all his might. Montego surged to his feet, catching the haft of the cudgel in his left hand. With his right, he swung low, the weighted bulb of his cudgel catching Fidori on the side of the knee. It did not look like a powerful swing, but it was impossibly precise. Fidori's knee shattered sideways, collapsing unnaturally in a way that almost made Demir throw up. Fidori fell, screaming loudly. Those screams were immediately swallowed up by the crowd who went absolutely wild at the reversal. Demir glanced sidelong at Yulina, doing his best to keep the smile off his face. He climbed up into the arena, ignoring Fidori as the referee, the arena manager, and Yulina hurried to help him. Demir clasped Montego by the hand. Very good fight. Montego stifled a yawn. Amateur, he muttered, glancing at one of the welts on his arm as if it bored him. The exhaustion had left his eyes and his breathing was no longer heavy. Glass damned showman. How did I do? I am now the proud owner of 16% of the Ivory Forest Glassworks. 15. Idrian's sword rang like a bell as it clashed with that of his opponent, each blow reverberating through his hand, up his arm, and spreading through his body with terrifying force. He caught a swing, shunting it to one side, keeping his shield tight against his left shoulder as a ferocious patter of bullets cracked against it like hail on glass. He did not recognize the Grent Breacher, but he'd heard of the feathered sigil on his shield. The hawk was a young man, probably no more than twenty-five, with a goateed face and a wicked grin. All Idrian knew was that the hawk was ambitious, and it showed in the way he pressed hard, with little consideration for the company of infantry backing him up. His entire focus was on Idrian. 
It would, Idrian knew as he fell back several steps, be the hawk's undoing. He caught the hawk's sword against his shield, looking for an opening that he did not find, and instead rebounded off his back leg. The push took the hawk off guard, and Idrian forced both of their shields down enough that he could lean out over them with a headbutt. The tightly curled horns on his helmet connected with the hawk's left cheek, and the hawk stumbled back, spitting blood, blinded momentarily. Idrian pulled his shield up to protect himself from another volley from the hawk's infantry. The hawk was not so aware, and Tadius's soldiers took the opportunity to pepper him with musket fire. At least two bullets found chinks in the hawk's armour. The hawk jerked twice, stumbled again, and Idrian had only to spin the grip on his sword and thrust once at the neck with the broad razor-glass tip, neatly removing the hawk's head. Cries of dismay went up among the Grent soldiers. Unlike their now-deceased breacher, they seemed well-trained, and they immediately fell into an organised retreat. Idrian could sense the iron horns moving behind him, bringing themselves up to capture this next street. The fighting had gone like this for hours, a ferocious back and forth between Grent and Osen infantry through the rows of magnificent townhouses of the evacuated Grent elite. Idrian's armour was coated with blood and dust, and the air choked with powder smoke. Directly ahead of him, less than a mile away, he could see the rising slope of Grent Hill, topped by the Ducal Palace, its white stone shining bright in the afternoon sun. Idrian stared at the palace for a few moments, wrestling with his uncertainties. Would they even be able to capture it against the fierce Grent defences? Would it really give them a shot at ending this war quickly if they did? More importantly, would that cinderite still be on display in the foyer for Idrian to steal? The rest of the Iron Horns had reached him by now, securing the intersection. Mika and her engineers tore up the cobbles to create low barricades to protect against a counteroffensive. A medic paused in front of Idrian, glancing him over to make sure most of the blood on his armour belonged to someone else, then moved on to serve the soldiers wounded in the skirmish. Idrian was lifting his shield, ready to move forward to the next street, when a whistle cut through the air, a long note followed by two short notes. Cease the advance. He ground his teeth, looking over his shoulder, then back again at the Ducal Palace. If they were to capture it today, they couldn't waste another minute. On the other hand, three clashes with the hawk throughout the afternoon had left him exhausted. A few moments of rest would do him good. Are you all right, sir? Braylia asked. He had barely left Idrian's side all day. As before, his sword was still unblooded. The young armourer could not seem to bring himself to kill, but his hammerglass buckler was bashed to piss. Despite his obvious terror, the kid had enough of a spine to remain in the thick of things, defending Idrian's flank with enthusiasm alone. I'm fine, Idrian answered, taking an offered wineskin and having a swig. He removed his helmet and pressed the cool wineskin against his forehead and handed it back. You're doing well, he said, but hold back another ten pieces or so. The enemy will focus their fire on me, but if you make yourself an easy target, they'll take advantage of it. Yes, sir. The two of them withdrew from the front line, looking for the reason for the order to cease advancing. They found Taddeus back a couple of hundred yards, hunkered down in a restaurant that had been gutted by Mika's grenades less than an hour before. Most of the pieces of Grent infantry had been carted away, but Idrian spotted a powder-stained finger underneath Taddeus's planning table as he entered. Why are we halting the advance? Idrian demanded. Because we've pushed too far ahead of everyone else, Taddeus responded. He stood over a table covered with notes, correspondence, and a hastily drawn map of the surrounding area. He appeared to be using beans, one pile of black, one pile of orange, to represent troop placements. He took a note from a messenger, dismissed the young woman, 
and then moved three orange beans from one end of the map to the other. Valiant, Mika's husband, stood beside Taddeus and gave Adrian a grin. You're pushing damned hard today, big man. You got a fire beetle biting your ass? Adrian set his sword and shield against a wall and ran a hand through his sweat-slick hair. Without the extra forge glass in his helmet to prop up his sore muscles, his legs felt wobbly and uncertain. He bit his thumb at Valiant, eliciting a laugh. Brilliant. Go find us some lunch. It's almost five o'clock, sir. Have we eaten lunch? No, sir. Then find us some lunch. Idrian waited until the armorer had gone before continuing. I thought General Stavry wanted the palace captured by day's end. Not if he gets everyone killed, Taddeus responded, frowning down at his bean map. Idrian joined him. He'd spent enough years staring at Taddeus's makeshift maps to understand it at a glance, and could see that the Iron Horns had indeed pushed several blocks past their allies. The operation included eight battalions, roughly 4,000 infantry, and it seemed that the Grent really didn't want to lose the Ducal Palace. He found a pile of orange beans just a few blocks to their west. What's going on here? Grant Roblock, Valiant answered with a grimace. I was just over there. The Green Jackets are getting the absolute shit kicked out of them, trying to take that intersection. I sent a few squads over with Mika's grenades, but it doesn't seem to have made a difference. They've got a pretty powerful glass dancer with them. Anybody that shows their face gets eviscerated immediately. We've called for our own, but it could be hours before they arrive. That's what's holding us up? Idrian could see that the Osin advance was contracting on that spot. Taddeus sighed. Sure is. Look here. The Grent are pulling back, trying to get the Iron Horns to overextend. Our spies say they've got reserves somewhere over here. He gestured vaguely off the side of the map. So if we do, we'll get clobbered without backup. But, Valiant pointed out, if we transfer everything to reinforce the Green Jackets, those same reserves can move forward and hit us in the flank. Idrian walked back outside looking down the street to where Mika and her engineers were securing the position under the watchful eye of Valiant soldiers. For the moment, their little slice of the neighbourhood was quiet. That could change at any time. Beyond their front line, the Ducal Palace sat up on that hill, taunting him. Should he tell Tadius about his secret mission? He certainly couldn't tell him the reason for the mission. Yes, Tad, Idrian muttered under his breath. I promise to help your nephew save civilization in order to protect my own sanity. I'm going to need you to endanger our battalion on that dubious premise. He thought he heard a child's laughter, echoing as if from the other end of a deep cave. Decades ago, when the madness first manifested itself, he had initially just learned to live with it. He could, if he was paying attention, tell the difference between what was real and what was not but it had grown apparent that it got worse over time, and doubly so during times of stress. It wasn't until he had attacked a glass dancer that wasn't there that he had reported his madness to a friend at the Ministry of the Legion. The Ministry had been more than willing to add twenty years onto his debt marker in exchange for funding Master Castora's efforts to control the madness. Idrian did not mind the debt. That was life, after all. But he could remember the terror he felt after realising that he'd swung his sword at the empty air when he thought he saw a rebel glass dancer standing right in front of him. That was a mistake he couldn't make again. It could get him killed, or worse, his friends. Fear of doing so had gone away once Castora perfected his eye. Now the fear was back, nestled in the pit of his stomach like a lead weight. He turned back to Taddeus and Valiant. Is that map any good? he asked. My maps are always good, Taddeus replied, looking hurt. Idrian rolled his eye. These buildings here. Townhomes just like these ones outside. Correct, 
Just like them? Adrian demanded. Valiant nodded. Like I said, I was just over there. Then I should be able to come along here, Adrian said, pointing, and drop down into here. If I can catch the glass dancer by surprise, we should be in a good position to take the intersection. A light seemed to go on in Tadius's eyes. Like that time in Folia. It was Stagro, but yes, Adrian corrected. Ah, right, Stagro. Tadius stared at the map, lips pursed. You remember that redhead in Stagro? I haven't thought about her in years. He seemed far away for a moment, then nodded. All right, I like that. In and out quick before the Grent Reserves even know we've moved. Valiant, take a hundred infantry over to here. I'll send word to the Green Jackets that we're moving in. Done. Idrian slammed his helmet onto his head, fastening the leather strap and then snatching up his sword and shield. The forge glass in the helmet reinvigorated him immediately. He found Braylear outside, looking dismayed at the meagre army rations in his hands. The armourer seemed surprised to see Idrian wearing his helmet again. Idrian said, Stay here. I've got a quick one-man mission. I'll expect lunch and dinner when I'm finished. With that, he took off at a run while Valiant shouted for his sergeants behind him. Like so much street fighting, the violence was so close as to be claustrophobic, with enemies within a stone's throw in seemingly every direction. It was a deadly labyrinth, even here in the wealthy districts of Grent, where the streets were broad and the townhouses had front and back gardens. Idrian hurried farther behind his own lines, cutting down side streets and following the picture he held in his head of Tadius's bean map. He passed through a contested neighbourhood, shield held overhead to block shots from marksmen in the high windows, and reached a narrow alley that cut between the back gardens of a row of townhouses. Here he hunkered down for a moment, looking carefully, until he spotted what he needed next. A chimney sweeps access ladder, little more than heavy nails bolted into the side of a massive townhouse chimney. Taking one last look around for the enemy, Idrian sprinted across the garden and threw himself up the ladder. Within moments he was four stories up, crouched in the shadow of a chimney with a view across the whole neighbourhood. He could see the ducal palace, Grent soldiers scurrying back and forth across the lawn, Sandbag barricades provided cover for a garrison that knew the exact purpose of the Osen mission in this borough. But they didn't know his mission. He tore his eyes away from that distant view and focused on the present, where all across his vantage point he could see hundreds of marksmen in both Osen Black and Grent Orange waging their own miniature war across the rooftops. Individual shots rang out, spouting plumes of black smoke as figures ducked beneath roof lines and hurried from vantage to vantage, worrying just as much about each other as they did about the soldiers down in the street below. None seemed to have noticed his presence, so Adrian kept low behind the chimney. His vantage allowed him to look down into two intersections. At one, he could see the green jackets forming up for another charge, the bright green stars on their jackets glittering in the sunlight. At the other hidden back to the point where he could barely spot them, were a hundred iron horns. Valiant raised his hand in Idrian's direction, waving in the affirmative. The charge was ready. Idrian returned the wave. The blast of a ram's horn suddenly cut through the air, reverberating off the townhouses, and the iron horns advanced at a steady march. Their bayonets were fixed, six lines of soldiers backed up by engineers with slings and grenades. A few beats later, the green jackets began their advance. Idrian counted to ten, then burst from his cover and began to sprint along the rooftops parallel to the charge. He ran hard, feet slipping on the tiled roof as he went up the crown of one, down the other side, then leapt the six-foot gap between townhouses. His forge glass spurred him on, sorcery humming through him. One house. Two. Four. By the time he reached the fifth one, he was firmly in Grent territory. 
He came over the crown of one roof and spotted a marksman taking aim at the iron horns below. The marksman whirled, trying to bring her rifle up to bear. Idrian was on her in half a second, his sword slicing through musket, arm and chest in a single stroke that didn't even slow him down. He was past, leaping a gap, his sword streaming a ribbon of entrails behind him as he landed on the next roof. Two more marksmen saw what he did to their companion. One took aim, firing a shot that Idrian easily blocked with his shield. Idrian skewered him while the other leapt from the roof, clearly more interested in fighting gravity than a breacher. Up ahead, Idrian heard the tight Grent defences fire off their first volley. He was almost to the end of the row of townhouses. One more gap to jump, and he landed on a flat-roofed maintenance building swarming with Grent marksmen. Not one of them saw him coming, and it did not go well for them. Mere moments had passed since Idrian had begun his run. He was now four stories directly above the Grent defensive position, and he could see why they'd been so hard to unseat. Two whole companies lay in wait behind high barricades, firing in rotation, a glass dancer hiding just behind the second barricade with several thick shards of glass hovering just over his shoulder, ready to be hurled at the oncoming infantry. Idrian waited for a few moments, watching down the street until the iron horns paused their advance. He could hear Valiant screaming orders. The first line knelt, and, along with the second line, released a volley at the Grent defenders. The shots had barely been fired when another blast from a ram's horn sounded. Grenades were flung from slings, arching over the barricades, exploding with enough force to shake the building Idrian was hiding on. The iron horns charged with bayonets fixed, and it was exactly the signal Idrian had been waiting for. He looked down, found the glass dancer again, and saw that the man was ready to hold death at the iron horns. Idrian leapt, sword and shield spread to either side like wings. Four stories of empty air whistled past his ears, barely audible over the adrenaline fueling his blasting heartbeat. Time seemed to slow to nothing, and the glass dancer glanced up half a second before Idrian landed on his shoulders. Idrian used the glass dancer's body to absorb much of the shock of his landing, but even still, he felt the impact through his entire frame. Without the forge glass to strengthen him, he would have broken both legs. He felt the glass dancer crumple, rolled across his shield, and came up quickly with a horizontal slice that vivisected an entire squad. He shattered an officer's skull with his shield, sliced again, and then began to sprint at the next group of infantry. The Grent defence collapsed around him as soldiers turned to face the breacher in their midst mere moments before the iron horns flooded over their barricade. The green jackets appeared next, hungry for vengeance. It was a glass-damned massacre. A few pockets of grenadiers, the Duke's own bodyguard, held out for as long as it took Idrian to locate and clear their position. The rest of the Grent infantry either were chewed up by oaths and bayonets, were blasted to bits by Mika's grenades, or fled. Less than ten minutes passed before Idrian stood panting among the bodies, his ears barely hearing the screams of the wounded and the occasional cry for mercy from a downed Grent infantryman. The Green Jackets now commanded the intersection, their entire battalion flooding in to shift the barricades and prepare for a counterattack. If it came, that was their business. Idrian found Valiant, who was already organising his soldiers to double-time it back to their own position. Five dead, eighteen wounded, Valiant reported. Idrian nodded. Not bad, all things considered. That was quite the leap. Tash says you landed on their glass dancer. Is that true? Idrian grinned. He couldn't resist. He was, he had to admit, a little impressed with himself for aiming that jump so well. Last thing the poor bastard saw was my boots. He raised his head, looking once more to the south, where he could see the palace at the top of the hill. The green jackets had a good position now, which meant the entire push could continue. Valiant slapped him on the shoulder, then made a face as his hand came away slick with grent blood. Let's get back. 
Adrian told him. We're not going to take the palace today, but we can push them out to the townhouses entirely. He was close enough to taste it. He was going to lead the charge up that hill, and with any luck, he'd be the first one through the front door of the ducal palace. He could secure the Cinderite, and if they were lucky, capturing the palace might even lead to the end of this little war. Oh, and do me a favor. After that jump, ha, huh, name it. Find me a sheepskin. I need to wrap up something fragile. Chapter, chapter 16 The first twenty-four hours in the ivory forest glassworks left Tessa an exhausted husk. She ploughed through it, working late into the night, catching a few hours of sleep in the dormitory she shared with twenty other prisoners, and then got up early enough to watch the assistants light the reheating chambers in the morning. She worked through the midday meal to catch up on the previous day's quota, finishing both her own work and Axios, only to immediately start on the current day. She daydreamed about the Phoenix Channel as she worked. Her time in the back of that wagon had allowed her to grasp the project pretty well, and she bounced ideas off herself to keep her mind occupied. That cannon-like sorcery converter floated in her head, turning this way and that, allowing her to imagine every aspect and the small changes she'd need to make to improve it. If the other prisoners noticed that she was covering for Axio, they said nothing. In fact, Tessa was left almost completely unsupervised. The quotas were given, the prisoners worked to fill them, and that was it. No interference by the guards or the other prisoners, barely anything but a nod from the hired assistants and labourers. It was as if Tessa and the other Cilicias working the furnaces were nothing but machines to be occasionally greased and otherwise ignored. It was dehumanising, humiliating. Tessa let those two words repeat over and over again in the back of her head, fueling her work with her fury. They wouldn't break her. She wouldn't allow it. She would use their dehumanising tactics against them to plan her escape, and if there was any chance at all, she would find justice for both herself and the others forced to work here. Axio did not learn quickly. Nobody became a practising Cilicia overnight, but he helped her gather information. He was a second pair of eyes and ears, making mental notes of guard positions, work rotations, sympathetic labourers, and even the other prisoners. They spoke in hushed tones, exchanging information, and Tessa cast it all to memory as she worked to fill both their trays with god glass. Heat, pinch, snip, shape, listen, repeat. Heat, pinch, snip, shape, listen, repeat. She fell into a trance, transferring tools between hands and the workbench with speed and efficiency. Heat, pinch, snip, shape, listen, repeat. She was deep in her own thoughts when they were interrupted by an older woman with grey-black hair and a limp standing immediately next to Tessa's workstation. Tessa jumped, catching her breath. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. The woman was one of the other prisoners. None seemed interested in sharing their names, so Tessa had labelled them with the numbers of their workstations. She herself was nine. This older woman was three. Three didn't meet her eye, instead staring straight at the floor as she mumbled apologetically. You're working too much. Excuse me? If you continue to work as much as you do, you'll get glass rot. Take breaks when everyone else does. Tessa inhaled sharply, realised the mistake she'd made. One of her greatest advantages in a glassworks was her sorcery aphasia. Most Cilicias needed to be judicious about the time they spent working, but not her, and she'd used it to her advantage to catch up on the quotas. It hadn't even occurred to her that other people would notice. She pretended to scratch at some non-existent glass rot on her forearm, trying to be nonchalant. You're right, I should. Thanks for the warning. 
the woman shuffled back to her workstation without another word. If anyone else had taken note of their conversation, Tessa could not tell. She glanced back at Axio, who continued to go through the motions, making forged glass pieces that had no resonance. Periodically, Tessa would remove them from his tray, replace them with her own, then melt his down in her own crucible to be worked again. It was inefficient and wasteful, but the ruse seemed to be working. A whistle was blown, signalling the top of the hour. The other prisoners immediately began to rack their tools. Some knuckled their backs, others bent over their workstations to weep quietly. Most just trudged outside. Tessa's nerves had tightened with Three's warning, and she knew she had to take that advice before someone else noticed her lack of glass rot. It would slow her down, but it couldn't be helped. She and Axio left their stations and stepped out into the courtyard, where dozens of prisoners from several different furnace rooms were taking their break. The air was thick with smoke from the belching furnaces, the lights dim from the setting sun, but it did feel nice to be out of the heat. Tessa sank to the ground just outside, rolling her shoulders, swearing to herself softly. Axio came to sit next to her, his head raised, looking at the guards up on the walls. She should be doing the same, she knew, but she needed this breather. Let him do the reconnaissance. Had it been only a day in this place, it felt like weeks. She couldn't help but wonder how long some of these prisoners had been there. Months? Years? How did they keep going every day? Muted conversations filled the courtyard, and some of the wood smoke was mixed with the scent of cigarettes begged from guards or labourers. Only two people had books, and they held them protectively whenever someone walked by. There were no newspapers or entertainment. She thought she heard someone mention a weekend cudgelling match between guards. Dehumanising. The word rolled on her tongue as if she were about to spit it at a tribunal. Was this what all prisons were like? Did anyone deserve this? Tessa didn't even know if her fellow Silasias were thieves or murderers, or if they just had the same bad luck to be on the wrong end of an Osan war. That side door over there, Axio whispered, only has one guard. They use it to bring in firewood. Might make a good exit. Tessa glanced in that direction, but could immediately see that the double doors were in plain view of everything else in the courtyard. All the guards would have to be blind or distracted, and if that was the case, they might as well use the front gate. Good eye, she told him. Keep watching it, but don't be obvious. She gave him a quick reassuring smile. He nodded back, holding his chin up. Since his breakdown upon their arrival, he'd been putting on a good face. Whether it was for her benefit or his own, she did not know. Tessa watched one of the labourers, a young woman, tall and sinewy, probably no more than a few years older than herself, with short cropped brown hair and light pernian skin, pushing one of the massive carts of firewood across the uneven cobbles. No one seemed to pay her any mind as she struggled with the load. The left wheel hit a rut between two of the cobbles, and the labourer gave a resigned grunt. She pulled, frowned, then pushed. The cart would not budge. Minutes passed. The labourer looked at the cart from all angles, tried to rock it out of the rut once more, then walked away. She returned moments later, red-faced, muttering under her breath. By now her predicament had been noticed, and the prisoners watched her struggle surreptitiously. Three of the guards on the walls above gazed down, chuckling to themselves. No one came to help. The labourer tried to get underneath the stuck wheel, shoving and grunting. Tessa watched with everyone else, bemused at the efforts until the wheel suddenly slipped forward. Tessa had a clear view, wincing in sympathetic pain as the wheel rolled across the next cobble and dropped squarely into another rut, trapping the labourer's hand underneath it. The labourer inhaled sharply, eyes going wide, her face twisting. 
She didn't make a sound, but threw her shoulder desperately against the carts, trying to lift it. Tessa looked around. Everyone had seen what happened. Dozens of prisoners, five or six guards. Many of them laughed openly. Tessa scoffed and got to her feet. It's not funny when people get hurt and a glass works. She snapped at a nearby chuckling old man, then hurried over to the woodcart. Axio, help me! Together they got beneath the cart and managed to get the wheel out from between the cobbles. The labourer gasped in pain, clutching her hand to her stomach. She made a low keening noise and turned away when Tessa approached. Someone needs to look at that hand now, Tessa said firmly. Show it to me. She ignored the shake of the woman's head and pulled her arm out so that the injured hand was flat in front of her. It didn't look bad, some redness around her pointer finger and several deep scuffs. The woman tried to pull away, but Tessa could see the shock still in her eyes. Tessa gently touched the pad at the base of each finger, watching carefully for reactions. I'm going to lose my hand, the labourer whispered. What's your name? Tessa asked. Pari. Pari, you're not going to lose your hand. It only landed on one finger. It's broken, but a day with cure glass and it'll be good as new. I can't afford a day at a healing house. The labourer trembled in pain, but was clearly trying not to show it. Tessa had met plenty of labourers and assistants like her, people from the types of backgrounds where showing weakness would cost them. This is a glassworks. They have cure glass on hand. They'd be fools not to. Not for us labourers. They don't. Tessa searched Pari's eyes, realising with surprise that she was telling the truth. There was pain there, but there was also fear and shame. Tessa swore softly. She broke a piece of kindling from the woodcart, then tore the hem of Pari's tunic into a long strip. This is a splint, she said. It's rudimentary, and you'll want to see a doctor for something better, but it'll get you through the rest of the day. If you keep the finger splinted properly, it should heal in around eight weeks. The labourer did not object as Tessa bound the finger. Up on the walls, the guards had gotten bored, wandering back to their posts, while the prisoners actively ignored the situation. Tessa sent Axio running to the mess hall for watered wine, one of the few luxuries the prisoners were allowed, and finished the splint. Why didn't you ask for help? Tessa asked. I did, Pari responded petulantly. Everyone here is an asshole. I meant once the car fell on your finger. Pari snorted. You're new. Haven't seen your face around. I was brought in yesterday. Grent. Tessa nodded, glad to finally get the woman to engage with her. Pari just snorted again. Then you should know about the Magna. I've heard they're assholes. You don't show weakness in front of a Magna, Pari replied. Just as Tessa had suspected. You're not a client. The labourer lifted her other hand to show the nail of her pinky finger. It was unpainted. I'm not going to sell my soul to the Magna, but I will work for them when money's tight. The moment Tessa let go of her hand, she pulled it back as if she'd been burned. You're welcome, Tessa said. Pari said nothing. She got behind her woodcart studying the cobbles carefully before awkwardly leveraging it up on her shoulder and pushing it recklessly across the courtyard. The gamble succeeded, and the last Tessa saw was her disappearing around the corner. Tessa sighed and looked around. Axio had yet to return, probably arguing with a cook over taking wine out of the mess hall, and the rest of the prisoners seemed to want even less to do with her now. She walked back into the furnace room and around to workstation 9, looking across the subpar tools and the low-quality molten cinder sand crucible. She swore again. She didn't deserve this. She'd put in her licks, lost her family, spent years as an apprentice, worked herself to the bone. 
she was not a damned criminal. Hey, blue eyes, a voice said. Tessa turned to find that one of the other prisoners had followed her in. He was about her height, probably in his early thirties with broad shoulders and plenty of scars from working the furnaces. She'd already dubbed him Six based on his station number. What do you want, brown eyes? she asked. You're a soft one, aren't you? he asked, sidling over beside her. Helping one of the hired pricks, sneaking god glass in to fill out your friend's quota. Tessa felt her eyes narrow. She wasn't even surprised or afraid. She didn't have those qualities left anymore, and all that fury and indignation that drove her had reached a peak. Walk away and forget what you're about to say, she told him. No, no, you're going to fill in for me too. I've earned a break, and you're going to give it to me, or I'll tell craftsman Magna that your friend can't make god glass. He'll get sent straight to the lumber camps, and I bet he'll get chewed up like a two-penny. Master Castora always said that a Cilicia could show their authority by earning respect or earning fear. The latter had no place in this glassworks but Tessa had spent the last 24 hours seeing firsthand how effective it could be. She didn't let Six finish his sentence. The fool had pushed her past her limits. She grabbed the heavy shears off her workbench and slammed them across his cheek, then readjusted her grip to press the sharp end against his collarbone. He grunted at the blow, swore twice, then gave out a squeal at the feel of the steel on his skin. She forced him back against the next workbench. Do not mistake my compassion for weakness, she hissed. If you whisper a word to Craftsman Magna, if my friend gets flogged or pushed around or sent away because of your loose lips, you will have an accident. You might lose an eye or a hand or get locked in a furnace where no one can hear your screams. She could barely believe the words coming out of her own mouth. They didn't sound like her, but she continued. Test me, and you will lose bits of you. That's a promise. Get it. Six nodded carefully, his eyes wide. Tessa jerked her head and stepped back, letting him flee. The moment he was out of the furnace room, she felt her knees buckle and had to lean on her workbench for support. Was this going to get worse? Was this what she had to become to survive in here? In Osa. She leaned forward, pressing her forehead against the cool steel plate on the workbench. Well, that was unexpected. Tessa jerked around, the shear still in her hand coming up like a weapon. Pari, the labourer she'd just helped with the woodcart, stood just inside a service entrance. Tessa lowered the shears. What do you want? she demanded. The stress inside her was starting to wear through, and for the first time in her life, she seriously considered whether she could kill someone in a rage. The labourer raised her hands, palms out, wincing at the gesture. I came to say thank you. Had to calm down a little before I did. I'm not going to owe a prisoner a favour, so I'm putting it out once. If there's anything you need, tell me right now. Tessa blinked back at her in surprise. What do you mean? Something smuggled inside. Hari explained impatiently. Some cigars, some spending cash. I can't do much, but I can get you a little luxury. Then we're square, right? But you have to tell me now, no favours in the future. Tessa glanced around in bewilderment, her mind spinning. Can you get a message out for me? To someone who might pay my ransom? That's not going to work, Pari said, shaking her head. Too risky for me, and even if I did, no ransoms will be allowed until after the war ends. That's policy all the way from the top of the government, and even craftsman Magna won't break that rule. Then, Tessa tried to think of something, anything that would help her escape. 
It was clear this favour had pretty strict limits. Hari wasn't going to risk getting killed by Magna enforcers just to help someone who lifted a cart off her. Tessa grimaced. Could she take a greater risk? Did she have a choice? Craftsman Magna took something important from me. Where would he keep it? The labourer raised both eyebrows. You really are a daring one. I guess it's cheap information. She considered this for a moment before nodding to herself. If it's a personal effect, one of the guards already pawned it. If it was something more valuable, then it's in his office somewhere. Really? Tessa asked. Could it be that close by? Yeah. He keeps anything he values here in the compound so his addict brothers don't steal it. Is his office guarded? Pari just shook her head. I do not suggest doing whatever it is you're thinking about. The moment they catch you, well, the lumber camps will look pleasant. Don't try to seduce him either. It's been tried before and it just annoys him. Tessa pulled a face that elicited a laugh from the labourer. I will not try that. Then we're square here, right? Pari said, turning toward the service entrance. No favours, no nothing. Tessa took half a step toward her. Is there anything else you can tell me about the prison offices? The labourer hesitated. Look, I shouldn't have even... She sighed. Piss. I guess I'm heading back into Osa tonight anyway. Can't haul wood with this. Need a new job. She held up her splintered finger, wincing at the motion. Fine. The offices are rarely locked. The two enforcers on normal guard duty are always there, but they're sleeping together and I can't think of the last time they paid attention to anything. She tilted her head thoughtfully. One other thing. Craftsman Magna is religious. He's a vehement Renite. Good luck with whatever it is you're doing. Gesturing goodbye, Pari slipped out the service entrance. Tessa barely noticed her leaving. She was thinking now, planning. That bit about Craftsman Magna being religious might be the key to this whole thing. She knew where the schematics were now. She had to get them out. Maybe even caused the distraction she needed in the process. Chapter 17 The High Vorsian Club, on the edge of the family district, was a sprawling single-storey building covering two whole city blocks with gambling, day's glass, whores, food, cigars, private cudgelling matches and more all without the stain of lower-class revelry at Glory Street. It was the premier place to be for the elite of the elite within Osen society. It was also owned by Kizzy's oldest half-brother, Sibriel. Kizzy slipped through the back entrance, dodging porters as they carried in crates of expensive wine and nodding to the madams smoking cigarettes outside the delivery bays. There were a handful of enforcers hanging around, rolling dice on the floor or reading books in forgotten corners. A few raised their eyebrows at her, but no one stopped her as she made her way through the labyrinth of kitchens and service passages and up to the raised gallery behind a massive one-way mirror that overlooked the main floor of the club. She clung to the wall, allowing waiters to come and go without interruption, watching the chaotic dance that kept the club running. Standing by the mirror, snapping orders like a general on a battlefield, was a statuesque dark-skinned woman in her late fifties, wearing a translucent black tunic cut to be a more professional version of the club uniform. Veterixi John, the concierge, had been with the family since well before Kizzy was born, a high Vorsian club porter back before Father Vorsian had passed it on to Sibriel. She was the ultimate authority in this place, almost akin to a guild family major domo in her own right. She could be trusted with pretty much anything and refused to play at family politics, including the spat between Kizzy and Sibriel. You know that your brother will kill you if he sees you here, Veterixi said suddenly, 
filling a brief lull in the constant stream of reports. She did not look away from her view of the club. It's still the family club, Kizzy said, holding up her hand to show the silic sigil, and I still have a few privileges. Oh, yeah? Sibrio's playing cards at his usual table, Betterixi shot back. You want to go join him? I'm brash, not stupid, Kizzy snorted. I just came to ask a favor. Veterixi held up one hand as a young man, one of the scantily clad servers, rushed into the gallery weeping. She touched him gently on the shoulder, conducting a quick exchange that was too quiet for Kizzy to hear, and then sent him on his way. Get rid of Nido Plagni, she ordered one of the porters standing at attention, and ban her from the club for a full month. I don't give a shit if she is a glass dancer. If she lays her hand on another one of my employees against their will, she will be banned permanently. Kizzy coughed in her hand once the porter had gone. I heard one of the Plagni's glassworks was vandalized last night. Hundreds of thousands of Ozo's worth of god glass smashed, and the guards blaming it on everything from foreign nationals to giant birds. I bet they're on edge. And I, Vetorixi said, heard that you've been relegated to hotel security for Demir Grappo. Vetorixi's tone made it clear what she thought of that. A step down, even after falling out of favor. It's a very nice hotel, and I'm not going to have to launder blood out of my tunics for a while. Brennan is a colleague, Vetorixi admitted, and I admire him. I hope the hotel doesn't go to shit now that Demir is back. She sighed, ordering one of the porters to send a bottle of wine to the table of Marnish merchants who were losing a lot of money. What favors do you need of me, Cassandra? Kizzy resisted the urge to defend Demir and stepped up to the one-way mirror to search the club. She spotted Sibriel immediately. Wide shoulders, light skin, and long blonde hair that favoured his mother. He was thick without being fat, big-boned and broad-shouldered, laughing like a braying donkey at something one of his mistresses said. Just the sight of him turned Kizzy's stomach. At a nearby table was Caprick, his eyes closed, a piece of day's glass in his ear, snoozing while conversation continued around him. There were nine full-blood Vorsian children, and it wasn't uncommon to find most of them here on any given night. Sibriel and Capric were the only two she could spot. But they weren't her target. Kizzy moved on, searching the crowd until her eyes landed on the prize. Glissandi Magna was middle-aged with short hair, wearing a fine dark blue tunic, lounging in a booth not far from the mirror. She smoked a thick cigar while she watched one of her cousins third in line among the Magna heirs, play cards with several other guild family scions. I want to know about Glissandi Magna. Vetorixi snapped her fingers, and the remaining few porters standing at attention in the gallery vacated the area. Within moments they were alone, interrupted only by the muted sounds of the club from the other side of the mirror. Now why would you want to know about Glissandi Magna? She's messing with some of Demir's hotel suppliers. Demir has asked me to look into it. One of the benefits of having a reputation for personal integrity was that most people assumed she never lied. It was a stupid assumption, of course, doubly so because it was held by otherwise intelligent people. Kizzy's personal code was quite specific. She always kept her word, and she rarely lied to public authorities. White lies that were unlikely to be verified were a common part of her enforcer's toolbox. Vetorixi took her gaze away from the club to glance sidelong at Kizzy. Kizzy pretended not to notice. Finally, Vetorixi said, She's a firebrand, opinionated, intelligent, ruthless. If she's made a decision, there's no swaying her. If I were you, I'd go back to Demir and tell him to find new suppliers. You think a grappo glass dancer is intimidated by a magna cousin? Vetorixi shrugged. 
I don't really know what intimidates Demir. No one knows a damn thing about him, other than the fact he broke at Holicon. Even so, Glissandi is not one to cross. The suppliers are clients, Kizzy lied. Ah, certainly makes it more complicated. I'd like to talk to her alone. Can't help you with that, Rhetorixie said. She's got a couple of hulking Pernian bodyguards that go everywhere with her. Outside of this club or her own home, you won't have the chance to chat in private. Do you think she'd take an appointment? Kizzy asked. It wasn't really an option anyway. Kizzy didn't want any record that the two of them had ever spoken, but she might as well ask. Maybe if you're willing to wait six months? More likely she'll have her bodyguards beat you within an inch of your life just for the audacity of asking. Kizzy watched Glissandi smoke her cigar, trying to get inside that head of hers. Any vices? Peace offerings that might put me in her good graces? A sordid vice made for either bribery or blackmail material. Nothing, Veterixi said with a sympathetic frown. She loves money and herself. She is not scared of anyone, even glass dancers, and Demir isn't rich enough to bribe her. It seemed, at least on the surface, that Glissandi was impenetrable. Kizzy went through her list of options. Demir wanted this done in a timely manner, and digging around Glissandi's businesses, family, and friends for something Kizzy could use would take time. It would also be dangerous. If the Magna found out what Kizzy was up to, she could expect a visit from more than just a pair of Pernian bodyguards. An idea occurred to her. Perhaps, she considered, it didn't have to be that difficult. How's her reputation? she asked. Impeccable. I hear a lot of secrets in this place, and absolutely nothing juicy has come to my ears. Is she that clean? More like she's that fastidious about cleaning up after herself. That might work. Kizzy chewed on her lip her new idea slowly taking form in the back of her head. If you think of anything else, she said, let me know. Vetterixi pretended to tip her hat toward her. My pleasure. Was that it? Kizzy nodded to the corner booth at the far end of the club, where Sibriel was still playing cards. If you can think of anything to get me on his good side, let me know. I'm a club concierge, not an omnipotent being, Vetterixi replied. Is it that bad? I didn't know it would matter so much. The fines were a pittance for him. Vetterixi made a sound in the back of her throat. It wasn't about the fines he had to pay. It's about the fact he had to pay them at all. You humiliated him when all you had to do was give the magistrate an alibi. He ran over a little boy with his damned carriage, broke the kid's leg and could have killed him. And even if he did kill the kid, Cypriel is the Vossian heir. You still should have lied to the magistrate. Vetterixi was right, of course. Guild family heirs were almost entirely above the law, if not in theory, then in practice. Having the most honest Vorsian enforcer give an alibi was meant to get Sibriel off completely. Instead, Kizzy had told the truth, just so she could watch the magistrate yell at her idiot half-brother. It was, in retrospect, a moment of vindictive foolishness she should never have indulged. She'd expected Sibriel's ire over the whole affair. She had not expected to lose favour with Father Vorsian. Well, I'd still like to make it up to him. Good luck with that. Vetterixi sounded sincere, but not hopeful. Her eyes suddenly narrowed, and Kizzy followed her gaze back to Sibriel's table, where one of the porters was leaning over and whispering in Sibriel's ear. Sibriel's head came around and he glared directly at the one-way mirror Kizzy was standing behind. Vetterixi swore. That little prick just sold you out to your brother. Glass, damn it, I don't want to deal with this tonight. I'll slow him down. You get out of here. 
Kizzy didn't have to be told twice. Sibriel was already getting up from his table as she bolted for the exit, hurrying as quickly as she could down the winding back passages, past the private rooms and through the kitchens. She'd almost reached the rear exit when her flight was arrested by a familiar voice barking her name. Kizzy! Kizzy froze. She fixed a demure look on her face and turned to find Sibriel standing in the hallway behind her. Sibriel was said to look much like their father had at that age, aside from his hair colour, barrel-chested with thick arms, a clean-shaven square jaw. He had a cane in one hand and his face was flushed from drink. Brother, Kizzy acknowledged with a slight bow. He must have left instructions with the staff to let him know she arrived. She swore silently. This was the last thing she needed. What the piss are you doing in my club? He demanded. I have, if you say one thing about your privileges, I will have you shot. Kizzy bit down on her tongue, hard. Sibriel might just do that, consequences be damned. He certainly was unhinged enough. No need to antagonise him. I came to ask Veterixi if there was anything I could do to make things up to you, she said, holding out both hands in a gesture of peace. Make it up to me, you glass damn bitch. I was in every paper in Osa for a week because of you, and you have the nerve to think you could possibly make it up to me. Don't you bloody move. He turned in mid-tirade, screaming at a serving girl trying to slip past with a bottle of brandy. The hallway was suddenly silent, including the kitchens at one end and the club at the other. Kizzy could see faces poking around that far corner as curious club members came to see the commotion. I'm sorry, Sibriel, I really am. I didn't know what would happen. It was a lie that played on Sibriel's low opinion of her. Ignorance is no excuse for betraying me. Betrayal seemed a strong word for something that had so few real consequences. Kizzy slowly backed her way down the hall, her stomach tying itself in knots. She needed to de-escalate things as quickly as possible, or this confrontation would get back to Father Vorsian. She didn't need that kind of attention right now. I'm sorry, she said again. Let's talk again when you're sober. At that, she hurried around the corner, through the kitchens and out into the alley behind the club. With any luck, Sibriel was drunk enough that he would have no recollection of this in the morning, or at least lose interest in continuing the confrontation. Kizzy's luck was absolutely shot through. She was barely halfway down the alley when Sibriel burst out through one of the delivery bays, shouting her name. Porters, servants and enforcers scattered before his fury, Kizzy was ready to abandon her pride completely and hide behind a whiskey barrel, but Sibriel had already spotted her. You scummy piece of shit, he bellowed, advancing quickly. You aren't fit to wear the Vorsian sigil. I'll cut it off you myself. He searched his belt for a knife, but to Kizzy's relief came up with nothing. Instead, he brandished his cane. Several more steps and he was upon her. Sibriel was a noted duelist and boxer, and if he'd had his sword on him, he might have killed Kizzy then and there, even if she defended herself. She could not, however, defend herself. Raising her hand to the Vorsian air was the greatest sin she could commit in the eyes of her father, so she allowed the first blow to strike her unimpeded. The cane cracked against her left arm, hard enough that it went numb immediately. She staggered to one side. Sibriel, she hissed, don't do this. It took all her willpower not to reach for her stiletto, but she reacted in another way, using her sorcery to seize one of her little glass lock-picking beads. It shot from her pocket, so small she could barely see it, and she held it just beside Sibriel's neck. If he did kill her, the last thing she intended to do before she went was push the damn thing through his neck. He struck again hitting the exact same spot. Kizzy hardly felt the blow, but it staggered her once more. She caught herself on the wall of the club, swearing quietly, hoping that someone would come out and stop Sibriel before he killed her. 
Caprick would do it, if he wasn't deep in the day's glass. Maybe Veterixi, one of his friends, another guild family heir, anyone. She dodged the next blow, and then the next. The hammerglass tip of his cane cracked loudly against the brick, and she held her concentration on the bead floating unnoticed over his shoulder. Hold still, damn it! I'm going to give you the beating I should have given you! Kizzy lost all patience. She wasn't going to kill him with that bead, no matter how much she wanted to, but she also wasn't going to let him kill her. As a lowly enforcer, there was nothing she could do in the face of Sibriel's fury. But as his half-sister, she had one option. She ducked the next swing, barreling up against him and grabbing him by his tunic with one hand. Monty goes back in town, she hissed in his ear. Do you want my death in the newspapers right now? Sibriel jerked himself out of her grip, and for half a moment she thought he would continue his attack. Instead, he stared at her, wide-eyed, his cane half-raised. His fury was gone, like a candle blown out by a strong wind. He visibly gathered himself. You're not worth the beating, he spat. Whirling, he strode back toward the club service bay. Kizzy was left alone, holding her left arm, dozens of porters and servants watching her warily. It took the last of her energy to direct the glass bead back into her pocket. Once Sibriel was gone, one of the porters called out to her, asking if she needed cure glass. She waved him off and staggered down the alley and out into the street. She fished a piece of pain-numbing milk glass out of her pocket. It wasn't very high resonance, but it took the edge off the pain as feeling came back to her arm. Putting on her gloves and covering her face with a handkerchief, she found a nearby courier office. She pounded on the door until a boy of about thirteen unlocked it. Paper, she instructed. Veterixi had given her one good piece of information, that Glissandi guarded her reputation closely. Kizzy could use that. The courier boy provided her with a paper and pencil, and she scrawled out a quick note. It said, I know who you killed eighteen days ago. Meet me in front of the Palmora pub on the lampshade boardwalk tomorrow night at ten. Come alone, or your name will be in the papers. She thrust the notes and a handful of coins into the boy's hands. Deliver this to Glissandi Magna at the High Vossian Club, she ordered. The boy stared at her. Are you okay, Mom? Perfectly fine. Go on. She waited long enough for him to apply the courier's wax seal, then went back into the streets and watched him take off toward the club. It was not a perfect plan. More than likely, Glissandi would have her Pernian bodyguards try to jump her. But unlike that confrontation with her brother, Kizzy had no qualms about fighting back against some hired muscle. She was in pain, angry, and not a little bit humiliated. She also had a job to do. One way or another, Glissandi was going to tell her why Adriana Grappo died. Chapter 18 Demir's first destination the next morning was a visit to the Hotel Carpenter. The old man was in the large workshop and carriage house across the street, greasing axles when Demir arrived and dismissed all of the assistants. He found the carpenter's workbench and laid out a pair of technical drawings he'd spent half the night on. The carpenter finished his work and joined him. I need you to modify a carriage, Demir said. Give me a cubby hidden underneath the seat like this, with a false top. That looks big enough to hide a person in, the carpenter observed. Sure does, doesn't it? Can you do it? Easy enough. Might have to shave a couple inches off to hide the cubby. Perhaps put decorative wings inside the wheels, here and here. Excellent. How long? A week. Make it five days. Demi was about to elaborate when a porter appeared holding a calling card. He rolled his eyes, remembering why he'd always found life in the capital annoying. There was just so damn much to be done. Who is it? 
he demanded. Sir, the porter said, handing him the card. Master Supi Magna is here to see you. Huh. Demir took the calling card. He'd half expected this visit, but not so quick. He'd only just taken possession of the paperwork guaranteeing his share of the ivory forest glassworks at midnight last night. He tapped the card against his cheek. I'll receive him in my office. No. Wait in the restaurant, thank you. It wouldn't do to have Soupy Magna walk into Demir's office to find it filled with spy master reports on the Magna. Demir took his time crossing the street back to the hotel and went to the restaurant, where he arrived just as the porter showed Soupy into a corner booth. Demir slid in across from him, shaking his hand with a warm smile. Soupy, what a surprise! The patriarch of the Magna Guild family was a tall, willowy, hawk-faced man, whose tunic hung from him like from a scarecrow. He was in his late sixties, though looked to be in his fifties, and rumours had circulated for years that his personal Cilicia masters had created godglass that would keep him from ageing. Demi suspected he simply took a lot of care in his appearance. Supi, along with the four other members of the inner assembly, was one of the most powerful men in Osa. He was worth hundreds of millions, belonged to dozens of fulgurist societies, commanded an army of enforcers, and had a quarter of the assembly in his pocket. Supi did not return Demir's smile. Condolences on your mother's death, he said. Adriana was a friend. But congratulations, of course, on taking her place at the head of the family. Thank you. Breakfast? Demir asked, raising his hand toward a waiter. I'm afraid I don't have time for a meal. It's come to my attention that Yulina, my foolish granddaughter, gambled away her share in the ivory forest glassworks. Demir leaned back, raising his eyebrows. Well, yes, we had a rather lovely afternoon together. The betting might have gotten a little heated. Do you often take such close interest in the family holdings? When it comes to glassworks, I do. Soupy produced a small satchel from within his jacket. Demir recognised it as the type banks would give to their rich clients when they wanted to carry a particularly large amount of money on their person. I would prefer to keep 100% of the ownership of the glassworks in magna hands. You understand, I hope. Of course. I'm willing to pay 115% value for the immediate return of the shares my granddaughter lost. Demi gave Soupy a quizzical look. 115% for part ownership in a glassworks with a government contract? Cheap bastard. I'm afraid I will have to pass. One hundred and thirty per cent. Pass, Demi said again, meeting Soupy's eyes coolly. He could see some anger there now, but it was well bottled. You'd pass up a thirty per cent profit on something you've owned only since last night? Demir drew invisible pictures on the table with his finger. I don't need cash right now, Soupy. I need investments. The mere fact that you are willing to buy at such a price means it's more valuable than even I expected. I won't let it go. Soupy's nostrils flared. A hundred and fifty. You're notoriously cheap, Soupy. You're only reinforcing my decision. You... Soupy growled, his eyes widening. Oh, come now. Don't be so agitated. I really did have a lovely time with you, Lena. Maybe in a year or two you'll get it back in the family. As if a magna would stoop to marrying a grapple, Soupy said quietly. As if, Demi replied. He did not let the smile leave his face, but he was sure his eyes told a different story. The greater guild families had tried to push him around when he was a young politician. They hadn't succeeded then because he could outthink them. They wouldn't succeed now because he had proper steel in his spine. 
You sure you won't stay for breakfast? Soupy stood up suddenly and stared down that hawkish nose at Demir. Your mother was my friend. I had hoped you'd be more reasonable. My mother was everyone's friend, Soupy. That didn't mean she was a fool. Be careful, young Grapple. You might have once been a commanding politician, but Osa has changed since you left. If you forget your place, you will be ground underfoot. Demir placed both hands flat on the table in front of him, presenting Soupy with the dual sigils of Glass Dancer and Grappo. In her assembly or not, Soupy needed to be reminded who Demir was. Where is my place, Soupy? Under your chair, like a good pet? We may be a small guild family, but be sure to remember my mother's legacy. The Grappo sit at the table with the rest of you. You can be my friend, or you can be my enemy, but I assure you that the latter will cost you more. You're impudent. We've met before, Soupy. A lot has changed, I know, but that has not. Soupy made an angry sound in the back of his throat and whirled, striding out of the restaurant. Demir waved away the waiter and counted to sixty before he practically ran across the hotel foyer to Brennan's office. Get Montego and a carriage, he said. I have decided to visit my new holdings. Demir spent the long ride up to the Ivory Forest Glassworks studying spymaster reports that he'd managed to bully, steal or bribe from the Dolani, Forsian and Stavry. Some of it touched upon the Ivory Forest, but most was just generally useful. He was going to need every scrap he could get if he was already making enemies among the inner assembly. They were only just approaching the glassworks when he broke the long silence between him and Montego. Something else is going on here, he said, gesturing out the window. Montego looked up from the book he'd been reading. Oh? Soupy was very angry that I wouldn't sell him back Yulina's shares in the glassworks. I've known him a long time, and he doesn't often take things personally. Either he thinks that I'll use my 16% share to destroy the place and lose him their government contract, or they are hiding something. What could they be hiding? Montego asked. Demi shook his head. The usual. Laundering, ill-gotten gains, prisoner abuse, selling their wards. It's a glasswork, so maybe they have their prisoners working on illegal god glass. We won't know until we dig around. But my focus is going to be on finding Tessa. You remember her description? Early twenties. A couple inches taller than you. Dirty blonde hair. Keep your eyes open. I'll work the people. Demir fixed a smile on his face as their carriage rumbled over the uneven streets of the dirty little glass-working town. Outside the left window, he could see a twenty-foot wall meandering along the roadside, with a couple of guard towers occupied by armed magna enforcers. This really is a serious operation, he commented to Montego as they turned into the gatehouse. The carriage jerked to a sudden stop, nearly throwing him into Montego's lap. He stuck his head out the window to see a dozen enforcers crowding the gate, all of them shouting angrily at Demir's driver. Demir put a glove on his left hand to cover his glass dancer sigil, but left his right hand naked. He was here to make friends, not threaten people. He opened the door, hopped down, and gave them all a grin. Is something the matter? A man wearing a flat cap, differentiated from the other enforcers by a magna silic sigil stitched on his jacket, pushed his way to the front and pointed at Demir, then at the carriage. Tell your driver to back up. This is a restricted compound and we will shoot if he tries to push through. You will shoot? Demir asked, laying his right hand flat against his chest. The captain's eyes fell to Demir's silic sigil and his shoulders slumped. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realise you were a guild family member. Demir Grappo, at your service, 
summon the overseer, let him know that I am now 16% owner in the glassworks. I'd like to take an immediate tour. The captain's mouth hung open for several moments. Uh, that's not possible. My ownership? Or a tour? The tour. Either, I mean. Deme knew that look in the captain's eyes. A low-level functionary just trying to do his job, confronted with something he hadn't expected. Was he allowed to tell Deme to piss off? Or would he bring shame on the entire guild family if he did? He was flustered, exactly where Deme wanted him. Finally, the captain said, I'll summon the overseer. I'll come with you. Baby, bring the carriage. Deme threw an arm around the captain's shoulders, pulling him through the gate and pretending to ignore the desperate way he motioned to one of the other enforcers to run on ahead. Once inside, Deme ran his eyes across the general layout of the place. Halfway between a prison and a labour camp, it appeared to have one main road going through the centre of the compound and another wrapping around just inside the wall. It was probably twenty acres, with dozens of buildings, each of them labelled with its function in large black letters. Demir cast everything to memory. He never knew what information he might have need of, from how readily the enforcers carried their weapons to the width of the roads. Incredible, he said. I've only seen a few glassworks bigger, and I had no idea we had a forced labour camp just for Silesiers. Amazing world. He strolled to the nearest workshop, yanked open the door, and shoved his head inside. The workshop was hot, well lit by high windows, and showed a row of men and women in heavy Silesier aprons and boots toiling at Spartan-looking workbenches. A few glanced in his direction. The rest ignored him. Stop it! You can't! The captain clearly struggled to get control of himself as he tugged at Demir's sleeve. You shouldn't do that! You need permission! Please, sir, wait until you've met the overseer! Demir remained long enough to make sure that Tessa was not one of the Silesiers in the workshop before allowing himself to be dragged away from the door. He turned to the captain, grinning ear to ear. You have no idea how exciting this is. I've owned small glassworks before, but this is really something else. He leaned in conspiratorially. How do you keep them in line? Is that a problem? What if one gets violent? Sir, please save your questions for the overseer. Come now. I am part owner in this place, and you will get to see me quite often from now on. The captain stifled a groan. Sir! Don't worry about the overseer, Demir said in a low voice, turning away from the other enforcers and slipping a thick stack of banknotes into the captain's hand. I'm generous to the people under my employ. The captain worked his jaw, staring down at the banknotes for a moment before hurriedly stuffing them in his pocket. He cleared his throat. Uh, ahem, um, no, we really... Don't have any problems with the prisoners. Most violent Silesiers are treated like common criminals and punished in their own provinces. These are mostly debtors, thieves, foreigners, that sort of thing. Is being a foreigner a crime these days? Demir asked. Well, no. Depends on where they came from. We've got a couple of Grint Silesiers that were caught trying to cross into Osa when the war started... Then there's the balcony who got caught up in the revolution. You know, it's... He was interrupted by shouting from across the complex. Demir turned to find a short, wiry man in a clean Silesia's apron rushing toward him, waving his arms. Get them out of here. What do you think you're doing? This is a government site, restricted to the highest levels. The assembly will hear about this. Demir met the shout with a grin and thrust out a hand. Demir Grappo, the large man trying to extricate himself from the carriage, is baby Montego. The overseer's eyes grew wide at Demir's name, then wider at Montego's. Demir continued, I am now 16% owner of the glassworks and am here for my inaugural tour. The overseer reached him finally, 
staring warily at Demir's outstretched hand. I wasn't notified of any of this. That's because I only took ownership at midnight last night. I will have to check with the proper authorities, the overseer huffed. I can't have just anyone traipsing about the complex. Demir sought to remember his name from the files the Shauri had sent him. Filler, was it? Excellent name, by the way. I had a great-great-uncle by the name of Filler. Strong name. Manly name. Demir clenched a fist and thrust it in front of him in pantomime of the flexing cudgelists sometimes did in front of the audience. Baby, the paperwork. Montego came to Demir's side and handed him a bundle of papers, which Demir then handed to Filler. He gave the overseer a full minute to read over them. As you can see, it all checks out, Demir said proudly. This certainly seems official, Filler said slowly, looking slightly ill. Filler, my friend, I have a really glass-damn busy life. I drove all the way up here for a tour. I'm a sixth of your owners and I have it on good authority that Yulina was one of the few owners who actually liked you. You want to make me happy, Filler. It was all a fiction, of course. But in Demi's experience, most marginalised Guild family members were in constant terror of someone younger, more charming, better looking, or simply more convenient taking their spot. Filler swallowed hard. I see. Here's a thousand ozo, Demir said, thrusting the money into the pocket of Filler's apron. If for some reason my paperwork doesn't check out, then you'll have shown around a couple of famous tourists. If the paperwork does check out, you'd have pleased one of your new overlords. Do you have wine? I, er, uh, up in my office. No need, I brought plenty. Baby, a bottle of wine for the overseer and the captain, and then a dozen bottles to the enforcers. Did we bring that wheel of Stiati? I've never met an enforcer who didn't love cheese. Take it to their barracks. He looked over the overseer's shoulders, cementing his memories of this place. Oh, and a few bottles of wine for the hired help. Labourers get thirsty too. Now then, my tour. Demir began walking, forcing the overseer to choose between restoring order as his enforcers mobbed Montego or following him. The overseer followed him. How many furnaces? he asked as Filler caught up. Uh, Filler responded clearly still quite out of sorts. Eleven. Well, twelve. Twelve? Wonderful. I'd like to see them all. Philip blanched. I can show you nine of them, I suppose. They all look the same, I assure you. What about the other three? I want to see what I bought, Filler. I want to make sure this place isn't going to burn down, fall down, or fall victim to the accidents and malfeasance that other glassworks have suffered recently. At the mention of malfeasance, Filler perked up. Oh, that won't happen here. We have thirty enforcers on the premises at all times. No one can get through that gate without my say-so. As for the other three furnaces, they are restricted. I really will have to get permission to show you those. Demi was a little disappointed. Not enough creativity to come up with a good excuse. Restricted, even within a restricted compound. Those furnaces were almost certainly being used to produce illegal god glass. But which ones? Rage glass? Fear glass? Ailing glass? He strolled to the next furnace room and opened the door to stick his head inside. It looked exactly like the last workshop, all the way down to the dejected, tired expressions on the faces of the Silicia prisoners. No one matched Tessa's description. Are they overworked? he asked, whirling on Filler, who seemed to have finally resigned himself to showing Demir around. The overseer gave him a wan smile. Well, they would certainly say so. It's part of how we maintain order. We give them big enough quotas that they're always on the edge of dropping from exhaustion. Can't get good quality god glass out of Silas like that, Demir frowned. 
It's a trade-off, for sure, but one we're very happy with. We've refined the process over decades, you see. Hmm. Deme continued walking down the main road through the centre of the compound. He opened doors, looked in closets, showed himself around two dormitories and a mess hall, all while Phila tagged at his heels like an unwilling hound. Deme was certain to keep up a barrage of questions, punctuated by nonsense anecdotes. As intended, the overseer seemed completely overwhelmed by it all, rocking back frequently on his heels and managing to successfully deflect only a handful of questions. Demir simply reworded them and asked them a few minutes later. It was in the fifth workshop that he spotted someone who matched Tess's description. It was a young woman, dirty blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail, leaning over her workbench with one ear just inches from a piece of god glass. Demir looked up the line until he found another Cilicia, probably in her mid-twenties, with dark skin and a shaved head. She was quite attractive. Deme fixed a leer on her and bent in toward Filler. Tell me, he said quietly, do you ever, you know, excuse me, the young women? Oh, oh, of course not. No, the government oversight of this compound is much too strict to afford a scandal like that. Just thought I'd ask, Deme said, feigning disappointment. He kept his eyes on the Marnish Cilicia, then looked toward Tessa. It was far better to be thought a degenerate than to give up his real purpose here. He strolled around the circular furnace, examining each workstation. When he reached the blonde young woman he suspected was Tessa, he turned toward her. What's your name, girl? Ah, ah, Philip interjected. I really don't think you should talk to the prisoners, sir. Demir folded his hands across his stomach, careful that his silic sigil was pointed toward her. Come now, I have a new ownership stake in this place. I'm not going to completely ignore the gears of industry. Girl, tell me your name. He adopted the tone he'd heard so often throughout the Empire, that of a man who believes his underlings a little better than animals. The woman barely seemed able to keep a look of disgust off her face. Teela, sir. Demir's heart soared. Found her. The exact woman Dula had told him was being held, and she definitely matched the description. Glass dam. Now he just needed to get her out of here. That would probably take a lot longer. Teela, what are you working on? Forge glass earrings, sir. Demir drummed his thumbs against his stomach trying to draw her attention to his hands. It worked. She looked up at his face sharply, then back at his silic sigil. Once he was certain she'd gotten the message, he reached into his pocket and palmed a small piece of razor glass, then dropped it into the tray that held her finished products. He picked one up, put it to his ear, then did another. When he finished, he ran his fingers along the earrings so they covered the razor glass. Adequate work he said with a yawn. Philip, I do hope some of the other prisoners have more talent. Tessa didn't hide her glare. When he was certain no one else could see, Demir winked, then looked pointedly at the tray. She stared at him suspiciously until he whirled away from her, leading Phila back to the street. Of course, Phila said. She's just a senior apprentice from Grant. No one's special. I certainly hope not. Demir finished his tour, making sure not to alter his behaviour in any way. He talked to a few more of the prisoners, checked the god glass, split a bottle of wine with the overseer, and then retired to his carriage, with Phila and the captain standing nearby to see him off. It's a good operation, he told Phila through the window. The overseer nodded eagerly. Demir had him on the hook. See that you keep up this good work, and I'll make sure you're well rewarded. And of course, feel free to check back with Osa about my credentials so there is no confusion on my next visit. If you need anything from me, I'll be at the Hyacinth Hotel. Baby, let us be off. They were moments out of the compound when Demir turned to Montego. Found her, he said. 
she seems unhurt. As long as she can remain that way for a couple of weeks, we'll just have to make frequent visits and watch for our chance to slip her out. I've already got the hotel carpenter refitting one of our carriages with a hidden compartment. Did you make contact? Montego asked. Not in so many words, but I think she knows who I am. I left her a piece of razor glass just in case she needs to defend herself. I don't think the guards are allowed to get handsy, but she'll not be unarmed on my watch. What excuse will we use to return? Demir grimaced. Anything we can think of. If I have to pretend to be friends with that rat of an overseer, I'll do it. Let's come back first thing in the morning. The quicker the guards, labourers and overseer get used to my presence, the less suspicious I'll seem. I might even get the chance to talk to Tessa alone. <laughs>